Meek? Here. Myers? Here. Peterson? Here. Ray? Here. Williams will be a little late. Weininger? Here. Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Into item number three, the DCSD spotlight. Okay, thank you, directors. Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here this evening. I know we have a really full agenda tonight, but we are really excited to celebrate our schools, our staff, and our leaders that have worked so tirelessly and so hard for our students. Tonight, we will be recognizing the schools who received awards from the Colorado Department of Education based on their academic achievement indicator of the school performance framework. Um, as each school comes up, we are going to provide you with a banner. So um, I actually want to show you one of these banners because we won't open them all. So I'm picking on Timber Trail. <laughs> so you are going to get a banner stating what award you got. So this is a John Irwin. And those banners are for you to proudly hang in your schools because um, you should be so incredibly proud of the work that you have done. You will also be receiving a larger banner that will be hung by operations and maintenance on the outside of your school. Um, because we are just incredibly proud of the great work that all of you have done. This room, for those of us online, this room is full of principals because our district really cleaned up when it came to the awards from the Colorado Department of Education. Okay, so here's how we're gonna do this since there's so many of you. Um, we're gonna call schools up by region, but I want everyone listening to know that there are several different types of awards. One, the Governor's Distinguished Improvement Award. This was given to schools that demonstrate excellent student growth a really amazing accomplishment in our district um, because our schools are already so high achieving. So to be able to show extraordinary growth near the top of the state is amazing. On the school performance framework that is used by the state to evaluate schools, these schools exceed expectations on the indicator related to longitudinal academic growth. The John Irwin School of Excellence Awards are given to schools that demonstrate exceptional academic achievement over time. These schools received an exceeds expectations ratings on the academic achievement indicator performance framework um, reflecting exceptional performance in math, English language, arts, and, uh, English language arts and science. And one of our schools received the High School Academic Growth Award, which recognizes high schools that demonstrate the highest level of students' academic growth in reading, writing, and math within each classification used by the Statewide Association for High School Activities. So um, we're going to start with the Castle Rock region. So I'm going to start with the EDOS, and then I'll call the schools up one by one. So um, Aaron McDonald, please join me up front. Okay. The following schools in the Castle Walk region received the Governor's Distinguished Improvement Award. Castle Rock Elementary School, Flagstone Elementary School, Sage Canyon Elementary School, and Soaring Hawk Elementary. So come on up here, all of you. And I'm going to ask each of our amazing leaders to introduce yourself and talk really briefly about what this means for your school. So we'll start with Mandy. Hi, I'm Mandy Hill from Sage Canyon Elementary. Um, I'm just so proud of the work that this shows for our students and our staff. We couldn't be more proud of the work that they have done. 
I met Jacquis at Flagstone. Um, similar, I'm just so proud of our amazing staff, um, the resiliency of our students, and honestly, the community partnerships that we have with all of you. Um, it's, it's an excellent award and we are very proud. I'm Deb War. I'm the principal of Castle Rock Elementary. I brought my PLS, Susan, wave Susan. Susan um, helped direct our school in our professional learning communities, which made a tremendous difference to all of our groups. So we're grateful. We're very grateful for our students and our amazing staff. I'm Stacey Robertson. I'm the proud principal of Soaring Hawk Elementary School. And like the other ladies, uh, our dedication of our staff, the hard work of our students, our families, that, that commitment and that working together to uh, help us grow and learn each and every day. So thank you. President Peterson and Director Myers have your awards for you. And then we're going to take a picture. But while they are handing out awards, um, I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you for setting up a culture in your building that allows for incredible achievement and growth. Um, you guys are amazing and we're really, really proud of you. And one more round of applause. All right, next up we have the Parker Region. So I'm going to ask Kristen Dury, and, uh, Executive Director of Schools for the Parker Region to join me up here. Okay, first I wanna introduce a school in the Parker Region that um, accomplished an amazing feat by winning both the John Irwin Award for Academic Excellence and the Governor's Distinguished Improvement Award, Gold Rush Elementary. Jenny Brown, come on up here. And we have two Governor's Distinguished Improvement Award recipients in the Parker Region, Iron Horse Elementary and Legacy Point Elementary. Come on up. I'm Jenny Brown. I'm so proud to be accepting both awards on behalf of Gold Rush. I've been at Gold Rush for 11 years and they've been some of my happiest. I truly love all of our students, our staff and our parents. And this is just a great reflection of their hard work each and every day and their true commitment to best practice. So even up until our last few days. So, so <laughs> proud of, of all of them. I'm Beth Waffle. I am the principal of Legacy Point Elementary, and I am honored to accept this award on behalf of all the staff and the students that have worked so hard to, to achieve greatness, um, and we just couldn't be more proud. Thank you. And I'm Jenna Munoz, a proud principal at Iron Horse Elementary, and I just want to give a shout out to Sherry Carlson, my AP, and Kim Betchart, my PLS. As a leadership team, we've really been focusing with our staff on that commitment to best practices and embracing new curriculum and just doing incredible things for kids, and it's paid off, and it's such an honor to receive this award. <laughs> Director Ray has your awards. <laughs> no, 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 don't leave. Try to get a picture. Okay. Oh, no leaves. Okay. <laughs> Congratulations. You've killed it. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, next we have the East Highlands Ranch region. So Executive Director of Schools, John Gutierrez, come on up. John, your schools, three schools in the East Highlands Ranch region received 
both awards, the John Irwin and the Governor's Distinguished Improvement Awards. And those three schools are Arrowwood Elementary, Lone Tree Elementary, and Timber Trail Elementary. Come on up. And then we have a recipient of both the John Irwin Award and the High School Academic Growth Award, Andy Abner from Rock Canyon, come on up. And John Irwin School of Excellent Award recipients, Buffalo Ridge Elementary, Cougar Run Elementary, Eagle Ridge Elementary, and Wildcat El Mountain Elementary, come on up. President Peterson and Director Hansen have your awards, and I am going to hand the microphone. Oh, I get to go first. You get to go first. You get all the way to the end. I'm, oh. I'm Shannon McPherson, and I am the principal at Cougar Run Elementary, joined by our admin team, Jessica Simmons and Andrea McNamara, both joined today. So our leadership team really focuses on family and our mantra this year was hashtag C run family. So this is a celebration of the hard work of our village and that commitment to excellence. So thank you so much. I'm Michelle Radke at Timber Trail. Our motto at Timber, Timber Trail is where hearts and minds connect. And I think receiving these awards shows what we all know that kids need to feel safe, loved and taken care of before academics. And that's the most important thing. So, and again, we're proud of our staff and our students and our community. Thank you. Hi, Mindy Persikina, Principal at Lone Tree Elementary. I could not be more proud of our staff, our students, and our parents who trust and support our process. Um, this is a testament to their hard work, and I accept it humbly. Thank you. I'm Crystal Wood, Principal from Arrowwood. <laughs> that hasn't happened before. <laughs> We have phenomenal students at Arrowwood, as well as um, just outstanding teachers that come committed every day to do what they need to do to make sure we receive awards like this. Our families are incredible as well, and um, this is huge for Arrowwood because this is the first time we've received these awards, so I definitely want to thank Linda Chadrick, who was the previous principal, as well as my AP, um, who's done an outstanding job here at Arrowwood. Sorry for that interruption. That was John Irwin making sure we're here tonight getting our awards. Um, and all seriousness, I'm Andy Abner, very proud principal of Rock Canyon High School. Rock Canyon is in its 20th year this year, and we are founded on excellence in academics, activities, and athletics by an incredible founding principal and hardworking staff. And I'm very uh, honored to accept this award on behalf of incredible students, staff, and parents who support those students. Um, and I just want to say that we're very proud that we've won the John Irwin Award of the John Irwin every year it's been given out in our 20 years of existence. So uh, thank you to those that laid the foundation. Thanks. I am Jen Murdoch Jakeway, principal at Buffalo Ridge Elementary, and I am very pleased to be here to accept this award. I'm very appreciative for our students. They work their tails off, and they've been through a lot, and I'm just so proud of their resilience and what they've been able to do. So really proud of our students, so appreciative for our amazing staff. They are awesome. They work their tails off every day, too, and our community makes it all possible by supporting us endlessly and are always there for us. So very, very appreciative. Thanks. Hi, I'm Molly Milliam, principal of Wildcat Mountain Elementary. Um, and I could echo all of these amazing people. Um, and I'm so blessed to be part of this region of East Side, first of all, because I think it starts with just an entire community. And I think uh, that is just really felt, I think, from all of us. Um, but on behalf of my staff, I'm just so proud to accept this award and of our students, because again, they work so hard. And our vision is to cultivate passionate hearts and minds. And when you do that, and you really put your focus on targeted, intentional work, it really makes a difference. And so I'm just so proud of everybody, and proud to be with all of you, and proud to be in DCSD. I'm Doug Humphreys, principal at Eagle Ridge, and I can't echo what everyone else said. So proud of our staff and our students and our parent community. So kudos to everyone. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Good job, Eastside.
Recording in progress. One more round of applause. Oh, you guys. Very proud of you. Well done, guys. So proud of y'all. Okay, next. No, we just keep going, which is so awesome. Um, I, I just, before we do the next one, I have to tell a quick story. So, Assistant Superintendent Windsor and I had the privilege of being at the Colorado Department of Education ceremony to accept all of these awards on behalf of Douglas County School District. And I'm not gonna lie, it was really fun, because they lined us up, right? They lined the districts up, you know, and they come up and they name your schools and you go up. And Assistant Superintendent Windsor and I get up there and they start listing schools and everyone in the audience is like, are we done yet? How about now, are we done? Oh, nope, they're still going, oh, they're only on B, okay. It was, <laughs> it was really, really fun and just made us so proud. Okay, the West Highlands Ranch region. So I'm going to have Ian Wells join me, Executive Director from West Highlands Ranch. Okay, the following were recipients of both the John Irwin and Governor's Distinguished Improvement Awards. Heritage Elementary, Northridge Elementary, Stone Mountain Elementary, Summit View Elementary, and Trailblazer Elementary. So come on up. And... <laughs> uh -huh. And there are more, but wait, there's more. Um, the following schools received the John Irwin School of Excellence Award. Bear Canyon Elementary, Copper Mesa Elementary, El Dorado Elementary, Mountain Ridge Middle School, Ranch View Middle School, and Saddle Ranch Elementary. Come on up, everyone. All right, we're gonna have to do the whole like, yeah, because there's so many. I'm gonna mix it up. We're starting on this end. That's what I get for my age before beauty comment. <laughs> Uh, I'm Brian Singleton. I represent Mountain Ridge Middle School very proudly. Um, this is a testament to all the hard work our staff has put in over pretty much the last four years since we've really challenged them. Um, and I want to give a special thanks to my admin team. Um, they have rallied and got the troops headed in the right direction so we could get to this point. Um, and I'd like to especially thank Mark Harmon, who is the man behind this kind of music that we make over at Mount Ridge. So thank you. Hi, I'm Erin Kylo, the proud principal at Ranch View, and I could echo what all of the principals have said tonight. It is a group effort, and I just want to thank my admin team. Shelly Highland is with me tonight, Chandler Simpson, and then my PLS, Erin Isley, for the work that they do. I'd also like to thank all of our PLC leaders. They are amazing, and they are pushing forward. Um, they're showing lots of grit as they're working through um, all the things the last four years. This is the first time that Ranch View has taken this award, so we are very proud. And most importantly, I'd like to thank our teachers. They are the magic in the classroom. They are the true champions for our students and they make it all happen. So our teachers and our students, of course. I had a student tell me today it was our field day today, so we were having fun all day long. I said, Mrs. Kylo, isn't the learning days over? Aren't we done learning? I'm like, no, not until the end. We are still doing math, friend. And it was a, it was a scavenger hunt, but we are still working hard. So, And I'd also like to thank all of the feeder principals. They send us kids that are ready for the middle school challenge, and I couldn't be more proud to be part of the feeder, part of our community. It's, it's a whole village that raises our children, and I'm just so proud and honored to take this home to our team. I'm Steve Getchell, a proud principal of Copper Mesa, and just definitely echoing all the thoughts of all of the outstanding leaders we have in our district. It is a wonderful place to be. Um, 
we too have earned the John Oren Award for the first time in our school's history. Kind of challenged our, our staff last year um, to earn it in the next three years, and we earned it in two. So that's just a testament to our amazing, amazing entire staff at Copper Mesa, we always say it takes a village, and that includes everyone. And we do have a couple of folks here I'd just like a huge shout out to Lucy Squire and Anjanette Strickler, two amazing third grade teachers. And yep, there you go. <laughs> And, and really the brains behind all of the work that we have done with uh, our PLCs the last couple of years, Candice Lavier deserves a huge shout out. So thank you, Candice, for the tireless work you do at our school. So um, just truly blessed to work at a, at a wonderful school, a, a great community, and a part of an outstanding region. It's a, it's a wonderful treat to work with you guys each day. Hi, I'm Julie Crawford. I am the proud principal of El Dorado. Um, it really is a testament to all of our teachers, the, the students, everybody that has worked tirelessly each and every day. Um, I don't know if we were surprised, but we were super proud to know that we had earned this. I think this is our first time of, um, as El Dorado receiving this award, so I am very proud um, to take this home with us. Um, uh, and then I just, it's just a huge thank you to our staff. I am very blessed. I'm so lucky to work with the best, most amazing staff, and our students are amazing. So. Thank you. I'm Gina Grimes and I am the proud retiring principal of Saddle Ranch Elementary. <laughs> and I am so dang proud of our kids. They are the ones that shined and they couldn't do that without their teachers supporting them every inch of the way. Our uh, motto this year, and it's been similar every year um, for the past few years, is loving hearts shape beautiful minds. And boy, did they really shape some beautiful minds because you set that foundation for kids, make them feel safe, make them feel like home. And it's a place they love coming, a place I love coming. And We'll stop there because I'm going to be sad to not be coming there anymore. Um, but congrats to our staff community and all the kids. Just love you all. Hi, I'm Katie Sodaro Jensen. I'm the principal at Trailblazer. And just as everyone else said, I am so honored to be here and so, so proud of our staff, students, community. Uh, they are all fully invested. Every day they come to school, they love every single kid. They want every single kid to be successful. And this shows, and this too is our first time to win either award. So we're very excited and very motivated to continue the hard work. So thank you to the this awesome group of people too that have helped me through everything. Thank you. Awesome, I'm Katie Lynch, principal at Northridge Elementary School. And the, our motto this year is 40 years of excellence. So um, like Andy at Rock, um, Rocky, Rock Canyon, I was gonna say Rocky Heights, but Rock Canyon, um, we've earned it every year except for the second year it was ever given. So I don't know what happened that year, it was just a little hiccup, but then here we are. Um, and it, my goal was to get the, um, the growth award as well. And so this year we um, were able to do that, but we couldn't do it without our entire community. That comes from parents, that comes from our community members, that comes from our teachers and our students. And I always say work hard, play hard. And so um, today we had field day. So I washed my hair in the sink of our school and um, threw on a dress to look presentable. So if I'm smelling a little funky, you'll know why. I, I was pied in the face by our uh, mascot. So um, I did have uh, whipped cream all over my face and hair. So that's Excellent. We're, we do 40 years of excellence here at Northridge, so we work hard and we play hard. Hi, everyone. I'm Kelly Orsetta, also retiring principal at Bear Canyon Elementary. So thank you to my staff, community, and parents. This is the icing on the cake. Um, thank you for making me look good. <laughs> it's always very awesome, but no, in all seriousness, our teachers and our kids have worked so, so hard. We really focus on unlocking the potential in every single student. We really try to make sure we're differentiating on all levels. And so this award just really showcases how much work that has been for everyone. And also our parents are amazing. So thank you so much for everything. And it's a special place. I will definitely miss it. And I will miss all of you too. And Ian, thank you. You've always had our backs and we super appreciate you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm George Bozer, uh, principal at Summit View Elementary. Um, and as others have said, just blessed to be a part of the leadership group that's in this room and assembled tonight. And even those that, that aren't here, it, it takes all of us. Um, and blessed that uh, we have a great staff and a great community at Summit View. Um, you know, we put the spotlight on the Growth Award this year, um, and we got both, and, and, and super fortunate. 
Um, but we just keep getting after it for kids. And with that spotlight on growth, um, it was about digging into data and keep peeling it back and then focusing on small group instruction. Um, and it, it, it paid off. So again, just, just honored to be a part of it. You just, you, you share great ideas, you bring, bring in best practices and you just get out of their way. Um, and and it, it, it shows in the hard work. So just really honored. Okay, one more time. I am Jean Wallach, the proud retiring principal at Heritage Elementary, and I was gonna cry. I've been crying all week. So I said, I'm not getting up here, I'm not crying. So Heritage is just the most wonderful place there is, and it's been my home for 22 years, and um, our teachers are just amazing. Our kids are wonderful. Our community's the best. We won both these awards last couple of years, and so, like Aaron said, the Growth Award is a big deal because we're a high-achieving school, and so to continue to do that, I give all the credit to those little kiddos and my wonderful, wonderful staff. So I'm just thrilled to accept it on their behalf. I'm actually gonna be representing Stone Mountain Elementary School. Michelle French, she was unable to be here this evening, um, but I just wanna share Stone Mountain regularly, and I mean regularly, hits both awards. Um, it is a testament to the community. It's a testament to the staff. Uh, they, are, they challenge each other every year to win both awards and to actually move the needle on every kid. Uh, their motto is, they've got, they've got several miles, but I'm just going to say kindness is really their motto of what they preach, how they preach it. Um, and, and there's no better example of that than right now, if I'm being honest. So I'd also like to give one quick shout out, just if I can. You know, I th I'm proud to stand up here and, and say that there's five of 12 el eligible elementary schools winning both these awards. There's eight of them up here um, winning at least one of the awards. There's both middle schools. And part of that is because I truly try to challenge them every year to get better at what they do. Um, and, and I'm not soft about it. I actually push hard. And I will just say huge thank you to all of you for stepping up to the plate and hitting a home run. Congratulations to all of you. We are so, so proud of all the work you do for our kids. Um, Directors Meek and Hansen are here to give you your awards. How about a big round of applause? Recording in progress. Okay, one more. Now I would like to have our um, executive director of choice, Gordon Mosier, come on up. And we are going to honor our charter schools that have received these awards. All right. The following schools received the Governor's Distinguished Improvement Award, Global Village Academy, and World Compass Academy. Now I have to caveat, some of our charter leaders are doing their eighth grade graduations tonight. And I don't know, when picking between us and all of their kids, they picked their kids. So Mr. Mosier will be accepting um, 
the awards on behalf of our schools that are doing their eighth grade graduations. Um, the John Irwin, score, uh, John Irwin Schools of Excellence Award recipients are Academy Charter, American Academy, Ben Franklin Academy, Challenge to Excellence Charter, North Star Academy, Parker Core Knowledge Charter, Platte River Academy, and STEM School Highlands Ranch. So how about a big round of applause for our charters? All right, I am gonna hand this down. I'm gonna start with you. My name is Erin McMillan and I am the proud principal of Academy Charter School. It is an honor to stand here tonight and accept this award, not only on behalf of the students and staff that currently work for us, but we're celebrating our 30th year as being the longest standing charter school in Douglas County. And we're very proud to be a part of this educational community. And we honor the founding families who created what we have built on and created today. Hi, everybody. I am Steve Colella. I am the Executive Director of Schools for American Academy. Uh, when you mentioned these, I was freaking out a little bit because we have three campuses. I'm like, if we get one of these, I don't know where they're going to go. But um, uh, actually, first things first. So, so the time that this award encompasses, uh, we had a different Executive Director of Schools. Uh, you know her. She's Superintendent Kane. So Superintendent Kane, kudos to you. Uh, and I think I can speak for Aaron, and, and I can certainly say um, that when parents and staff go hard for kids every day, every day, good things happen. You all are a testament to that. Uh, and so um, this award is a testament to our incredible kids, our wonderful families, and our awesome staff. And, and this is just one indicator of it. So I'm very proud to accept it on behalf of all of them. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Kendra Hosfeld. I'm the principal at North Star Academy and I guess I'm just overwhelmed with gratitude. Um, I'm also very humble and honored to serve in a district that I feel like is the best in Colorado. Um, we are, uh, I've, I've, I'm living in Douglas County and I'm, I'm so proud to have my, um, I, my own children go through the school system. We have so many incredible leaders here. Um, we know where the work, um, the work is being done in the classrooms, the work is being done at home with the parents. I'm grateful for the commitment that parents have. I'm grateful for um, my entire staff. I'm so grateful for my admin team. They're amazing. They put up with me. Um, but uh, I, I'm honored to be in this school district and, and be amongst the best leaders in Colorado. Hi, I'm Johanna Harth. I'm principal at Parker Core Knowledge. I am retiring principal after 26 years um, at Parker Core Knowledge. We have been the proud recipients of the John Irwin School of Excellence Award since its inception um, from the state. And this leads me to my shout out. Um, for our special education teachers, which I'm sure represent special education teachers everywhere, who open doors and widen horizons to all our special learners to aim high and achieve high. Hi, I'm Karen Johnson. I'm the interim CEO for the STEM School Highlands Ranch. And just as everyone spoke as well, this is such an honor to accept this award for our students and our staff. Um, one thing that um, I'd like to bring forth as well is as a K-12 school, that means that we're exceeding in all three school levels, which um, really is a testament to our students and our staff and our parents in the community. So a big shout out to all of them. And I appreciate accepting this award as well. Thank you so much. And they, uh, most of our directors have one of you in their region, so they're going to hand you um, your awards. And to those schools that weren't here tonight, we know that they wish they could be here, and we extend our sincere congratulations to them as well. How about one more round of applause? <laughs> and a picture. And a picture. <laughs> Congratulations. That concludes our staff recognitions tonight, but I just want to do 
I, what an incredible night to be able to recognize so many amazing schools that do so many amazing kid things for kids in our community and our, in our district. I can never thank you all enough. So one more round of applause for all of you. And we'll just take a second for our awardees to leave the room and then we'll pick it back up. And at this time, we will take a 10-minute recess, a 10-minute recess, and we'll start back up at 5.45.
The Board of Education will come back to order. We are on item number seven, acceptance of agenda. The recommendation is that the Board of Education approves the agenda as presented. Do I have a motion? Um, I move to amend the agenda in two ways. Um, first, to add a discussion item on the timing for additional monitoring on policy ADB. Um, it was agreed to at our last board meeting and it's not on tonight's agenda. And second, to remove items 27 through 34 and place them on the June 7th work session to allow for meaningful discussion on the proposed policy recommendations. Second. So we have, if you could just please restate, amend the, add a discussion to, uh, for the timing on what please? For the additional monitoring. Thank you. On policy ADB. And the second. Was items, go ahead, sure. thank you. To remove items 27 through 34 and place them on the June 7 work session to allow for meaningful discussion on the proposed policy recommendations. Do you, do you mean June 6? June 6, thank, thank you. Director Myers. We have a motion by Meek and a second by Ray. Discussion? So for the first topic, I believe at our last regular meeting, we talked about asking for additional monitoring data on um, equitable access and equitable opportunities. And I believe, President Peterson, you said it would be added to tonight's agenda for us to discuss the timing for that. And so I don't see it on the agenda. Right. I believe I said we would discuss it at agenda planning, and we did not add it because of the, in my mind, what was already being done for equity and other areas, including the monitoring report we have on consent tonight. Um, but if you want to break those into two separate motions, maybe that would be um, better to entertain that. Sure. I'm fine to separate the two. Okay, and I'll, I'll take it as a first and a second on individual motions. Sure. Okay. Other discussion on the first motion to add a discussion on additional timing and monitoring of ADB. No, I mean, I'll just, I'll just concur that um, timing is needed, and I think we do our best work when we work together in a work session format, and I just think the density of the things that we have to talk tonight really deserve and earn uh, more time and more more consideration. So I would just I would concur with the need for additional timing and to postpone until the June sixth as a work session. Okay. Right now, just to uh, clarify, we do have a motion on consent to not have a June sixth meeting. So, if there is no June sixth meeting, would you say the next scheduled meeting be that June sixth or June twentieth for clarity? Yeah, I have no understanding why there's not a meeting on June 6th, and we're scheduled to go till midnight tonight. And to me, it feels like it would be, it would make much more sense to actually honor everyone's time, staff's time, our community, to actually put those and, and hold the meeting that we have held on our calendars for a work session. So I, I'm not clear why we're not having that meeting on June 6th. Okay, thank you, Director Meek. Any other comments on the motion for discussion and timing for additional monitoring on ADB? And if we can take these up one at a time, we'll entertain that motion and dispose of that motion first, then we'll come back to the second motion uh, regarding items number 27 through 34. So we have the motion on the floor for uh, to add a discussion on um, timing and additional monitoring reports around ADB. I will take the roll. Director Hansen. Aye. Director Meek. Aye. Director Myers. No. Director Peterson, uh, I'm sorry, no. Director Peterson is a no. Director Ray. Aye. Uh, Director Williams is not present at this time. Director Weiniger. No. Okay, the item is not passed, three to three. We'll now take up discussion on the second motion of moving items number 27 to 34 
to the June 6th work session. Discussion on that item. I think I may. Director Wright. I think I may have spoken out of order. I thought the first motion was the 27 through 34, and this was the motion to add the equitable access. So um, I would just repeat that I do think more time is of the essence. Okay. And, you know, Director, and it, Director Meek, go ahead. Thank yeah. you. So the District Accountability Committee had a recommendation at its last meeting. Um, they formally made a motion to ask to be able to be part of the process for policy revisions, as well as to slow down the policy revision um, as to not affect the potential mill levy override and bond, and to um, allow for time for feedback. And that motion passed by the DAC. The School Accountability Committee at Thunder Ridge High School submitted a formal letter asking for more time to engage. I'm happy to read that into the record if that's helpful. Um, this section of the agenda is scheduled to start at around 10 o'clock, looking at the roster for public comment. I think it may be even later. For most policies on the agenda tonight, there are only 10 minutes allocated for discussion. We've received hundreds and hundreds of comments. We've received memos hours before the meeting on some of these policies. And I believe that we need adequate time. Um, by pushing the approvals through without this meaningful feedback process, um, where we can fully explain why suggested changes are being made. Um, it only leads to criticism of the board, and you know we're all facing criticisms that this board is too political. Pushing this forward tonight is really a lack of respect for staff that need to be here tonight to answer questions on policies. It's a lack of respect for our employees who did not have a chance to review and weigh in on these policies as they were extremely busy at the end of the year with May celebrations. It's a lack of respect for our students. Um, the student advisory group did not have a chance to weigh in on these policy changes. It's a lack of respect for our DAC and our equity advisory committee. They didn't have a chance to review and weigh in on these policies. We've heard loud and clear that people want to slow down this process and engage meaningfully. So for all of these reasons, I believe it makes much more sense to postpone, have an info session, and give them the due diligence that they deserve. And I guess lastly, you know, I get that many on this board have made campaign promises to alter these policies and that Many of you probably feel like once the board fulfills those promises by voting on these policies, that things will calm down. But I'm here to tell you it does not work that way. It doesn't. When you exclude the greater community to accommodate special interest groups, the community does not calm down. It didn't under the reform board years, and it won't now. Okay, thank you, Director Meek. Any other comments on the motion to move items 27 through 34 to the June 6th session? I'll address a couple of those, if I may. Uh, I think it shows respect for our staff and employees, given how much they've worked on these policies. When we look at the breadth of policies that we're going to discuss tonight on the agenda, we see two of them I had significant input on. I think that's pretty clear from the agenda. Every other single one of those was brought forward by staff, either in reaction to CRS changes or other things that they wanted to do to align the district. So I want to honor that work of our staff and employees, give them the certainty that they have. And frankly, they have been working so hard. We saw all the awardees earlier today that came up here. And what we don't give out awards for are superintendents, cabinets, our district leadership team, our EDOSs, and those folks who have worked diligently to bring these policies forward, whether it's mental health, whether it's the much needed revisions to bullying and stuff, and we owe it to them to get them into place. We've done a lot of work on this. Um, I'll let Superintendent Kane speak 
speak if she wants to on the uh, on the staff policies when the time comes to review those. But I think this is being respectful as far as the DAC. Um, just because one liaison or two liaisons or one board member speaks and requests something from a board committee is not being charged by a board committee. If we had come together as a group of seven and charged or set forth a specific task for any of our committees, LRPC, DAC, FOC, to give us that input, then I would expect that. But they had plenty of time, just like every other member of our community, to make inputs, and we got a ton of them. So uh, for that reason, uh, I intend to uh, not vote for the motion on the table. Superintendent Kane, did you have something? Um, I can just clarify if, uh, if it helps the timing on the policies that um, were where the changes were recommendations coming from staff. Um, specifically, those policies were called out that they were being revised um, during the March 24th meeting. And even um, in the case of the prevention of bullying policy, we updated the board on November 20th and on March 5th that we were putting together a task force um, to update the prevention of bullying policy. Um, before the April 25th first reading, of those staff recommended, recommended changes, um, the JICB, Prevention of Bullying, JL, um, and JLDA went um, in front of our district leadership team. Um, our student advisory group sat down with the red lines to JICB and provided um, a tremendous amount of feedback. Um, so the staff did get feedback on our recommended changes before the first reading, which happened on April 25th. And then um, we received, we put out an email to receive feedback from our community, which um, we received in time for the second reading this meeting. And um, as Director Meek said, we did receive hundreds of comments, which the teams that have been working on these policies for about six months um, took into consideration and made a few clarifications um, in a final uh, second reading version to make sure that we were responsive to um, the feedback from our community. So in the case of the policies that um, are being presented by staff with recommended changes, just um, for everyone's knowledge, that is the process that staff followed. It's been underway for about six months. Thank you, Superintendent Kane. Uh, Director Myers. I believe I also spoke up at the last DAC meeting. My concern that um, we have been encouraged and been talked to throughout this whole year that as a board, we need to start getting in and regulating and reviewing these policies. And then once we start in and do that, now all of a sudden we're going too fast. So I'm a little bit confused that we move forward, but now it's too fast. And I believe we've followed the process. We've gone through with what we wanted to do. We've gotten feedback. We've gotten um, public comment. And we will have public comment again tonight. And I believe we need to proceed through with our policies. Director Ray. I, I would agree, Director Myers, that it's delightful for us to be talking about policy. And absolutely, as you know, I have been an advocate for that for, for a long time. I think the issue is the timing. Um, it's not that uh, I don't think you should hear that we're thinking we're going too fast. It's that we have planted these discussions at the end of the school year um, when there's a lot going on. And, it, and not only that, but I, I am pleased that Superintendent Kane did discuss the bullying policy with our student advisor group, but they haven't talked about the other policies that directly impact them and their education. And so I think that's the issue is not so much uh, the speed, but the quality of the process. And that's where I think it's breaking down as it feels like um, that we're missing the thoughtfulness of how we should be doing review of policy. But I agree with you. I'm, I'm delighted that we're talking about policy. I think this is what we should be doing. Thank you, Director Ray. Any other directors? Director Meek? Sure, I just want to make it clear um, what I brought forward from the DAC is not the opinion of a liaison. The DAC voted. They took a vote to have an official statement asking us to slow down. We've received emails from leaders of committees asking us. We've received letters. So I guess I'm just not sure I understand why it must be done this evening instead of being done in a thoughtful manner where we're actually taking the time 
to answer the hundreds of questions that have come in. There's no reason you have to push it through. Just take time and explain it. And honestly, what I heard was there have been some slight tweaks based on the staff looking at the feedback that's been received. We should take time to help the community understand why changes are being made and what those implications are. And to do that, Okay, seeing none, I will take the roll. The motion is to move items number 27 through 34 to the June 6 work session. Director Hansen. Aye. Director Meek. Aye. Director Myers. No. Director Peterson, no. Director Ray. Uh, yes. Director Ray is an aye. Williams is not here. Director Weiniger. No. Item is not passed three to three. And we have the original agenda item on there to approve the agenda as presented. Do I have a motion around the acceptance of agenda? I move that we approve the agenda with the following modification that we switch item number 34 with item number 26. Again, out of respect to our audience, who I believe the majority are here to uh, hear about item number 34 regarding our educational equity policy. And given that that is the policy that has triggered all the other policies uh, in terms of a need for revision, I would think it would be respectful for us to move that up earlier in our agenda. So again, the motion is to switch item number 34 with item number 26, which is a proposed new policy, JLCDC. If I may amend a uh, friendly amendment, just move item number 34 before 26 and do them in that order, if that would be acceptable to you, Director Ray? Uh, no, it wouldn't be acceptable because item number 26 is new business. Okay. And I really think that's where new business belongs is after we've discussed the ones we've already had first reading. So I, okay. I wouldn't be able to accept the friendly right. amendment. Motion is, uh, as stated, switching items number 34 and 26 on the agenda. Uh, do we have a second? Second. Second by Meek. Discussion? I have no problem with that as, as a director. Any other discussion? Okay, I will take the roll. Director Hansen, uh, regarding the question of uh, the motion is to switch items number 34 and 26 on the agenda. Director Hansen? Aye. Director Meek? Aye. Director Myers? Aye. Director Peterson, aye. Director Ray? Aye. Director Weiniger? Aye. Okay, motion is approved six to zero to switch items number 34 through 26. And now acceptance of the agenda with the modification. Uh, do I have a motion to accept the agenda with the modification as just passed by the board? Move to accept. Motion by Ray. Second. Second by Myers. I will take the roll. Director Hansen. Aye. Director Meek. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Peterson, aye. Ray. Aye. Director Weiniger. Aye. Passed by a vote of six to zero as amended. We are up to item number six, superintendent report. Superintendent King. Thank you very much. Um, Okay, just some brief updates. Um, it's been wonderful to attend our graduations. Um, most of our graduations have taken place. We have a still um, a few left this week. So Douglas County High School, um, Plum Creek Academy, DC Oaks, and Eagle Academy are still to happen this week. Director Ray and I attended the um, bridge graduation last night, which is always um, delightful and uplifting. And uh, it is amazing how much our kids thrive. Our um, pay increase statements went out to our staff last week and we're getting a lot of uh, positive feedbacks. We had over 300 teachers request um, lane advancements, which is really great. That means our teachers are um, seeking higher degrees to um, apply in the classroom with their kids. Um, all of our schools are doing end of year celebrations, including field days. Um, many of us had the privilege of attending the annual not to be missed chicken races at Sedalia Elementary, um, where through a reading challenge, the kids actually get to pick a chicken from the chicken coop and um, race the chickens. 
I think it would be more appropriate to call it a chicken chase, but nevertheless, it was a lot of fun. Um, I had the privilege of being part of a ceremony at Cimarron Middle School celebrating one of our um, amazing counselors, Jill Bull, who has been um, in counseling for 24 years. She received the Life Changer of the Year Award, which is a national award. It was a, a tremendous, tremendous honor, and it's a great honor to have um, Jill be part of our district and to be changing so many lives. We've had a lot of things to celebrate in sports as we end the year here. Um, Mountain Vista won the state championship for boys lacrosse in 5A last night. Um, our girls soccer teams, we have the state championship game this upcoming Thursday, and the state championship is actually between Rock Canyon and Thunder Ridge. So no matter what, what we win. Um, the uh, baseball, three of our high schools, Chaparral, uh, Mountain Vista, and Rock Canyon are in the final eight. Um, Castleview was the runner up in the 4A girls lacrosse. And we've had many champions in track and field from Mountain Vista, um, as well as from Thunder Ridge. And a significant number of students in our theater programs throughout our district have been nominated for the Bobby G Award, which is um, a very prestigious statewide high school um, musical performance award. And then finally, um, I'd just like to make a statement in response to um, tonight's protest. Um, all of us on staff have a little bit of something to say. Um, so I want to express again how um, very sorry I and all of us at the district are that we had a family experience racial remarks made by other students. Um, as stated at the last meeting, racism in any form is unacceptable at DCSD and a direct policy violation. As such, appropriate disciplinary action was taken in this situation, including multiple suspensions. Um, Assistant Superintendent Windsor will say a few words to address the proactive steps being taken by both the school and our district. Um, and then I would like to have Deputy Superintendent Hyatt talk about some students she visited with recently at Castle Rock Middle School. So. Um, Assistant Superintendent Windsor. Thank you, Superintendent Kane. Um, we as a district are, are absolutely committed to making sure we're supporting each one of our students um, in our schools to make sure they feel safe in our schools. Um, each of our schools continually reflect on how we can get better to meet the needs of our students. Castle Rock Middle School has done this in a variety of ways. I'll just list a few. Um, from meeting with each of their uh, middle school teams and our middle school models, um, each of our um, grade levels are separated in teams. Administration and counseling has met with each one of the teams and each one of our students to be able to discuss um, aspects about kindness, bullying, harassment, and embracing the unique needs of each um, of our students. Um, Castle Rock is also, middle school is also um, developing more student leadership opportunities through developing student councils that empower students um, through leadership, citizenship, um, and fostering positive behaviors in our schools. Um, we are absolutely committed to making sure that we're investing each one of our each one of our students that walk in our schools. Um, as you saw, just even most recently with our principals, we want to know each of our kids and be responsive to the needs of our students as well as our families and our teachers. Good evening, directors. I'd like to just share about an invitation I had uh, to meet with a group of students at Castle Rock Middle School recently. Um, I was invited because um, a few years ago I spent a fairly considerable amount of time at Castle Rock M Middle School as a substitute principal while they were going through a principal transition. And so um, got to know the the school, the staff, and the community um, very well. I was invited by a group, uh, a small group of students and teachers to listen to their story about Castle Rock Middle School and how they feel supported uh, and responded to in terms of their needs and issues when they face them with the administration and their teachers. They're really concerned that the story being told about Castle Rock Middle School may not be indicative of their story about Castle Rock Middle School. And they wanted an opportunity to share with me that their particular individual story, which I am so incred incredibly proud of all of our students for stepping up and sharing with us their experiences so that we can listen to them, learn, and grow. 
and they wanted that opportunity. They um, didn't feel as comfortable getting up in, uh, in front of a board meeting and, and sharing that story, but they did with me. And so it was very insightful as well as a couple of staff. And they shared their stories with me so that as a district leader, um, as we support all of our schools, including Castle Rock Middle Schools, um, we, we are responding to what they identify as their needs in areas of education around our policies and um, how super, um, Assistant Superintendent uh, Windsor described the support that they need from the district. And it was a very insightful opportunity that I had to listen to them um, and, and allow them the, the chance to, to express themselves to me. And I'm very proud of them for that. Um, just in conclusion, I, I want to make sure that I say that all of us at DCSD are absolutely committed to ensuring that every single student feels safe, accepted, and a sense of belonging at our schools. That is always our goal each and every day, and I know I speak for every teacher and every administrator in our district when I say that that is their goal each and every day as well. And we learn from every experience, and we will continue to learn and involve um, what needs to be evolved, but um, our team is working very hard to make sure that we continue to do that. Thank you for listening to that, and I hope everyone has a good night. Thank you, Superintendent Kane. Yeah, I just have a couple of follow-up comments, if I may. Director Hanson. Thank you. Um, I had the opportunity to attend several graduations over the past week, and um, it's really a pretty emotional thing when you stop and think about what the milestone um, the graduation truly represents. And it's a powerful opportunity for reflection, which um, I have spent a lot of time doing. Um, I think it's really important that we take a minute to acknowledge the teachers and the employees that make that moment possible. I watched student after student from a pretty close up vantage point um, grab their teachers, their principals, their um, counselors, admin, um, assistant principals for giant bear hugs. I saw some very well choreographed TikTok dances um, from a select few. Um, and I just, I heard so many students tell their, that teacher, I love you. I wouldn't be here without you. Thank you. I appreciate you. And it was so special to me to get to be a part of that right, at the, right in the front seat, um, front row seat. And it was just such a good reminder for me. And once again, having all of our principals here this evening um, talking about how they depend on their teachers for um, the success that we're seeing in our district. Our school district is based entirely, the success of our school district relies entirely on the people that are in our classrooms. And we can only provide our students with the absolute best when we can provide them with the absolute best in classrooms. And in order for that to happen, we have to take care of our people. And I am not talking about a free school lunch, which I'm sure is very appreciated, but um, I'm talking about paying them a salary that allows them to support their family and live in Douglas County. And I'm talking about a basic level of respect for the brilliant professionals that they are. As a Board of Education, um, every decision that we make should be grounded in how are we making our district better for our students and for our employees. This board is sadly failing both, and I have made the heart-wrenching decision that I can no longer be a part of it. I am stepping down from my role as a director, effective immediately, because politics and ego are the primary agenda of this board. I very much appreciate the explanation from our administrative team this evening, but I want to be very clear. Jeremiah Ganzi is not the only student in this district that has experienced disgusting acts of racism, of anti-Semitism, of homophobic and of transphobic acts. I cannot assure our students and their families that this board is doing everything in its power to meet the moral and legal obligations to our students to make sure that something like this never happens again. Our building principles 
who we should be listening to as the people who see firsthand what is happening in our schools every single day very courageously asked you to implement the equity policy as it was written a year and a half ago. And I will never understand how politics get a larger voice in this district than our students and our leaders. I also can no longer look at our community, our taxpayers in the eyes and assure them that every dollar in our budget is being spent wisely. You have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars that belong to classrooms to defend yourselves because you broke the law when you fired Corey Wise. Audience. Basic fiduciary duties as a director require you to put the needs of the organization over your own personal needs. Yet in every single discussion that we have had around settling the litigation for the open meetings law violation, I have heard nothing other than how this, directs, how this impacts you directly. You have spent another 100,000 plus on surveys and surveys and more surveys to be told that you are too political and our board has an embarrassingly low approval rating of 32%, which you continue to ignore and just push through your agenda as planned. There are egregious things happening on this board right now. My hope is that by calling attention to them in the biggest way possible, by refusing to continue to be a part of this, the people in our community will become more aware and will ultimately become a part of the solution, which we so desperately need right now. David and Susan, <laughs> it has been such an honor to serve on this journey with you. <laughs> um, I respect you so much and I appreciate your friendship and your leadership. <clears throat> to our teachers and to our employees, thank you for letting me be a part of your world for the last three and a half years. I am absolutely in awe of what you do. You show up every single day and you give 100% to the kids that are in your classroom. And you always show up, no matter what is happening, no matter what is swirling around outside of you, you show up and you give your best for those kids. Whether I am sitting in this chair or not, I will always, always fight for you because I know with every ounce of my being that that is how we give kids the very best possible opportunities in education. Thank you for allowing me to serve. Thank you, Director Hanson. And with that, we will move to the next item, which is public comment after a five minute recess. So let's take a five minute and we will move. Thank you.
Uh, we will have a series of speakers only on the charter school application items, then we will follow on with general public comment. Given the large number of speakers signed up for public comment tonight, we will have one minute allotted for each speaker. First will be Robin Corrin speaking on Alexandria School of Innovation, followed by Robin Corrin allotted an additional minute to speak on John Dewey Institute, followed by Judy Bramberg speaking on ASI. Uh, is Robin Corrin here? We will give Miss uh, Miss Corn. We'll give Miss Corn a minute to uh, come in. President Peterson. Um, while we're waiting, I'm wondering if we should move to amend the agenda to discuss the vacancy on the board. Yeah, we already have an, an approval for that. Um, I'll cover that in present remarks at the end. And there are some, for anyone listening out there, there are policy and legal uh, timing and things that we will need to do given that. But we will get together with council, we'll get a memo to the board, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Yeah, I think we need to discuss it tonight, given summer break and every and the legal requirements yeah i think we'll director meek i think we'll entertain that towards the end of the meeting but um we're going to need some legal counsel miss corn are you ready to go you'll have one minute to speak oh, on asi i was told it was two minutes uh, you'll have one minute to speak on asi we'll reset the clock and then you'll have another minute to speak on jdi <laughs> okay. go ahead directors my name is robin Coran. And I worked for Congressman Ken Buck's office from January 5th, 2015 until February 28th, 2021. For the last three years of my tenure, I worked as Congressman Ken Buck's district director. On or about March 1st, 2017, Congressman Buck's office was contacted by Alexandria School of Innovation founder Judy Bramberg, who requested a letter of support. At that time, I didn't know Judy Bramberg, so I contacted the district school board president, Megan Thornberg, Thorn, uh, Silverthorn, whom I knew casually from attending local events and asked for a reference about Miss Bramberg. During our conversation, Miss Silverthorn called Judy Bramberg a religious, seconds remaining. a religiously offensive and discriminatory slur and basically implied our office should not provide a letter of support. After I spoke with Ms. Silverthorne, I called a longtime friend and Douglas County political activist and told her. Ms. Corn, you'll have an additional minute to speak on JDI. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I call, after I spoke with Silver, Silverthorne, I called a good longtime friend of mine who lived in Douglas County, and I asked her what she knew. I told her what Silverthorne had said to me, and I asked her what she knew about Judy Bramberg. After uh, she gave me a really good recommendation for Judy Bramberg uh, in, her, in her tireless work working for schools, and immediately, Congressman Buck's office provided a letter of support as Congressman, Lam uh, Congressman Buck does believe in supporting any school that would provide our children with a high quality STEM education. The U.S. Constitution, Amendment 14, clearly states the citizenship rights seconds remaining. of equal protection of the laws requires that states guarantee the same rights and privileges and protections to all citizens. And I believe Judy Bramberg was discriminated against. With, with our uh, losing equal protection of the laws, our country, because special privileges are given to some and not all. Thank, and thank we are you, losing Corey. those freedoms. Thank you. Next will be Judy Bramberg speaking on Alexandria School of Innovation. And then Judy Bramberg speaking for Barry Bramberg on ASI. Go ahead, Ms. Bramberg. Okay, I will follow up with the equity policy later. 
My name is Judy Brianberg. I am the co-founder of the STEM School Highlands Ranch, which was unanimously approved by the Douglas County Board 7-0 in November 2009. In 2014, 17, 18, we filed excellent, innovative STEM-based charter applications to Douglas County for Alexandria School of Innovation, all which were denied by former boards. In 2018, we appealed to the State Board of Education, and again, we were denied. On March 14, 2019, we filed a new, excellent, innovative charter school application to Douglas County for students on the autism spectrum called John Dewey Institute. Again, Douglas County denied our remaining. application. Again, we appealed to the State Board of Education, and again, we d denied. Our strategy in 2014, 17, 18, and 19 was to submit excellent, innovative charter applications with hundreds of letters of intent to enroll from parents with 50 or more business and industry higher education and public policy maker partnerships. But that's Ms. Barenberg, if you could wait a second, oh, okay. we'll restarting the time. <laughs> okay. uh, you will now be speaking for Barry Bramberg on ASI. Okay. Thank you. With that strategy, each year the former board denied our excellent applications because the former board voted against us in order to cover up their crimes and employment discrimination, which was witness intimidation, witness retaliation, and tampering. This year, our strategy has changed. As in the previous years, on March 14, 2023, we submitted eight excellent, innovative charter applications, but this year we boldly warned and complained about the former board's staff and attorney crimes. Starting in 2014, in order to thwart the creation of our excellent applications, our employment, property, land, and building ownership, which are terms, conditions, and privileges of employment at a charter school, the former board, 15 staff, seconds remaining. and attorneys used civil and criminal statutory non-compliance procedural violations with the following federal crimes obstruct of obstruction of justice. They altered documents, forged documents, bribery. Ms. Bramberg, if you could pause, you now have a minute to speak for yourself on John Dewey Institute, followed by a minute to speak on behalf of Bar Barry Bramberg on JDI. Go ahead, Mr. Blair. They use breach of contract, witness intimidation, witness retaliation, and then they, uh, because I complained and warned about the former board, it's a secret $2 million bailout which we called the Stemgate scandal, all which resulted in the Douglas County unsafe learning conditions and the tragic STEM school shooting, murder, and slaughter on May 7, 2019. The former board's staff and attorneys used criminal offenses, not civil, with penalties of jail time with their crimes, harming innocent pupils. So in this year, instead of spending hundreds of hours soliciting letters of intent to enroll, this year we are publicly disclosing the secret, non-transparent, under the table, hidden 15 crimes, seconds remaining. which the former board's staff and attorneys used to stop our, our charter applications from being approved in 2014, 17, 18, and 19. The tragic result, I'm almost done. We will reset the clock. You have one more minute, Ms. Bramberg. Okay. The tragic result of these crimes was the STEM school shooting, murder, and slaughter. Because the former boards were more interested in covering up their crimes than they were about protecting the safety of the students. On May 10th, 2023, we filed an appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court and courageously complained and warned about the former board staff and attorney crimes, which were used to stop our charter applications. This appeal has put the national spotlight on the former boards staff and, and attorneys. This year we have taken the largest public education scandal in U.S. history to the press, to the public, and to the parents so that they can discover the secret non-transparent crimes which, the, which Douglas County hid remaining. from them. Tonight, because of crimes used by publicly funded former boards, staff, and attorneys, the criminally infested charter application review team process in 2014, 17, 18, and 19, we ask you to approve all eight of our charters as we exercise the notices of claim to build our eight excellent innovative charter schools. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bramberg. That is the end of item number nine.
Uh, thank you for all those that made comments on our charter applications. I would like to just briefly respond that as a district, we absolutely reject and deny any allegation that any member of the board or the district's administration has engaged in any criminal conduct or violated any law relating to charter applications submitted by John Dewey Institute and the Alexandria School of Innovation. With that, we'll move to item number 10, which is public comment. Purpose of public comment is to balance the ability to hear diverse viewpoints from a broad spectrum of citizens throughout the district while allowing our Board of Education to conduct business in an orderly and efficient manner. Time has been adjusted to allow all speakers the opportunity to speak during the time allotted for public comment. This evening, we will have one minute for each speaker. When speaking, please remain respectful and address the board rather than the guests or staff in the room. To respect a speaker's free speech, please do not interrupt them while they're at the podium providing comments. You have a 15 second notice prior to the end of your time so you can wrap up your comments. When your time is up, please leave the podium. If the audience wants to react between speakers, feel free to do so while being respectful and honoring the next speaker's time to speak. However, please do not engage speakers and other audience members in a disruptive manner. Audience members who create a disturbance or disrupt speakers will be asked to leave the room after a prior warning. We will start out with Dale Pugh. Kelly Villa Escusa and Kristen DeBeer. Is Mr. Pugh here? I'm an attorney here on behalf of uh, families and players of the Legend High School baseball team who believe that their coach, Scott Boyd, has created a hostile and toxic environment uh, that allows certain players to bully uh, and intimidate other players and does nothing about it. He's also accepted gifts from parents. Uh, and most egregiously, he has uh, manipulated statistics to, in favor of his own two sons who play on the team. We have 85 pages of documents for both uh, my inquiry and the inquiry of the school district that find that he has violated uh, school legend school policy, uh, district policy, and uh, Colorado remaining. High School Athletic Association uh, regulations, and yet he continues to uh, be the varsity coach, and nothing meaningful has been done to uh, find him accountable. Thank you, Mr. Pugh. Next is Kelly Villa Escusa, followed by Kristen DeBeer, and then Jennifer Ivers uh, Iverson. Directors, I'm a parent at Legend, and I've been involved in this inquiry, as uh, Dale just spoke about. All of our complaints have been raised with the administration and the district, and they're still happening, and we were told they would be stopped. The manipulation of statistics is still going on with the coach's kids. We've provided enough instances and proof that this cannot be labeled a coincidence. The statistics Scott turned in last year to Chassa looked to have included games he should not have included at all, like scrimmages and state tournaments, which enabled him to better his kids' statistics. We made the administration and district aware, and again, nothing was done about it, or was it corrected? 15 um, seconds Awards remaining. were included, um, all state and um, all team honors were given based on these incorrect statistics. Manipulation and loose accounting practices have been going on for years. We've asked for accountability. Um, thank you, Ms. Villa. Thank Excuse you. Me. Kristen DeBeer, Jennifer Iverson, Kelly Mayer. Ms. DeBeer. Ms. DeBeer couldn't be here this evening, so she allotted me her time. Is that okay? Thank you. Many students do not feel safe in our schools. Just because you read a policy doesn't mean it's actually enforced. My own child has had many times that they did not feel safe, but were afraid to come forward for fear of bigger retaliation. That has only increased since you four were elected and empowered your followers. The DAC recognized concerns with the special education issues for a few months now yet has been denied access to meet with a special education representative. I think that needs to be resolved. Policies. 15 seconds remaining. I'm next. The policies are moving too quickly. To have this happen in May 
the busiest month of a school year is. Thank you, Ms. Iverson. Uh, now for your comments. It's manipulative. Just in May, we have Mother's Day, end of year concerts, plays, athletes, award ceremonies, academic award ceremonies, field days, studying for finals, so many IEP meetings, so many transition meetings to get them ready for middle school and high school. Finals, graduations, and the plethora of email for any of the other things that traditionally happen any other year or any other month of the year. I'm also kind of questioning the fact that you say that you got hundreds of comments. Remaining. In a district of thousands, hundreds aren't that much. And how in four days were you able to capably go through all of them and draw information from it? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Iverson, Kelly Mayer, Catherine Lees, followed by Amity Wicks. Good evening. First, I want to thank Elizabeth Hansen for her amazing service and thank her for saying Jeremiah's name. I am not sure how to succinctly summarize my concerns on all nine policies into one public comment. I will discuss my top three concerns. The parent engagement policy. When research and polling results explicitly tell you that the Board of Education is too political, you chose not to listen. Instead, Director Peterson, you quote Fair's colorblind nonsense in the wording of the policy, continue your national political narrative of parents' rights, refuse to consult the only board committee, DAC, that is by Colorado statute tasked to assist the BOE in implementing this policy and did not consult the one only employee of the district who is paid to lead this 15 work. Fifteen seconds remaining. It stinks of self-importance and ignorance. The mental health wellness policy blurs the line for professionals and puts ethical duties at odds with their employment. This is definitely not leading with students first. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. <laughs> Catherine Lees, Amity Wicks, followed by Kelly Dixon. Hi, my name is Kathy Lees. I'm speaking on behalf of myself. I would like to thank Elizabeth Hansen for her years of service and voice and for saying Jeremiah's name tonight. As I've said many times before, good governance must be slow. Good leaders take the time to reach out to stakeholders, including your district and board committees. Good leadership gives stakeholder committees the time to review and process the information as individual and most importantly, as a committee. Then your stakeholder committees can provide thoroughly discussed recommendations to you, our elected officials. You can then make the best informed decision for the common good of the community. Once again, this board majority is rushing to make systematic changes to our district. Why? Which stakeholders have you been working with to make these changes? Certainly not the hundreds of members of your district boards remaining. and committees. You got feedback from hundreds of individuals, but not the committees. There is value in what we do, and you are ignoring it. This board gave us no time to review as a committee. This is such a missed opportunity for our district. Once again, DCSD deserves better. Thank you, Ms. Lees. Amity Ricks, Kelly Dixon, followed by Erica Devlin. Hello. I believe we can all agree that every single child matters. We already have law and policy in place to guide our schools to meet the needs of all students. However, the equity policy only serves to highlight differences between people, between students, not bring them together. Incessantly highlighting differences, especially immutable characteristics, only drives wedges between people. The Kids First Board members were elected to get this kind of met metastatic cancer out of our schools so we can get back to academics. It's time to fully repeal the equity policy so kids can get back to reading, math, and science. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wicks, Kelly Dixon, Erica Devlin, followed by Linda White. Hello, I am a Douglas County tech parent and, tax and taxpayer. I have some concerns regarding the proposed changes to policy. No time to explain, so let me sum up. For ADB, you are choosing to willfully ignore independent survey data, focus group findings, superintendent and staff recommendations, and most importantly, our students. The original ADB was passed unanimously by a bipartisan board based on data and research. These changes are not based on any data or facts. Don't approve the changes. For JLDA, the changes make things more confusing for staff and limit resources for students. They need more avenues for mental health, not less. Don't approve the changes. For KBB, it's blatantly copy-pasted from FAIR. Don't approve the changes. 
Sure, the changes sound innocuous, but they sit in a broader context. Let's take an example from history. Here's a description of a group created, quote, for the purpose of memorializing the great heroes of our national history, remaining. inculcating and teaching practical fraternity among men, and to teach and encourage a fervent practical patriotism to our country. Here is fraternity patriotism. Sounds great. It was said at a congressional inquiry in 1921 by a minister, William J. Simmons, the person responsible for the rebirth of the KKK in America at that time. Fully one third of white men in Denver were members. My point is that any can, anything can sound nice and well-intentioned, even hate groups. So please put aside your political, political ideology long enough to truly listen. Thank you, Ms. Dixon. <laughs> Erica Devlin, Linda White, followed by Julie Gooden. Ms. Devlin. Thank you for this opportunity to speak about the proposed revisions of the education all equity policy. The entire essence of this policy is to cause division. Highly organized and leftist political activists have been crafting this policy for over a decade, just waiting for the perfect opportunity, along with the friendly and supportive board and superintendent, to push their agenda. That time came when the pandemic hit and they were able to steamroll it through with the passage of the policy in March 2021. This current policy shines a spotlight on identity groups instead of focusing on educational foundation that allows each student to reach his or her individual potential. At a minimum, these proposed revisions are, re are vital for pri prioritizing student achievement and removing the Marxist ideolo ideological agenda. However, even with the approved of this revision, the concern over the equity seconds will remaining. always be there. The group of love and tolerance having a protest today and seizing the opportunity to exploit a child's recent despicable incident while disparaging conservatives as racist and right-wing terrorists for their political gain is vile and are reasons that I strongly encourage the board of directors to take immediate action to remove this policy in its entirety. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stevlin. <laughs> Linda White, Julie Gooden, followed by Patty Anderson. Good evening, my name is Linda White. I have 10 grandkids, three attend high school in Douglas County. I am the founder of Grandparents for Kids, an organization formed to energize grandparents to become champions to stand up for our grandkids' education. Standing with me is a representation of many grandparents in Douglas County who want to say thank you to this board and Superintendent Kane. We appreciate the blood, sweat, and tears you put in to uh, studying the equity policy. We applaud your efforts to prioritize academic achievement, cut out ideological agendas, address learning loss, recognizing and respecting all voices in the process. The work you've done is a step in the right direction towards a non-political academic education for all. We would like to make a remaining. suggestion under the parent engagement part policy. Consider changing the opt-out policy to an opt-in one, or better yet, repeal the Douglas County the Douglas County equity policy. We expect our grandkids to get uh, education. Let's get back to the basics of education. Thank you, Ms. White. <laughs> Julie Gooden, Patty Anderson, followed by Meg Furlow. Go ahead, it's up on the back screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, good evening, directors and Superintendent Kane. I will use what time I have to discuss the changes to ADB done without proper stakeholding or even Dr. Scott Page's input, whom you attributed your diversity de definitions. Unlike you, I actually did email Dr. Page, which is how I found out you were deceiving the public by attempting to include his bonus diversity definitions as part of your revisions. So I called him and I just had a I thought with him um, and just as I thought, I'm sorry, Dr. Page's work represents the very opposite point you're trying to make. Above all, identity diversity is the deal framework to focus on. You tried to equate them and that's incorrect. In fact, in my chat, he used a great example of when you're serving food and you try to do it for balanced food groups, but we don't say the garnishes are the equivalent to the protein remaining. and the nutritional contribution. I did get his sent for his approval and this is what he said. When we focus on creating a welcoming, inclusive, academically strong school district, the bonus diversities follow. We must continue to academically challenge our students while lifting them up and valuing the totality of their lived experiences. Thank you, Ms. Gooden. <laughs> Patty, Patty Anderson, Valerie Thompson, and then Holly M. Good evening, board members. I'd like to start by thanking Elizabeth Hansen for her years of service, as well as for mentioning Jeremiah's name this evening. Data and feedback over the years show overwhelming support for educational equity in our public schools. Douglas County 
School District established a pattern, has an established pattern of inaction and continued silence when it comes to its most valuable stakeholders. These policy revisions have been rushed without following the proper feedback process and authentic engagement with stakeholders. The original committee that spent years working on the policy was the most diverse and inclusive committee in history. Some have stated if they to be offended by privilege walks because somebody might be uncomfortable. While there is documented racism and bullying faced by vulnerable students, you put a potential for uneasiness ahead of documented remaining. cases which has made vulnerable students scared to attend their local school. I urge you to take action to promote educational equity in our community, keep the original policy, and implement it with integrity and infidelity and fidelity, instead of removing the Equity Advisory Council, expand it to make it more collaborative. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Meg Furlow, Valerie Thompson, and Holly M. Am I next? I can't hear with the clap. I'm oh, sorry, Valerie Thompson. Oh, <laughs> uh, Meg Furlow, then Valerie Thompson, then Holly M. Good evening, directors. First, I wanna thank Director Hansen for saying Jeremiah's name. The equity policy won't magic, magically dismantle the systemic racism in DCSD overnight, but it will establish goals, accountability, and the opportunity to assess how the district is doing for marginalized groups. There are many levels of the system that failed, failed Jeremiah and his family. The gaslighting of their family that occurred this evening was disgusting. I'm concerned with the new definition of diversity and how it will minimize racism experienced by this family. I have yet to hear of a family uprooting their life and moving because of instrumental diversity. Also, why was the EAC never considered in these changes? I am asking you to stop and listen to your constituents remaining. and not a small group of parents' rights activists pushing a national narrative against equity because of CRT and indoctrination. We all know it's not true. You have said it yourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Furlow. <laughs> Valerie Thompson, followed by Holly M. and then Tricia Ackerman. Hi, I've had the pleasure of engaging with many of you. Superintendent Kane and district staff through board committees that I serve. And these interactions have been positive and encouraging and I see the effort firsthand, all the great things that you do for the kids in this district. I am here today to speak about the policy updates. I understand as Director Myers pointed out in the last stack meeting and today, that policy updates are a standard procedure and that oftentimes updates help align with changes in the law. However, since this process is attached to changes in the equity policy, the changes do appear significant and being steamrolled through, it set things on fire. There's been no space for effective dialogue with your community, board committees, school committees, students, and as a parent reading through these ambiguous policies with no space for questions or clarification before having to meet a deadline for feedback, seconds remaining. I'm left to come to my own assumptions on the intent of the changes which hurts the ability to give quality feedback. This provides right breeding ground for misinformation, confusion, and dissent. I get it, there are a lot of conflicting voices in the community and it's work to shift through it all. I'm asking you to continue strengthening trust um, in you and your district staff. Your community is asking for transparency and accountability. The process we are in right now does not reflect that. Thank you, Ms. Thank Thompson. You. Holly M, Trisha Ackerman, followed by Lucy Squire. The DEI policy is essentially a forced mechanism to create socialist revolutionaries out of our children. It is a Marxist goal and the subtenets of which are found in our current curriculum. It is at the very least a disingenuous and at its worst a fast crumbling of individual excellence and community harmony. This is the overarching umbrella under which class struggle supersedes core education, learning and growth, and most of all, innocence. Progressive leadership says that CRT is not being taught. However, any educated person can recognize that the current curriculum right here in Douglas County has Marxist underpinnings despite not being officially called out. DEI is a channel to employ Marxist strategy highlighting class struggle and as an exploitative avenue for teachers unions to ultimately assist in the destruction of the family unit. It is my recommendation that the equity policy be repealed and discarded. If it cannot be discarded, remove incendiary language of identity. 
I support the revised division of identity, diversity, and I support the focus and avenues provided for individual achievement. Thank you, Ms. Sam. <laughs> Trisha Ackerman, Lucy Squire, Sandra Emerson. Thank you. Hello, I've been a teacher in this county school system for 13 years, and I've never seen such procedures as this equity policy being necessary in our schools. I am in support for the revisions in the equity policy, and, and I ask you to remove all references to identity groups. Why do we need to specify special groups, and I find it extremely divisive. What it boils down to is adults telling kids who they should celebrate and divide them instead of accepting all students as equal in their sight. This is distraction from learning from what our kids are in for and also hinders student achievement. Whenever certain groups are given special attention, some people are demonized as not being as good as others. As Americans, we are all given equal opportunity to achieve if we seconds put forth remaining. the effort. I want to conclude by urging the board to remove reference to identity groups in the revision of this current policy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ackerman. Lucy Squire, Sandra Emerson, Judy Brandberg. Good evening, board directors and Superintendent Kane. My name is Lucy Squire. I'm a third grade teacher in the district, and I'm also the proud president of Douglas County Federation. I'm here to speak on behalf of DCF today. Two weeks ago, a DCSD student and his family spoke before the board to call attention to the racism, harassment, and threats he has experienced in his school and the concerning lack of action taken in response. I want to publicly state how impressive he was with his message, his decorum, and his honesty at the podium. The members of DCF stand with the student and his family and join their call for change and accountability. This can and, and should include training for examining our own implicit bias, addressing these situations, and creating a culture where everyone, all races, religions, ethnicities, gender, sexual orientations, and identities remaining. are welcome and valued and treated with respect. Hopefully his courage will motivate everyone in our district to intervene when we witness racism and bigotry and when appropriate to hold people accountable. We can all create a district that does not tolerate discrimination in our schools. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Squire. <laughs> Sandra Emerson, Judy Brandberg, and then Judy Brandberg speaking for Barry Brandberg. Good evening. I appreciate the edits made to the equity policy in order to more clearly define its objective and purpose. However, the continued reference to identity groups throughout the policy makes me concerned that it is a permission slip for teachers and administrators to label students as a member of a group or stereotype them according to such attributes as sex, ethnic group, or economic status. This is wrong, and I recommend that at a minimum all references to identity groups be removed. Labeling students according to certain attributes gives them the appearance of affording special rights to those students. When special rights exist for certain groups or students, there are no equal rights. As Americans, we must have the same rights or we're just groups of people fighting for special favors from teachers, administrators, or government. 15 when, seconds when remaining. Mount, when Mountain Vista High School teachers and administrators promoted Diversity Week, what about those students who are not part of those special groups? Does anyone care about them? Do they, do they get a special week of celebration? As I stated earlier, please edit the policy by removing all references to identity groups and treat all as individuals. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Emerson. Judy Bramberg, Judy Bramberg speaking for Barry Bramberg, then Robin Curran. Good evening. Tonight I'm giving public comment on the proposed equity policy. This is very painful subject for me. In 2017, we submitted a new charter application and I sought letters of support from every political policy maker in Douglas County, including U.S. Congressman Ken Buck. I was shocked to learn that when Congressman Ken Buck's Deputy Dix District Director Robin Curran called the former board president, Megan Silverthorne, and asked for a recommendation, Ms. Silverthorne called me an offensive, discriminatory epithet and implied that Congressman Buck's office should not provide the letter of support. This is discriminatory, unfair employment practices by the highest ranking member of the district. 15 seconds remaining. This violated fundamental fairness in the charter application evaluation process and employment by a third party employer. As the courts observe, a single epithet is enough. Former board president David Ray was negligent. Take another minute. 
Hold on, we'll restart the clock. Okay. Go ahead, Ms. Bramberg. Former board president David Ray was negligent in not preventing or correcting the third party employment discrimination, inequity, bias, and unfair application environment for reviewing charter applications. In fact, in 2018, and you can go back and listen to the tape, David Ray said, just get beyond the discrimination. Take that. The U.S. Constitution, equal protection of the laws, requires that states guarantee the same rights, privileges, and protections to all citizens and do not discriminate against any individual based on a suspect classification, including religion. The former board retaliated against me and voted to remaining. deny my charters in 14, 17, 18, and 19 because I practiced my Christian religion, enrolled in the Colorado Civil Rights Division, protected activity, and repeatedly complained about employment discrimination and participated in multiple investigations for religious discrimination. Thank you, Ms. Brandberg. May I speak on behalf of Robin? Is Robin still here? Um, she did not prearrange that, so thank you. Um, no, Ms. Brandberg. Well, I did. I did. Oh, to is it already? Okay. Okay. Thank you uh, for the clarification, uh, Assistant Secretary. Uh, Brad Geiger, Holly Kluth, and Mike Woldridge. Is Mr. Geiger here? He, he had to go take his mom to dinner. He sent me a statement. It's not even a minute long. Go ahead and speak for Mr. Geiger. I appreciate it. I appreciate that. Yeah. Hold on. Is Ms. Coran still here? She has been ill, and so she had to leave. I will allow you to speak. Sorry. I have the mic off. I will allow you to speak for Ms. Coran. Realize when we come back this summer, um, we will talk about people speaking for other, speak uh, other speakers as part of the board, and this will... Uh, probably not be allowed at the end of the school year going forward because we're having continuous ab abuses. But go ahead, Ms. Bramberg, go ahead and speak on Ms. Cran's part. Okay, I, I greatly appreciate that. I'm gonna finish her comment that she started to make earlier. The former school board president's comment, comments violated the constitutional rights of equal protection of the law. The U.S. Constitution Amendment 14 clearly states the citizenship rights of equal protections of the law and requires that states guarantee the same rights and privileges and protections to all citizens. We are losing equal protection of the laws in our country because special privileges are given to some and not to all. When a new policy or law is created that undermines an already protected right under the Constitution, it should be considered moot and given no authority because because it deprives others of their right to be protected while giving special status to one particular remaining. group. Without equal protection of the law, there is no true freedom. The law should apply to all people equally, no matter who they are or what position they have. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Bramberg. On behalf of Ms. Coran, Brad Geiger, Holly Kluth, Mike Woldridge. State statute and policies clearly define terms and policy. This helps create effective and enforceable policies. By failing to define teasing in the bullying policy, any child can assert they were only teasing and there is no st standard to refute that. This change will, with no, this change with limited notice unintentionally guts the policy. Poor process results in poor policies. Thank you. On behalf of Mr. Geiger, Holly Kluth, Mike Woldridge, Tara Johnson-Schwartz. Good evening. Holly Kluth, a 33-year resident of Douglas County, former parent uh, or parent of former students in the district. Uh, I want to commend you that this is a step in the right direction. These policies go farther to ensure inclusion for everyone and equity for everyone. But I particularly studied the um, mental health and wellness policy. And I 
didn't even realize it before, that it allowed for a student 12 years old to consent without parents' consent to psychological treatment. And I commend you for changing that and giving the rights back to the parents in such a critical situation. I support you. I thank you all remaining. for the time that you spend on this board and the anguish sometimes that causes. Thank you for being here and for doing what you're doing. I support you. Thank you, Ms. Cleef. Mike Woldridge, Tara Johnson-Schwartz, followed by Megan Birch. Uh, Mike Woldridge, uh, proud parent of four uh, DCSD kids. Um, I am in support of the board's <clears throat> proposed changes to the parent engagement and the equity, pol equity policy, but as I, hopefully we all know, these, this is just a start. Um, I'm also in favor of the proposed changes that require parental consent for the mental health services to the school setting. My wife is a school counselor, and last year in DCSD schools, she received guidance many times that students as young as kindergartners who are requesting to change their name and or pronouns and keep it a secret from their parents, that the schools are required to keep their confidentiality. Let that sink in for a minute. I'd also like to make sure that we're all paying attention to what's going on at Stone Mountain as well and some of the things that are being allowed to happen there. 15 seconds remaining. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Woldridge. Tara Johnson-Schwartz, Megan Birch, Laura Eicher. It's unacceptable to minimize the protections provided in the existing bullying policies. Why should we allow bullies the opportunity to claim victimization? Why force children to second guess their reports? Data confirms youth suicides as a result of bullying are on the rise. Clear bullying prevention policies should be on the forefront. How many of you actually recall being a teen? How much of your personal struggles did you share with your parents? Not a lot, exactly. Douglas County isn't Mayberry, it never was. Let our youth's mental health wellness be a priority and not a liability. Changing the language and diversity policies sounds a lot like those of Woodland Park, Colorado's superintendent. He cut mental health services and shoved far-right American birthright social studies programs down the throats of its students. Make your true intentions known in your vote so that we the people can identify who we need to weed out in the next election. Some of us have a conscience and believe in following legal process, composing clear policies, and providing an equitable passage of, to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Do you? Thank you, Ms. Johnson-Swartz. Megan Birch, Laura Eicher, followed by Kevin Carney. Good evening, my name is Megan Birch, DCSD parent, and I'm here again to voice my support for the equity policy as originally written. Um, during the last board discussion with, about the policy, Director Williams, I heard you note that your biggest concern was the policy implementation, citing an example of a privileged walk activity. I've heard some of you others echo this concern too. Experiencing discomfort in a privileged walk is not the same as experiencing the harm of ongoing racism, homophobia, misogyny, and other forms of bigotry. Bigotry and hatred in our school has a devastating impact on our learning environment and mental health of our students. And this hostile environment impacts all of our students, even if they are not being directly targeted. Additionally, I wanna note that families have the choice to opt their students out of these privilege walks that promote empathy and compassion. 15 seconds I can't remaining. opt my kid out of being in a classroom with rape jokes and disparaging comments about women's bodies. I can't opt her out of the homophobic slurs she hears and sees written around her school. Jeremiah Gansey and his family could not opt out of experiencing racism. Let's do better. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Birch. Laura Eicher, Kevin Carney, followed by Richard Bell. Good evening, board. I sent in my comments uh, regarding the revisions to the policies earlier. I support the changes you are making. I want to thank you all for your hard work in this effort. And I also want to thank you for making children's education and their safety your priority. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you, Ms. Eicher. Kevin Carney, Richard Bell, followed by Julie Watkins. 
<clears throat> I had three kids go through Douglas County schools in the early 2000s where they received a good education despite not having equity, diversity, and inclusion stand, stated in the policy of the school district. Receiving a good education is, after all, the goal of any good school district. All three are now faithful Christians and solid members of our community. When I read over the proposed updates to the educational equity policy, I wondered why the word identity was even need to be defined. Around the U.S., bringing identity into the conversation has led us to an us versus them theme that just seems to provide more division than unity. If teachers and administrators focus on identity, they will always <clears throat> leave some students out of the conversation. Cliques and groups are always going to be formed in remaining. schools. That's human nature. Perhaps the focus should not be to let students celebrate their common humanity without strict rules. Policy definition of representation further exacerbates any division caused by the identity definition. Will teachers segregate students in classrooms based on representation? I'm praying for you guys, and I'm praying for the Douglas County Schools. Thank you, Mr. Carney. Richard Bell, Julie Watkins, followed by Renee Anderson. Mr. Bell. Well, I just lost my slide. Anyway, I want to thank all of you for your efforts. And uh, I appreciate you guys all working together to make this school district better. I agree and I support the uh, proposed changes to the equity policy and the associated policies. I've read through them, I've submitted written comments, and uh, look forward to uh, you know, the community having some of the additional comments and making improvements on those. And I do agree that identity should remove, be removed. We're all Americans. We all are under the Constitution, and we should comply with that and apply that. Anyway, I thank you all. seconds remaining. I thank you for your efforts and all the best. Thank you, Mr. Bell. <laughs> Julie Watkins, Renee Anderson, followed by Jason Hurd. Julie Watkins is experiencing a lot of back pain and it's hard for her to move around. Is it okay if I read hers? Thank you. I have heard many of you use the phrase assume positive intent over the last over the past several years and I ask you this how do you assume positive intent when it comes to hate speech racism homophobia anti-semitism sexism ableism xenophobia and other kinds of discrimination how do you assume positive intent when our district leader accepts an award from a local hate group like CPAN when kids first directors consult with the organizations like FAIR on policy changes how do you assume positive intent intent when kids first directors continue to ignore data feedback, continue exclusionary practices, and continue spreading misinformation and disinformation? How do you assume positive intent when kids first directors and certain district leaders actively refuse to collaborate with remaining. the community members, parents, students, and staff who continuously deal with this discrimination? Our community shouldn't assume positive intent behind the Kids First political agenda. Our community needs an honest and relentless look into the problems we are collectively facing. Thank you, Ms. Iverson. On behalf of Ms. Watkins, Renee Anderson, Jason Hurd, followed by Mike Dixon. Ms. Anderson. Thank you. Good evening. I'd like to thank this board for listening to the entire community. The changes to many of these policies appear to be recommendations from staff and well thought through. Thank you for honoring their request to approve them so that policy and practice are in alignment and needed in order to best serve students. The proposed updates to the educational equity parent engagement policies honor the intent of educators and staff to support all students. The powerful partnership between parents and teachers and the important roles that each play in supporting students. Again, thank you for truly listening to your community and navigating through the energy around these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Jason Hurd, Mike Dixon, followed by Nadine Klein. Uh, good, e good evening, Board of Directors and Superintendent Kane. Um, I was at one of the last board meetings where I heard three students at least talk about um, racial slurs being thrown at them over the years and nothing being done about that. I think that's a major problem and I think that's a problem of enforcement. I share a dinner table with my children very often and I hear similar stories. Bullying of different sorts goes on in schools. Um, it, it happened to me when I was a kid, it's very common. 
But I also remember the last meeting with a lot of splitting hairs over words, one word at a time, laboriously going over bits and pieces of the, e of the ADB. Um, I heard Director Meek in this meeting asking for yet more time and more debate. And I will tell you that from what I heard from these kids and what I've heard from my, my children, the kids that are in Douglas County School seconds need remaining. help now. Focus on enforcement and stop debating redundant policies such as the ADB. I believe this ADB is wholly unnecessary and worse, it distracts the board from enforcement. I mean this in the most constructive and positive way, but talk is cheap. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mike Dixon, Nadine Klein, followed by Amy Winju. Okay, Nadine Klein, Amy Winju, followed by Lorene Bull. Good evening, my name is Nadine Klein and I am finishing my 23rd year teaching in Douglas County and I'm a proud member of the DCF. I felt compelled to speak tonight in response to what I've learned has been happening in our own community to one of our own, Jeremiah Ganzi. I'm absolutely appalled at the treatment he has received and the grossly, grotesquely hateful social media posts that extend past just Jeremiah. I can hide behind my white privilege and I'm not afraid to articulate that. You see, the authors of those posts would have to be informed that I'm Jewish before they'd include me as a victim in another Holocaust or genocide. Jeremiah does not have that privilege. The principal of Castle Rock Middle School cannot follow policy government on this issue since the board has yet to pass the equity policy, a policy that should have been passed 15 over a year seconds ago. seconds remaining. Now I'm fearful for my own safety, but I won't be silent. I will continue to stand up for the kids and staff in our district, and I call upon you to pass the equity policy as it was originally written. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Klein, Amy Winju, Lorreen Bowl, followed by Cindy Aiken. Ms. Winju. Good evening and thank you. Um, Director Ray and Director Meek broaden the equity policy in No Place for Hate, which characterizes racism as systemic, i.e. not based on an individual but a whole group. In this case, all whites are responsible for America's current systemic racism. No Place for Hate also teaches the importance of educating children on the use of pronouns to signal an inclusive and safe classroom. I've often wondered why Director Meek and Director Ray haven't introduced themselves at each board meeting or even equity meetings with what their preferred pronouns are and why these directors haven't apologized for their contributions to America's systemic racism. Remaining. With that being said, the current form of the education equity policy doesn't mention each individual student, nor does it mention collaboration with parents. For these reasons, I support the proposed changes to the education equity policy. Thank you, Ms. Winju. Lorraine Bowl, Cindy Aiken, followed by Luke Johnson. Good evening. DCSC mission allows each student to reach his or her individual potential. Note that there's no reference to group identity in DCSC's mission, so why are there still references to group identity throughout the equity policy? I recently listened to a talk by a rabbi about ethical individualism, the premise of which is how to have harmonious human relations. The unchallenged truth of being human is that we're unique. We exist in our minds. In order to connect with others, we have to connect with the minds of others. Judging people by a particular group they've been slotted into is dehumanizing. Healthy human connections won't happen if they're based on stereotypes. 15 seconds remaining. Ask a German or a Rwandan how grouping and judging people turned out. We should never teach children that they ought to judge others by what group they're in. And I worry that the numerous references to identity groups in the equity policy has contributed to a culture in which groups are celebrated and given special attention. I hope the school board will consider removing all references to identity groups in this policy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Paul. Cindy Aiken, Luke Johnson, and then Matthew Solak. Cindy had to go. Luke Johnson, Matthew Solak, followed by Rosabel Harrington. 
I do not see Mr. Johnson here. We will move on to Matthew Solak, Rosabelle Harrington, followed by Matt Cassidy. In my classroom, I'm constantly assessing my students to see where they are in their learning. And based on that data, I adjust my teaching to help my students learn. My teaching is data driven because that is how I know what my students need to be successful. Good policy making should also be data driven because only then can you ensure that the policy meets the needs of the system. This is why I agree with Director Meek in calling for a monitoring report about how the equity policy is being implemented in our system and based on that data, being in, making informed changes to the policy to help improve our district. We shouldn't be focus, focusing our attention on these politically motivated changes to the equity policy and should be focusing on how we address racism and bullying of LGBTQ students in our schools. Remaining. We should be focusing on how to provide better services to our special education students. So I ask the board to please look at the data before making any policy changes and please spend your time addressing how vulnerable students are being treated in our schools. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sola. Rosabelle Harrington, Matthew, Matt Cassidy, followed by Joy Overbeck. Good evening. Tonight I'm speaking in support of a common sense approach to policy changes. Our children are our most precious asset. Creating and maintaining a learning environment through fair and reasonable educational equity where children can fully utilize the resources for their education is a key part of safeguarding, protecting, and supporting our children through their most formative years. I speak in support of your proposed changes as they help to ensure the best possible outcomes for each of our children. Another policy that goes hand in hand with educational equity is student mental health services. These services need to be provided to our children in a way that saves lives and involves parents. When my sister was a teenager, a teacher found a suicide note with all the details for complete follow through of her plans. Remaining. She was then sent to a qualified mental health professional within the school for evaluation and was found to be in danger to herself. My parents were contacted and my sister was transported to a facility where she could be safe, cared for, and treated. Because of the hands-on swift caring approach of these qualified professionals working with my parents. My sister is alive today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harrington. Matt Cassidy, Joy Overbeck, followed by Tammy Fleming. I do not see Mr. Cassidy here. Joy Overbeck, Tammy Fleming, followed by Marianne Ulmer. You're a second grader at a DSCD elementary school and your best friend lives on your block. You take the school bus together, play at the local playground, ride bikes together, and your parents are good friends. But now in school you learn your best friend hates you and will prevent you from having a happy, successful life because your best friend is white and you are black. You learn that you are a victim and your best friend is bent on denying you the good things in life because you belong to different identity groups, different tribes. We and you must ask yourselves, what is it that we want to achieve with promotion of different identity groups? through diversity, inclusion, and equity. If our goal is kids who are kinder to each other, who care about each other, who help each other, seconds that remaining. will not happen with this policy, okay? Uh, we have lots of local laws and state laws and federal laws, starting with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, nearly 60 years ago. Um, we can replace all this policy with one simple expression, love your neighbor as yourself but we can't do that because it's the Bible. Thank your job you, is Overbeck. your job is to educate our kids. Please do that job. Dump this equity policy. Th thank you, Ms. Overbeck. Tammy Fleming, Marianne Ulmer, followed by Mark Ulmer. Um, I gotta find my, don't start my timer yet. Give me one second. Um, so, sorry, I literally like ran up the stairs. <laughs> um, I just wanted to talk real quick about discrimination, which 
is defined as the unequal treatment of members of various groups based on race or gender, social class, et cetera. So I feel like the culture that's being created with this equity policy, that of hyper-focusing on people's skin color leads to more discrimination as evidenced by the discriminatory suggestion at the last board meeting that the board shouldn't just listen to the privileged white folks in the room. Without the speaker knowing a single thing about me, about my upbringing, my struggles, my accomplishments, things that would have a direct influence on my opinion, I was told that my voice is less relevant. Based on observation, 25 of the 30 in-person speakers last month were people whose society would consider white. 15 seconds Don't their remaining. voices matter as much as the other five speakers? What is the point of public comment if only five of the 30 speakers are to be taken seriously? And I don't feel like certain voices should be elevated based on their identity group while others are silenced. I support the changes that the board is making to the policy until we get to a point where it can be repealed entirely. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fleming. Marianne Ulmer, Mark Ulmer, followed by Allison Ridwell. Do we have Marianne or Mark Ulmer in the room? Okay, we'll move on to Allison Ridwell, Juan Candil, followed by Holly Horn. All right, I'll be quick. In March of 2021, a systemic Office of Civil Rights complaint was filed and founded against the entire bridge program in DCSD. This mirrored the personal one I filed for my own son. During the investigation, both the principal and the special education director stated that the IEPs of bridge students do not dictate how much time is spent in the classroom versus in the community. OCR actually read all 112 of the IEPs IEPs in question and found that every one of them had specified community-based hours delineated in those IEPs. OCR deemed the district was not following the law. Only then did DCSD's lawyer in charge of special education agree to enter into a resolution. I want this board to be aware that three of their employees have opened this district remaining. to clear legal liabilities. The legal counsel in charge blatantly disregards deadlines, rules, and directives from OCR. The principal and special education director have blatantly lied, which is provable to OCR. Fix this issue or the parents of SPED students will do it for you through legal means. Thank you, Ms. Ridwell. Juan Candil, Holly Horn, and then Robert Marshall. Uh, today, I just wanted to come out here in support of uh, what the majority is doing. As a Hispanic immigrant to this country, I believe that all people should be equally valuable and should be provided the opportunity to learn at their best. I thank you for all the hard work you, have, you guys have been putting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Candil. <laughs> Holly Horn, Robert Marshall, and then we will transition online with Tiffany Baker. It's Holly Horn here. Good evening. My name is Holly Horn, and I'm here to be a voice of support for all the proposed policy changes being considered for vote tonight. This board is not racist. The district as a whole is not racist. There are some kids who have behaved horribly. And these policies help ensure they face consequences as they should. Sorry, I'm out of breath too. <laughs> I trust the board majority to do what is right and thank you for following through on your promises to the students, families, staff, and stakeholders of Douglas County. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Horn. Robert Marshall, then online to Tiffany Baker, followed by Ursula Kekos. Mr. Marshall. So one minute, huh? Campaign promises seem to be forgotten. We had 400 witnesses on the assault weapons ban bill and didn't take them down to one minute. Um, it's embarrassing to have colleagues in the state house ask me, isn't that your school district when our school board is once again in the media for illegal, unethical, or morally tone-deaf behavior? But this board's actions have informed my own. You all 
are the reason I voted for SB 23-296, prevent harassment and discrimination in the schools. I don't know if your lobbyist told you my response when I was approached and asked to oppose that bill. I have a lot of respect for him, but I made it clear that the Doug Coe School District has no credibility on any issues regarding racism, discrimination, and harassment, which my colleagues share. I voted for that bill due to my embarrassment that remaining. the school board has become and the treatment of the Gasney family at the top of my mind. Uh, you can continue to ignore problems, but others will impose a solution, and it may not be one you like. So it is better to get ahead and face these problems forthrightly rather than pretend they don't exist. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Online, we have Tiffany, Tiffany Baker, Ursula Kekos, followed by Pam Hampton. Mr. Blair is Ms. Baker online. She is, sir. A former first vice chair at Douglas County Republican Party and chair at District Accountability Committee, David DiCarlo, is registered on Colorado Tracer to run for school board in 2023 for the chair previously held by Director Hansen, who just resigned. David DiCarlo has previously testified at the state capitol against taxpayer funds being used to educate children of undocumented immigrants. This stance would, of course, go against the original purpose of policy ADB, which includes students of different national origins. The other current school board candidate registering as running in District C is Bradford Geiger. He would be a nonpartisan director, has experience working with stakeholders across the political spectrum on the Mill Bond Exploratory Committee and Long-Term Planning Committee. When discussing who will replace Elizabeth Hansen, I hope you consider candidates who would not further divide or our school district and would support putting Mill Bond ballot remaining. measures on the ballot. David DiCarlo has not supported taxpayer funding to increase teacher salaries and build new neighborhood schools in the past. Dump the politics and choose wisely. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baker. I've been told that Ms. Ulmer and Mr. Ulmer are here. Are they now present? Okay, if we bring them in, we'll go back to live comment. We'll have Marianne Ulmer uh, followed by Mark Ulmer. Good evening, board members. I'm here tonight to speak about the equity policy. It is disturbing to me that a few directors do not want to even discuss the revising, revising of these policies. I've heard them say experts have done extensive research and we should follow the policies as written. What? I believe in equality. I believe in working hard, being kind, and doing the right thing, whether it benefits you or not. The, purpose, the proposed equity policy promotes division and separation of groups. The policy should be repealed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ulmer. We'll then have Mr. Mark Ulmer, then go back online with Ursula Kekos, followed by Pam Hampton. Mr. Ulmer. My name is Mark Ulmer. I've been a resident of Highlands Ranch for the past 20 years and a res Colorado resident for more than 40 years. I'd like to express my support for the current Douglas County School Board members, and I support their efforts to remove the definition of identity from the policy. I support the revised definition of diversity in the policy. I believe the definition of representation should be removed from the policy, and in total, I really think the policy should be repealed. Offering our students the opportunity to succeed is the point. It's the purpose of the board. Traditional values have proven to be drivers of success, good for our children, good for current generation, good for future generations, good for America. Countless studies prove the earning, the earning of achievement and progress remaining. greatly enhances the individual's confidence, resilience, and ability to prosper. I implore the current democratically elected and strongly supported Douglas County School Board members to stay the course and know you will be sustained by the constituency. Continue believing in America and our children. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ulmer. We are back online with Ursula Kekos, Pam Hampton, followed by Katie Barrett. Is Ms. Kekos online? She is, sir. <clears throat> She's unmuted. And I... See, uh not out, but I think that it should be an electronic signature for parents when you're dealing with sensitive material. My son was just in a class where he uh, was electric, diesel, what kind of 
heat do you have at your home? Gas, electric? How many times do you go on vacation per year? How long are you gone? Do you take an airplane or do you drive? I think these are all things that are personal. And this house was also asked. This is not something that should be coming out unless you can keep your own information out. We need to have these types of things, not in our schools. I do support all of the changes that you're making to our equity policy, but I don't need to see why, since we already have all these things in place to protect children. This is just politicizing our schools. Thank you, Ms. Kakos. Pam Hampton, Katie Barrett, followed by Kristen Wheeland. Hi, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. Hi, this is, Hi, this is I'm getting a lot of feedback, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, is this Ms. Hampton or is this uh, Ms. Barrett? This is Pam Hampton. Okay, thank you, Ms. Uh, Hampton, go ahead, we can hear you. Hello? Go ahead and start over, Ms. Hampton. Okay. Uh, this is Pam Hampton, and I've lived in Parker since 1986. In the last couple of years, school districts have pushed equity, CRT, and gender ideology into children's minds. I'm not saying all of this is happening in Douglas County, but since we're here tonight to talk about the equity policy, we know that some of the radical ideas are creeping into our public schools. I agree that every student in Douglas County should have the right to a great education, regardless of race, color, creed, or sex. But doesn't it seem that the great education is the last thing they are receiving? When my kids were in elementary school, the D D Douglas County District was second remaining. in the state, just behind Cherry Creek. Now our district is number 15. That's still pretty good, but only 48% are proficient in math, and 59% in reading. Why don't the administrators and board make improving the education and test scores a priority instead of equity? Thank you, Ms. Hampton, Katie Barrett, Kristen Whelan, followed by Darren Whelan. Ms. Barrett is not online, sir. Hey, Ms. Barrett is not online. We will go to Kristen Whelan, followed by Darren <laughs> Whelan, then Tina De Los Santos. Good evening. It was telling when a large group of, quote, concerned parents from various far-right organizations exited the audience at the April 25 board meeting as soon as their highly coordinated comments on ADB were finished. Why didn't they stay for discussion of the policy? The parents' rights movement is a dangerous fail for wanting to control what our children are taught and to indoctrinate our children with far-right parents' ideologies. Steeped with religious undertones and non-factual and limited academics, usurping our First Amendment, uh, First Amendment rights. It is wrong that the board majority is caving to special interest groups after 15 months of nothing being done. Mike and Christy inserted many nods to the parents' rights movement, fair and see pan in their seconds revisions. remaining. Instead of infusing our policies with nefarious political influences, shouldn't we be asking the Gansies how they feel about farcical and convenient terms like soft racism and colorblindness versus the very tangible threat of lynching? Dubious. Thank you, Ms. Wheeland. We'll now move to Mr. Wheeland. Tina De Los Santos, followed by Patricia Kalis. Okay, uh, we'll move to Ms. De Los Santos, Patricia Kalis, followed by Roger Hudden. Mr. Whelan is online, sir. Oh, okay, I was informed he would not be speaking. Go ahead, Mr. Whelan. Uh, good evening, I'm reading on behalf of uh, Douglas County Social Schools uh, social studies school teacher. In the words of uh, Nigerian author Jimabanda Adichie, quote, the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but they are incomplete. They make one story become only th the, the only story, end quote. The stories we tell, the narratives we share, the beliefs we perpetuate are one that makes our culture. Now to some, American culture may be white, male and Protestant, but is that our only story? Is this really all we have to offer the world? Our true colors, our true grit, our complete story, as proud as it is 15 true. 15 seconds remaining. 
This history is one of many stories from many walks of life, and it is absolutely beautiful. The truest travesty is to deny our children, our future, these stories. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whelan. Tina De Los Santos, Patricia Kelly's, followed by Roger Hutton. Oh, disgusting acts of racism. Seriously? What did you think the outcome would be of telling children they are oppressed or oppressors? You really couldn't see the outcome of segregating children by the color of their skin? The equity policy should be fully repealed. It's not working and is a breeding ground for more division. Be brave and ditch it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. De Los Santos. Patricia Callis, Roger Hutton, followed by Rachel Garmers. Okay, is Mitch Garmers online? No, sir. Okay, Brandy Bradley, Elizabeth Shunug, followed by Tiffany Wilson. Is Miss Bradley online? Can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. The hypocrisy being spoken tonight while wow. listening to venom being spewed by parents who preach diversity and inclusion, you wonder what's being taught in their own homes. This is a small minority of parents, and we appreciate the four of years' hard work. We want to repeal the equity policy and stop playing exclusion over inclusion, stop pitting students against each other and get rid of this policy. We support you guys. We will always support you guys, and we appreciate all that you have done to make Douglas County better. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bradley. Elizabeth Shunug, Tiffany Wilson, followed by Lauren Kinney. The next two speakers are not online, sir. Ms. Kinney is online. Go ahead, Ms. Kinney. I'm a school counselor in DCSD and I'm absolutely heartbroken to hear the division in this room right now. Um, and honestly, this is my first school board meeting and I can see why I haven't heard any of my colleagues speaking on behalf of their experience or on the students' stories that they endure and hearing about the trauma of the different communities. And I honestly, I need to believe that I'm not the only one hungry for change or with a heart capable of seeing every child as my own and every parent as a friend I haven't met yet. So I beg you, please consider being generous with your grace and respect, but most of all, embrace the willingness to allow someone else's life experience to change your mind. The foundation for your is understanding. And if we just keep preaching to our own choirs and we're not trying to find the common ground amongst ourselves, we will never get anywhere. And we have to remember that we are here for the students at the end of the day and what is best for them. Thank you, Ms. Kinney. Mandy Mal, followed by Alicia Malouf. She is online asking to uh, Is this Mandy Mal? Am I up right now? Yep, you are up. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, we've been able to see how leftist policies destroy education and children's mental health since they took over the system many years ago. We're in the biggest mental health crisis in history, and the answer to this is not perpetuating victimhood and division, but allowing for empowerment, empathy, and unity. Behavioral issues, including racist or hateful comments, should be dealt with swiftly and on a one-on-one -on -one basis, not as part of a curriculum. I think it's important to note that equity is a term from Karl Marx's communist manifesto. He used this term to get people to buy into socialism, which eventually led to millions of horrific deaths, poverty, and despair. He was an extremely sexist and racist individual who stated that his own soul was destined for hell. Why are we using this term now? In observing several of the equity board meetings, it's easy to see that this exemplifies the racism remaining. he created as they have an excessive need to separate people into groups based on race, which is inherently racist. The more we allow these types of policies in our schools, the more we open the door to communist extremism. Thank you, and I support the, the current uh, school board member. Thank you, Ms. Mel. Alicia Malouf. Can 
you hear me? This is Alicia Maloof. Go ahead, Ms. Maloof. Hi there. I would like to re reiterate what Mr. Almer and Ms. De Los Santos have already stated. Thank you so much for representing the constituents of this democratically elected school board. And let me also thank Elizabeth Hansen for stepping down tonight. My family and I fully support the changes in the discriminatory anti-discrimination policy. And as liberals, we voted kids first, education first, community first. We fully support the repeal of this policy. However, we also understand that there is a impetus for us to work together. And so we fully support the changes that you have made and have proposed tonight. 15 seconds Thank remaining. you so much. Thank you, Ms. Maloof. It is 7.40. We'll now take a 10-minute recess.
We are now on item number 12, adoption of consent agenda. Uh, these the agenda items detailed in items number 13 through 19 organized for Board of Education block approval. Do I have any motions concerning consent? Um, President Peterson, I'd like to pull items, um, let's see, 18, cancellation of the June 6th regular board meeting study session, and item 19, superintendent monitoring report. Okay, we have a pull of items 18 and 19. Do we have any other motions concerning consent? Director Ray. Uh, also removing uh, item number 14, please. Okay, item number 14. Do we have any motions concerning consent agenda items number 13, 15, 16, and 17? Motion to approve consent agenda items number 13, 15, and 16. Second. I believe it's 13, oh, seven, 15. 13, 15, 16, and 17, and yes. Okay, so Second. items number 13, 15, 16, and 17, motion by Ray, second by Williams. I'll take the roll. Meek? Aye. Myers? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weiniger? Aye. Passed six to zero. Uh, we will take up uh, in order item number 14. And I believe, Director Ray, you're the one that asked for that to be removed. Thank you, Director Peterson. Um, yes, I would like for, well, first of all, this, this particular item, as you know, is regarding the increase of student fees. And um, I have asked the question regarding the financial reasoning behind that. I understand it's inflationary cost. Um, I have asked what it would take for our budget to be able to not pass that inflationary cost on to our parents. So that's my question is, what would it take for us not to have that passed on to our parents? And right now, the, the main fees that I'm looking at are elementary is going from 20 to $30 per student, middle 25 to 35, high school 30 to 40 dollars per student. And there are other fees as well, but I think those are the fees that are most concerning to me. So my question is the financial plan around not placing that on the backs of our parents. I'll direct that to the superintendent or anyone that she, she sees fit. Mr. Reynolds will address that question. <clears throat> Good evening, Board President, uh, Director Ray. Thank you very much for the question. Um, we have held fees uh, for several years in terms of uh, these universal uh, fees that are pride for instructional resources. Um, and all of our costs, just like anything else in the community, have gone up um, as a result of inflationary costs, whether it's our licensing costs for software, um, textbooks, material costs have all gone up. Um, so this $10 per student would equate to, depending on our, our enrollment, um, anywhere between four dollars and $500,000 that allows our schools to be able to um, work with those programs within the realm of those programs. It becomes extremely difficult, especially for our smaller elementary schools who don't have the capacity uh, to be able to purchase materials. Um, each year with ongoing inflation, it becomes more and more stressful. So the request, um, which you know is coming from building leaders as well as other department officials, is uh, this would help alleviate the stress that they have, especially for our smaller schools at elementary. Okay, follow up. Um, so, Mr. Reynolds, um, you're, you're saying that the ten dollars that we're assessing of the increase would would require a total of four hundred thousand dollars for us to stay status quo or for us to increase the financial sources for our schools? Uh, Director Ray, thank you very much for the question. Uh, the question gets complicated uh, because people are making decisions of what they can and cannot purchase. Uh, when I refer to the total amount, I'm thinking the total amount of revenue generated based on the number of students. Individual schools would have to make their own decisions about what they can and cannot purchase in their budget setting process. So for us to do an analysis, we would have to almost have two different cases. 
with the funding and with the principals making decisions about their budget and one without, uh, because they're going to have to make this decisions, especially our smaller elementary schools. So, I, and I understand the inflationary cost increases, but it appears if you look at elementary, for instance, going from a $20 to a $30, that inflationary cost is 50%. Uh, where compared to the high school where it's more like 33%. So it's, it's kind of hard for me to understand uh, why we've gone this long before we've tried to reconcile with our schools to get the resources they need. But secondly, why our inflationary rate of those fees is so um, grotesquely different than the standard um, inflationary rate in our country. Uh, perfect. I, I can answer uh, pretty succinctly. Um, in terms of curriculum resources and things like that and licensing costs, it really doesn't determine by level. Um, it's a by student purchase price. And so if it goes up $10 for elementary, it's going up $10 for each of the other levels as well. And so that while the proportionally it looks like it's a larger amount, these schools are still paying a very similar amount in terms of licensing fees and material fees. Um, those costs are, are sent to us by vendors, and so we're largely held to whatever that cost is with vendors pushing that cost back to us. Um, a unique thing that has come up with us as well is, as we've come out of 2021, with supply chain issues and things like that, the inflationary costs for much of our materials is far greater than the initial inflationary costs that we all experience at the grocery store, because some of those materials are, are just more expensive because of supply chain issues. And we've seen that for curriculum materials. Um, and that's, again, it's extremely difficult for our elementary schools who do not have that expanded uh, you know, enrollment to be able to negotiate different prices. And Ms. Reynolds, it's also I, my understanding of my previous experience that we do have mechanisms in place for families who are economically challenged that aren't able to afford these fees, that there is, there, there are mechanisms where those families do indeed get waived from paying that fee. Is that correct? You are correct, yes. Okay. So, um, if I may go on, um, the reason I pulled this, and I thank you, Mr. Reynolds, for the summary, um, but what is difficult for me ethically, and I think Director Hansen, with her resignation, uh, articulated it so well, is that when this board's actions have cost the district thousands of dollars, and then in turn, we turn around and we say to our community, but we want you to pay more money for the fees for your students to come to school, ethically, I can't support that. Um, I, I believe that there is a contradiction in doing that. Um, $400,000 is a lot of money, but this board, <laughs> quite honestly, has um, spent thousands of dollars that could have been used towards helping our schools that are saying that they don't have enough money for the resources for learners. So. Um, <clears throat> So that's why I uh, pulled this item. I'm, I'm satisfied with the response, uh, <clears throat> although I still would like to see what our budget would look like. What would we have to cut? What would we have to transfer so that we're not trying to balance the education, the financial cost of education on the backs of our parents? Um, but I'm, I'm not gonna go there. I'm simply going to just um, communicate my objection and the ethical dilemma of understanding the need for our schools, but yet this board continues to drain the, the district of needed resources. Any other questions or any other discussion by other members? Director Meek. I, I know we received a you know, question in the e in email from a teacher who's also a parent. I'm wondering if we <clears throat> have considered any kind of um, special help or support for our employees, knowing that we are struggling to attract employees because of the competitive wage differential between our district and other districts. Is that an area that's been considered? 
I can address that question, President Peterson. Yes, we have um, discussed fees for our um, teachers and staff who also have children in our district. Um, and as you know, we have, as a start, discounted um, the uh, before and after school care for um, our employees. And as we dug into fees, because I asked all of those same questions, as we dug into fees, um, it became significantly more complicated. So it's just something that we, it is absolutely something on our radar. It's going to take us a little bit of time to figure out what we are in a position to do and what we are not in a position to do. Other directors, comments, questions? Okay, do we have a motion concerning item number 14, approval of JQE Appendix A student fee schedule? Motion to approve. Understand uh, motion by Weiniger to approve uh, JQE Appendix A student fee schedule as submitted. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Williams. Without further discussion, I will take the roll. Meek. Yeah, I will vote no, just because this board has demonstrated that it is prioritizing spending money towards frivolous lawsuits. And I do think we have money if we chose different priorities at this point in time. My vote is a no. Myers? Aye. Peterson, aye. Ray? Uh, my vote is no. Until this board models the financial stewardship that we were elected to do. Um, we have no business going out to our parents and saying, pay more for your child's education. My vote is a no. Director Williams. Just a quick response. We have not chosen to be sued. So therefore we are defending ourselves and we have the right to do so. So I'm a yes. Director Weiniger. <laughs> Audience. Yes. Passed by a vote of four to two. We'll take up item number 18. I believe Director Meek pulled that from consent. That is the cancellation of the June 6, 2023 regular board meeting study session. Director Meek. Um, so the first time I saw it was when I saw the agenda that was posted. So it would really be helpful to understand why we're canceling a pre-scheduled meeting. Okay, this was discussed at agenda planning. I'll turn it over to the superintendent because that's where the request came from and then I will comment as appropriate. Yes, actually this um, request did come, or this suggestion rather did come from me in agenda planning um, because in looking at the, um, the work and the things coming up over the summer that need to be addressed um, by the board, the June 20th meeting should be sufficient to address um, the things that at least it is our understanding uh, need to be addressed over the summer. Um, and, and to be frank, as um, all of you know, and certainly I know you all are working very hard too, um, we have an extremely um, thin staff that has been working incredibly hard as in 100 hours a week times a lot of my cabinet members. Um, and so to have one less uh, Board of Education meeting um, by not having a meeting in two weeks, it will help um, staff, frankly, be able to take a breath um, because it has been uh, an incredibly difficult and um, a month of just a lot of work by a lot of people. So um, that was actually where the uh, request came from, but certainly we will um, comply with whatever the Board of Education desires. Thank you for hearing me out. Thank you, Superintendent. Other directors, comments, questions? Director Meek. Sure. The reason I really wanted to talk about it, in, and I do acknowledge how much work. May is extremely busy, which was part of the concern with trying to push through all of these policies this evening. Like, I'm not sure what the urgency is to push them through versus take our time and have meaningful conversations. But at the DAC meeting, we had... Um, Director Myers and I had a lot of questions at that DAC meeting. We had questions on, well, what are the next steps with the MLO and bond? And um, I know we have an agenda item on here tonight, but we don't have much time scheduled to really talk about that. And there was a sense of urgency on that topic. We have um, not 
had any kind of explanation on what the implications of the ballot measures would be in November, which I think feeds into the MLO and bond conversation and decision, which I do believe we need to make very soon. We've been told by MBEC that, you know, going out earlier is really important. Um, we have the budget adoption takes place on June 20th, and the June 6th meeting allows for time to really discuss the budget, the bond, the tax implications, et cetera. We have heavy work that goes on during this time frame. And then lastly, I just received you know, notice, um, both Director Williams and I, that there's an emergency LRPC meeting this Thursday with Board of Ed presentation and recommendations for June 20th, I believe. And so we don't even have information on that. And I feel like canceling a meeting that was already scheduled in two weeks, um, there are items that we can receive updates on that is work underway that really is critical for us to be doing our job effectively and efficiently. Thank you, Director Meek. Other director comments? Concerns, Director Ray. Yeah, I want to thank um, Superintendent Kane for the explanation. It would be helpful, though, if we would get that communication sooner. Um, I think all of us, or at least I as well, was kind of surprised why are we canceling a meeting for similar reasons to to Director Meek. Um, this meeting has was approved, you know, a year ago to be on our agenda. So, I, although I'm sympathetic for the the workload of staff. Um, it should not have been a surprise that we would be having a board meeting on that date. And I agree with Director Meek. It just seems to send a mixed message that we're sitting here with a meeting that will take us through midnight and then say that we should cancel a meeting because we don't have enough to discuss on the agenda. So I would appreciate earlier communication and a rationale because I think we could have had this communication at least back to Superintendent Kane had we had questions about that. Um, and we wouldn't have had to take the time tonight to understand um, why that's happening. So, um, so thanks. Okay, thank you, Director Ray. One follow-up question. Um, are all board members available on June 6th for us to have a meeting if we, we so decide to have a meeting? I may be, but I cannot confirm at this point because I've booked other things with this potential eventuality. Uh, I'll leave it over to other board members. Okay, thank you, Director Ray. Any other comments, questions around item number 18? Superintendent Kane. Um, thank you, and thank you for the feedback. Um, it was my assumption that agenda planning was the appropriate place to talk about um, agenda. Um, and certainly, again, staff will support whatever the Board of Education wants to do. One of the things that we run up against um, every June, and especially after um, a particularly busy year, is that we have a lot of staff members that have to take um, that have to use their paid time off days prior to June 30th or they will lose them. Um, so that's, that's a dynamic as well, but I certainly um, will make myself available on June 6th. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Kane. Other comments or questions by directors? Director Ray. Yeah, and just to clarify for the public, agenda planning is not attended by all of us. And, and I know we've had these issues before where something gets discussed at agenda planning, but communication doesn't get to all seven of us. And I would just again advocate if there's something of this nature that impacts our schedules or is something that is something we did not expect to be on a future agenda that that communication for the sake of information be passed on and not just the expectation that, well, it's discussed in agenda planning, therefore everyone must have that information. We don't. Okay. Thank you, Director Ray. If there's no more discussion, I'll uh, entertain any motions around item number 18, cancel cancellation of the June 6, 2023 regular board meeting study session. Do we have a motion? Director Myers. I move that we can continue to cancel June 6 regular board meeting study session. We have a motion by Myers. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second by Weiniger. I will take the roll, Director Meek. Again, and just, I, just yeah. to be clear, the motion is to 
continue with the cancellation. So the motion right. and we're I canceling would be, the you. meeting right. despite we're scheduled to go till midnight tonight and we're worried about staff time. I, I do understand. Thank you. Um, I'm a no. Okay, Director Myers. Aye. Peterson, aye. Ray. My vote is no. We have plenty of work to do that this board and our people that elected us should expect us to do the work that we were elected to do on in the meetings that we were approved to do. So my vote is a no. Director Williams. Aye. Director Weiniger. Aye. Passed by a vote of four to two. And now we are on to item number 19, superintendent monitoring report and number three, safe, positive climate and culture. Director Meek, you remove the item. Thank you. Um, first, I wanna thank the superintendent for updating the monitoring report um, based on the recommended additions. I think it it is definitely a step in the right direction and I very much appreciate that extra work in preparing it. Um, I do need to point out, I, like I find it astounding that given what the data reflects in this report that it was put on a consent agenda. When you look at the new data that was in there and you look at the protests outside and, and you listen to our individuals who give us public comment, you know, when you look at the few data points, and I'll just pull out a few, um, when looking at the percentage of students who agree or strongly agree that they belong at their school, overall it's 68 percent. When you, and it was broken out by ethnicities in the report now, um, it shows 71 percent for white students and 56 percent for black students, which is a 15 point difference. When looking at the percentage of students who've been bullied, on school property during the past 12 months, it shows 14% for white students and 24% for black students, which is a 10 point difference. But the most concerning data point is really regarding the disproportionate rates of discipline where 41% of black students were disciplined versus 16% of white students. That is a 25 point difference and yet no one identifies this as an area of concern. So I'd like to ask Superintendent Kane whether you find these results acceptable. Thank you for the question. Um, the, as uh, mentioned in the prior meeting, the, the student data is from the fall of 2021. So it's almost um, two years out of date. Um, so we are very much looking forward to getting additional student data um, in the fall. Certainly we do not find um, low numbers uh, like that where students um, don't feel like they belong um, acceptable and we are working on getting to the bottom of those numbers. So and thank can, you. Can you tell me what type of training is occurring in our district to prevent racism from occurring and to alleviate systemic racism? We um, had a discussion about that when we presented um, ADB-R and part of our implementation plan was to ensure that we are looking at training for all staff. So um, those are things that we are working through. It's a multi-year implementation plan and our team is working through all of those details. I don't have those details available right now. Thank you. And I highlighted the identity area because that is what was disaggregated. So we didn't have gender disaggregated. And I highlight gender because we know mental health is talked about over and over and over as a concern. And we know through national research that girls are at a much higher risk of mental health concerns and as are LGBTQ students. So having data to help us understand this is really important. And so, you know, and we also don't have data broken out for special, special needs students. And, you know, I, I highlight this because these additional categories are essential if we're to truly have a look at how we're doing in creating a safe, positive climate and culture in our schools. And that's what this monitoring report is about. And that's why we disaggregate data, because it's important for us 
to ensure that there aren't groups of students that we need to take a further look at. And it's not just about race, it's about all of these different areas. And as a board, it is our job to hold the system accountable. It's our job to sit here and celebrate all of the amazing things that happen and so many amazing things happen in our district. We witness that through graduations, we witness that through the celebrations, but as an elected official, we, we take an oath to oversee the organization as well and to abide by laws. And there are laws around groups that we need to look at data and ensure that there isn't discrimination happening. And so again, I thank you for further refining the monitoring report. I think we have, um, we have more work to do in looking at other groups and ensuring that we're doing our job as board members when it comes to accountability. Thank you, Director Meek. Other directors on item number, sorry, let me go back and pull it, uh, 19. Thank you, Director Weiniger. I just had a thought that um, it makes me wonder what the equity policy was helping around this time because um, this was taken in 2021 of the fall and we had the equity policy, I believe, six, seven months around this time. So um, just a thought that I had. Yeah. Director Meek. Yeah, I'd love to respond. Um, so. With the equity policy, when you listen to the presentations, and there were many presentations, one of the areas that prompted the development of the equity policy was concerns around disproportionate discipline rates and other areas like that. And so much of that led into the development of the equity policy. And so when the resolution passed, I think that the individual excellence resolution passed. I think many in the organization and the system question whether they should be moving forward or sh shouldn't be moving forward. I think the equity advisory committee was. Before the resolution though, these results. Oh, sure. That's what I was. Asking. Oh, it's early. Okay, yeah. I thought you were asking the reason for no. that. Okay, so that's the. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Director Meek. I was going to make the same observation as Director Weininger. This is fall of 2021 data that you were referring to, and, it, and it's not good. What I think it says is some of the work we have to do is not new. It's existing work, and it's continuing work that I know that our, our staff, our district leadership, all the way down to the individual classroom leaders, I have not heard a single person that's not committed to, quote, doing that work. Uh, I also, uh, and I know, I believe, I, I won't speak for Mr. Reynolds, but I believe he shares uh, the love of disaggregating data and breaking it down and looking at it in very different ways. Um, but the way I interpret that is uh, when we disaggregate data, it is a efficient and excellent way to find those individuals that may need additional assistance, whether that is in reading, whether that is in math, whether that uh, potentially is around mental health. And, and that includes all our, our groups in all our communities, whether we're talking about uh, talented and gifted kids are not immune to social emotional issues. Um, our students with special needs are not immune, immune to social emotional issues. Um, you know, whatever, however we break that up, gender, race, um, you know, different ways of looking at it. It's just in my mind as one director, a way to efficiently and precisely locate those individuals in our system that need that extra support from the system, whether it's interventions, whether it's a, a different learning focus. Uh, but I do appreciate the disaggregation of data. And I think it's a best practice that we should continue, not just here in Douglas County, we, we know it to be a national best practice. Um, other directors or other comments? Superintendent King? Yeah, I would just like to, um, I would like, just like to add that the work that goes on in our schools every single day involves digging into data on every single student. Um, our counselors and our teachers know their kids and they are working really hard to make sure that they are providing targeted supports, whether it's social, emotional, or academic, 
to every single student. They absolutely are disaggregating data and digging into data in their own schools every single day um, with the support of the district. And some of the supports that you heard um, Assistant Superintendent Windsor discuss um, regarding next year, some of those supports um, are, we're looking at a district-wide systemic, how we can really um, provide those supports for our schools and our teachers. But I wouldn't want anyone to leave this uh, conversation believing that our leaders and our teachers are not doing the work every single day of looking at every single child, which involves slicing the data in a million different ways, including disaggregating data. And in fact, some of the uh, many of the leaders that were up here tonight, you cannot um, receive a John Irwin Award or especially an academic growth award without showing tremendous um, progress in subgroups. We've looked at um, how the accountability system works and um, subgroups are a significant part of the final score that determines um, those growth awards and those achievement awards. So we definitely have a lot of work to do in front of us, but I also want to make really clear that the amazing leaders, people, and, and our district support um, throughout our system are doing that work every single day. Thank you. Uh, other director comments, Director Myers. And this is just my opinion, but throughout the year, as I took a look at the staff and the cabinet and um, saw how lean it was and how much work you were putting out there, I wondered at a time if there was not a push for these monitoring reports too quickly? And ha could we have not had a balance of working on policy that now is appearing to be pushed through and a balance of monitoring reports? Why did we push monitoring reports quickly in one year? Granted, I do know that they, we needed to get on it. We needed to have monitoring reports, but there was not a balance between working on policy and monitoring reports. Thank you, Director Myers. Other directors, comments, questions? Director Meek. Yeah, I, I definitely want to be clear and I want to be heard. We have amazing leaders in our schools and they do amazing work. We celebrate it, we see it. As a board, it's our job to look at the entire system and to try to identify areas because we help set the stage for identifying issues or, or questions. And so while we have amazing leaders doing amazing work, we also have stats that are, are troubling with 53% of our high school dropouts are Latino. So of all the high school dropouts, 53% are Latino. 47% currently in truancy courts are kids of color, so nearly half kids of color. I remember the poverty um, stats in the attendance was an issue. I don't have it right in front of me. 70% um, of students pursuing their GED are male. Why do we have a significantly higher number of males who are struggling with um, graduation? We have 36% of our kids are chronically absent. So so again, I, I just state these because you can have amazing stories happening in every single school, but to identify if there are areas that we need to focus, it's our job to look at the data at this level through the monitoring reports. So again, kudos for enhancing the report. I think we will get better and better with the data that is put forward, but again, um, you know, Director Myers, I've been asking for monitoring on the equity policy since we've been talking about it. So it's an important area. Thank you, Director Meek. Other directors? Uh, Director Ray. Just a couple of responses to uh, Director Myers too regarding monitoring reports. Monitor monitoring reports are not an event. They're really, they're, they're fluid. Uh, superintendent, um, collaborates with us to determine that moment in time when she is going to present some of the data regarding our, our end statements. So I, I think we have to be very careful because I think we've gotten into this mentality that it's an event, that we've 
now we've talked about safe cultures, now we're done, we're not. The, the staff continue to monitor data, they continue to collect data, they continue to look at our practices throughout. Um, so, so I want us to be careful that we don't get into this notion that monitoring reports are, are an event that we either push forward or we push back on. Um, I, I would agree, thank you Superintendent Kane, for modeling that in your monitoring reports that these are a fluid document. They're, they're constantly being revised based on new learnings or based on feedback that you get from, from the board. You come back and you bring improvements, enhancements, or more information, and that's the intent of monitoring reports. Um, I agree 100% with the work that our uh, leaders and our teachers do around disaggregation of data, um, especially in the area of academics, where I think that we tend not to do as much digging is some of the disproportionate data that Director Meek brought up as far as discipline, as far as drop dropouts. Um, and, and I think that's the message that maybe we're conveying is that um, we need to take a, a harder look at that um, in terms of what do we do when, as Director Meek uh, stated, that our Latino uh, students are dropping out at a horrifically higher rate than any other student in our district. What's that all about? And so I think that's the work to be done. But I, I, I'm very pleased that you continue to listen um, and you continue to provide us the data that we are asking for so that we can indeed be that trustee of the system to, to help uh, continue to um, watch and expect uh, even higher expectations and in improvement areas. So thank you for that. Yeah, and I'll just echo Director Ray's comments. It's it's good to see monitoring reports return to DCSD after such an absence. And it's not just an event in time. It's not just a check in the block. It's a continuing conversation uh, that goes on as continuously updated. So I do appreciate your comments on that. Any other director comments on item 19? We do have a recommendation uh, around item 19. It's that the Board of Education approve the superintendent monitoring report on end number three, safe, positive climate and culture. Uh, well, it said under the consent agenda, but do we have a motion regarding approval of the superintendent monitoring report on end three? Motion to approve. Motion by Williams. Second. Second by Myers. I will take the roll. Director Meek. Aye. Director Myers? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weiniger? Aye. Passed six to zero. We will now move to item number 20, adoption of the joint motion agenda. The recommendation is that the Board of Education approve the board minutes as presented. These minutes attached to this item are for the May 8th special meeting and the May 9th regular board meeting. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes as presented? Motion to approve the minutes as presented. Motion by Ray. Second. Second by Weiniger. Meek. Aye. Myers. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Ray. Aye. Williams. Aye. Weiniger. Aye. Passed six to zero. We now move into our study action items. And the next item is a resolution to name Linegar Hall. It is a 10 minute uh, discussion and the recommendation is that the Board of Education approve the resolution as presented. Um, Mr. Blair, thank you for having that up there. I'll go ahead and read this quickly. Uh, then we will have discussion by the board. The resolution of the Board of Education of Douglas County School District RE1 regarding naming of Linegar Hall, whereas David L. and Gail Linegar were foundational in creating the opportunity for the Douglas County School District RE1 to purchase property, property formerly known as the CU. U South Campus, located at 10035 South Peoria Street, Lone Tree, Colorado, which has been named the legacy campus by the district. Uh, whereas And whereas David L. and Gail Linegar generously collaborated with the Douglas County School District RE1 
to enter into a purchase and sale agreement to acquire the legacy campus from the Regents of the University of Colorado with the understanding that they would assign the purchase and sale agreement to the district, thus allowing the district to acquire the legacy campus for a purchase price significantly below the property's fair market value. And whereas the acquisition of the legacy campus in December 2021 has provided and will continue to provide much needed space for the district to expand its post-secondary readiness, programming and create new learning opportunities for thousands of current and future students and the Douglas County community. And whereas the Legacy Campus will soon house students in multiple career and technical education programs offered in partnership with Arapahoe Community College, the University of Colorado, the University of Denver, Metropolitan State University of Denver, which will provide extraordinary college credit uh, bearing and relevant learning opportunities for high school students and the Douglas County community in order to ensure participating students receive a competitive advantage and workforce readiness. And whereas the superintendent file policy FF-R provides that an area within a facility may be named for a person has made a significant educational contribution and also states, quote, individuals who have provided financial do donations for the construction of a facility or an area of a facility may be eligible for naming opportunities for an area in a facility. And whereas the actions taken by David L. and Gail Linegar are tantamount to their having made a significant financial donation as such actions enable the district to acquire the legacy campus. And whereas David L. and Gail Linegar's contribution with the district allowing for the district's purchase of the legacy campus has afforded the district the ability to significantly enhance its educational opportunities for its students and the Douglas County community. And whereas the district staff recommends that, quote, the Great Hall, unquote, area be located, uh, excuse me, area located within Legacy Campus be named Linegar Hall in honor of the significant contributions made by David L. and Gail Linegar in furtherance of the acquisition of the Legacy Campus. And whereas the Board of Education has the final decision-making authority with respect to the naming of facilities as stated in Board Policy FF, now therefore be it resolved by the Board as follows that the Great Hall in uh, an area located within the Legacy Campus be named Linegar Hall in honor of the significant contributions made by David L. and Gail Linegar, enabling the district to acquire the Legacy Campus, which will soon provide extraordinary programs and services to its students and the Douglas County community. With that, we will open it up for discussion by board members. <laughs> Director Ray. Uh, very worthy of this, uh, the Linegar family. Um, I had the pleasure actually of meeting the Linegars um, when Superintendent Wise uh, first started this conversation with them about the possibility. And, and I would be remiss if I didn't publicly acknowledge the role that Superintendent Wise also made in terms of making this happen, along with Mr. Windsor as well. Um, Superintendent Wise created an incredible rapport with the Linegars, and that's, that resulted into them becoming so excited about contributing this facility to our district, as you read, Director Peterson, at a significantly lower cost than what it was appraised for. Um, so I, I am very much in support of naming the Great Hall, the Linegar Hall. I think that's uh, a wonderful acknowledgement and well-deserved, but I also want to just acknowledge uh, Superintendent Wise. Had he not worked as diligently as he did, Legacy Campus would not have come to fruition. So, um, so unless there's other discussion, I would like to make a motion that we adopt this resolution as Director Peterson read into record, uh, officially naming the Great Hall the Linegar Hall. We have a motion by Director Ray. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Meek. And uh, before, I would like to make some quick comments before we go to a vote. Um, I'll acknowledge what Director Ray said. When uh, I was sworn in as a new director, this was a train that had uh, been fueled up and it had left the station. And I believe it was the first vote that this board took on any policy matter, which was a 7-0 vote to approve the purchase of the wildlife experience CU South. And uh, 
help it contribute to the further mission. As, as folks look at our mission and vision for the, uh, the district, we've got post-secondary tracks, so Reed College, we've got military service, and that third track is that direct entry into workforce. And what this building will do uh, for the amount of money that we spent for it is going to be, um, I, don't, I don't even know if I could quantify it, the number of students we already have enrolled for this fall when it opens, the potential of those students to come right back here into Douglas County, whether it's in robotics, whether it's in smart grid, whether it's in aviation, whether it's in the nursing or a variety of programs and the concurrent enrollment cost savings to our community members is going to be incredible. So um, I'll just hearken back to the first vote that we took as a board 7-0, but I will acknowledge that uh, the work and the groundwork to set that in motion was well laid well before I was on the board and it was excellent foresight on the part of everyone in the administration uh, to move that forward. So unless there are other comments, I will uh, take the role and echo all the comments that Director Ray made. Uh, so we have a motion by Ray, a second by Meek. I will take the role, Director Meek. Aye. Myers. Aye. Peterson, aye. Ray. Aye. Williams. Aye. Weiniger. Aye. Passed by a vote of six to zero. We are now into the item number 22, school year 2023-2024 proposed financial plan and budget. This is a presentation, 30 minutes with a 15 minute Q&A. And this is something that we will not take action on tonight, but we'll take action on uh, before the end of the school year. Okay. Um Director, Finance Director, excuse me, Budget Director Colleen Doan and I are going to present about the proposed budget. So um, I have some intro high level slides and then um, Mrs. Doan will take over from there. So uh, I'm going to need my clicker. I'm getting rusty. Okay. Um, of course, our financial well being end statement is um, the driver of our work. And just as an agenda for tonight, um, I'll be doing a quick overview and then um, Director Doan will go into the detail, uh, more of the detail of the budget. So just as an overview, um, per people revenue, will receive a similar increase in per pupil revenue. So our competitive, um, our inability to compete with other districts remains unchanged in terms of compensation. Um, we're proposing an overall expense increase of about 7%. This budget will show, I think as Director Ray pointed out um, in our preview of the budget, this budget will show us um, intentionally drawing down some fund balance. Um, part of what Ms. Stone will show you is, is a projection over the next four years and um, what we committed to at this time last year and continue to commit to is a balanced budget by the year 25-26. Um, but in the meantime, in order to do many of our retention strategies and many of the other things, if there's an intentional drawdown at fund balance, I do want to show you um, the fund balance off on the right. So I'm showing our 21-22 audited fund balance. There's three different categories. Um, the blue is restricted, um, and that's per Tabor and board policy. So Tabor sets aside, it's 3%. 3% and the board policy also sets aside 3%. Um, the assigned fund balance, so this is things like carryover or it's already spoken for um, and is being held on purpose for one thing or another. And then unassigned fund balance. So if you look at our 2122 audited, we had 68 million in um, unassigned fund balance. Um, our 22-23 estimated will be 74 million. So we're looking to return back to that approximately 68 million um, by 23-24 through an intentional drawdown. Our budgeting priorities were um, around the following things. Um, investing in our staff, so investing in our employees with the goal of making sure that we can recruit, retain, and develop and award the best employees for our students. Investing in our schools through our site-based budgeting. Um, 
and investing in our support system, which goes directly to our schools and our students. So just to highlight each of those areas, the budget that you see that you will see tonight shows compensation increases. Um, and again, licensed staff received an average of 6%, so a step plus 3.5%. Um, classified staff received 6%, other staff received 5%. Um, the benefit costs to employees remain flat, so that's being absorbed by the district. Um, the retention payment that employees will receive, uh, the $2,000 in September, that is not part of this budget. It is actually part of last year's budget, but I'm still calling it out because it's an investment in our staff. And then um, each of our employees will have an additional personal day added to their balance on July 1st. It's a total of a $25 million investment in our staff. Um, we are investing a total of $9 million um, in ongoing investment in our schools to include additional mental health support, in particular for um, our effective needs programs, an increase in education EA4 hours. So they will be going from seven hours to seven and a half hours, which is effectively a compensation increase for them as well. It's not an hourly rate increase, but um, a full-time EA was an actually a 0.88 FTE, and now a full-time EA is um, a higher FTE. Gifted and talented um, in terms of interventionists allocation, and we've increased school budgets in order to keep their purchasing power um, flat. And then finally, investing in our support systems. We're investing in special education and student services support, um, including mental health staffing and training, physical security infrastructure, as we have talked about, um, curriculum and literacy materials, so those all support our schools and our students. Post-secondary readiness and student programming, um, expanding our career and technical education programming through Legacy Campus, alternative education through Vail, those have um, ongoing operational costs. Um, and we've made other student programming investments as well. Transportation, we are absorbing um, increased fuel costs, as you can imagine, in transportation, along with a continued increase in the requirement um, to transport our special education students. One of the other increases in transportation is also around investing in career and technical education in making sure that our students have an equitable opportunity to be able to access not only our legacy campus, but other um, general education high schools so they can participate in a career and technical education program um, that works for them. I do want to highlight one other thing while we're talking about equitable access. We have, um, in the current school year, made a, um, a deal with Hop Skip Drive, which is a service that is not inexpensive, but it is a service that we use specifically to make sure that students that are at risk are able to get to school or where they need to get to, even if we um, don't have a bus route available or have a route cancellation or whatever um, that might be. We're really focused on our students that would not otherwise be able to go to school with the hop, skip, drive. That's part of transportation as well. Um, learning services. Um, we are, again, as we've talked about before, we're investing in an alternative licensure and educational pathways implementation so that we can train um, our own teachers or aspiring teachers rather, to go through our alternative education um, program for no cost to um, the employee and have them be able to get an alternative license. Um, and then other system-wide supports, um, operations and maintenance. We've had a lot of increases in our service contracts, janitorial, et cetera, utilities, district-wide software licenses, just general inflationary increases. And then finally, risks and opportunities around the budget that you are about to see. Um, the risks, of course, under current budget assumptions, we can only draw an unassigned fund balance till the beginning of 25-26. Um, it is always a risk that we are continuing to see increases in special education costs. We are responding to that and making sure that we are providing the funding and, and the support for our students with special learning needs. Um, but that is uh, a continued risk to our budget. And of course, continued cost impacts due to inflationary pressures. We also have opportunities 
Um, of course, a potential mill levy override is the biggest opportunity um, that we have to be able to pay our staff more competitively, hold on to our staff, and holding on to our staff means that we won't be paying contractors to do what we would otherwise have our staff do. So not only would we be able to pay more competitively, it would save us operational funds in the long run. Um, address small schools by creating a long-term plan for our declining feeders and mitigate fund balance depletion um, by limiting salary schedule increases to available revenue in the same year and adjusting staffing levels as needed. Our goal is a balanced budget by 2526. Um, so that's a really, really high level overview. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Ms. Doan, who will go into more of the details um, for all of you, and then together we will answer your questions. Thank you. Um, so th thank you and good evening. Um, before I jump into the details, I just want to send a huge thanks um, to everyone who helped make this um, successful budget development process. Um, it takes a huge effort of all of our schools, our department leaders, their support staffs, um, and our business services staff, I'm sure they are our small team of budget analysts to pull together um, this very, very large budget um, that we have for our organization. So to go into a little bit more detail on the revenue, we start first with the largest component, which is the School Finance Act. So we're excited that the legislative session completely wrapped up and the governor signed the budget before we're here proposing a budget to you all tonight. And so the base did increase by inflation, as Mrs. Kane uh, mentioned, um, 8%. Um, within the School Finance Act, that's SB 23287 for anyone who's interested in the actual bill. Um, the budget stabilization factor was bought down by $180 million. So in the current year, it's the $321 million cut statewide to school districts, which is about 3.7% of the budget. And it was drawn down to $141 million, um, which is a 1.5%. The most important part of this is that within the actual um, bill itself, there is language to repeal the budget stabilization factor effective July 1st, 2024. So a year from now, so that means that $141 million that is left absent any other changes would um, no longer exist and school districts would be funded according to the actual calculation of the per pupil revenue. So for us in DCSD, this resulted in an increase year over year of $954, taking our per pupil revenue up to $10,145. Do you want to present though um, the comparative PPR with our neighboring districts because while we see this increase, Every other school district sees this increase as well because it's an increase to the base. And so this represents an increase to the School Finance Act bucket for the upcoming year. Um, I do want to mention that the um, gray portion at the top, the mill levy override, those are current year overrides. Um, the information is not yet available as um, many districts have different types of mills, not just fixed dollar mills like us. Um, but you can see there that um, Douglas County School District on the far right of the graph um, is the lowest. Um, and you can see this split of the local share, property tax and specific ownership tax in blue, and the state share um, coming um, from the state um, in the green color. So as we look at the different components um, of the total program formula, I did show you this chart last month when we did a preliminary view of the proposed budget. And I just wanna highlight the one part that's changed, which is the per people revenue line. We did have a lower number because we were just working off of $150 million buy down of the budget stabilization factor. And now at that $180 million, which is set in law now, that brings us to the $10,145 per student. So the biggest number as a takeaway in terms of the operational management of the budget is that green line, which is the district share of total program. And so we will be seeing a $32.4 million increase to what the school district will retain based upon the projected enrollment for our students. 
However, there are changes to our combined general fund revenue outside of this um, total program formula. And so I wanted to highlight a few of those things. Now, if you are looking at the actual financial plan and budget, which is an additional attachment within the same agenda item, you may see that some of the categories of revenue are changing more substantially than just the 8%. And that is based upon the comp compilation, the how the revenues are calculated. So the first and primary one is property taxes. Our property taxes will be making up a greater percentage of our total program formula, um, meaning our local share um, will increase. And that is directly related to assessed valuation of our properties based upon the property value growth that's occurred in the reassessment cycle. And so you'll see a 33% year over year increase in that local share um, school Finance Act property tax, which is bringing the percent of total program up from 41% to 49%, um, meaning we are almost at a 50-50 split, local versus state share um, in the School Finance Act for DCSD. Additionally, um, still part of the School Finance Act, but separate from the total program formula, we are very excited that special education will continue to see increased funding. This brings us up to a level of funding of $6,000 per tier B student that was initially contemplated back in 2006. And so we're finally getting to a point in which we're funding what was determined to be an appropriate amount a long time ago. And so this is a $3.1 million increase um, for our special education um, funding. And then additionally, just wanted to point out that you will see within the budget, it does include the implementation of the universal preschool, so UPK. Um, it is simply a shift in funding sources. You'll see a decrease in the preschool tuition, which is other local revenue, and an increase in the intergovernmental revenue um, because it will be funded through the state. So as we um, speak to the expenses, Mrs. Kane um, spoke to our compensation increases already. And I um, do just want to highlight there that um, of the investment that we are making in our increase to our budget of 7% overall, approximately 50% of our increases are an increase in compensation to our existing current employees. So there are people that are with us um, this school year, um, putting that into their compensation in the form of salary and covering benefit premiums to absorb those costs of benefits for our employees next year. So as we look at how we spend our money in the school district, I put together this pie chart to break it out in terms of where the money is spent and not necessarily what we are buying. So um, this reflects schools and departments. And so what you can see here is in the blue um, single largest chunk of the pie chart that is school managed student programming. So out of the general fund, $412 million or 71% of the combined general fund is directly spent in schools. This means these are dollars in the SVB, both discretionary and non-discretionary. So um, all dollars that fall within the kind of the principal's management. Our next category in the orange is district managed student programming. This represents 15% of our general fund for the upcoming year. And this includes areas like student support services, which um, includes special education, learning services, post-secondary readiness, school leadership. They are all dollars that are directly benefiting students, directly going towards students. They are just not managed and held under the principal's um, budget ownership. The next category is transportation. It's um, fairly um, self-explanatory at 4%. Facility operations is at 4% as well. I do break this out from the system-wide supports because so much of this is like contract cleaning or maintenance of just maintaining um, the many buildings that we have throughout our school district. And then finally, our last category is system-wide supports. This is more than just general administration because it includes, um, like Mrs. Kane mentioned, anything related to um, our software costs or anything for the, the maintenance, excuse me, not the maintenance of the buildings, but um, managing you know, HR and business services and information technology, so not just administration. 
So as we go into schools, um, our school increases, um, as you can see here, um, we're in a split between what we consider non-discretionary or dollars that are given in the prescribed manner um, that have prescribed uses and are not eligible to carry over, and then discretionary dollars that can be spent, um, the collaboration of the school's uh, community um, for input. So approximately 42 additional staff um, will be hired um, through um, increases in our non-discretionary allocations. These are all within the student support services um, division, and so these are in areas of mental health, um, increased hours for the um, educational assistants, gifted and talented interventionists, and campus security specialists. Um, so that equates to approximately $4 million of increased staffing. And then the increase of the base per pupil um, is really to maintain that purchasing power. A uh, footnote here, what this means is if you do the math there, you can see it exceeds the nine million um, that Mrs. Kane mentioned, um, is because every year we hold our pay increases centrally. So as that becomes part of base pay and it's then pushed out into our schools, we have to increase that to our schools, but it is not actually an increase to the overall budget. And so if you were to just look at school budgets year over year, you would actually see an increase that um, is much more substantial um, and is a uh, $26 million increase year over year because a portion of it was held centrally a year ago. So as we look to our departments, the difference in this number versus um, number presented on an earlier slide is this is after the offset of dedicated revenue. So what I mean by dedicated revenue is um, things like the um, universal preschool um, state funding or any concurrent enrollment reimbursement revenue. Those directly go towards offsetting costs that are departmental costs. Um, so this is just looking at that net increase um, to the general fund. And um, very similar um, pie chart to the one earlier, which is on the whole budget. It is just taking out the school portion and then getting a little bit more granular in terms of the categories of our departments. And so those categories are um, special education, student support services, learning services, post-secondary readiness and student programming, transportation, and system-wide supports. So as we pull this all together and we look at total dollars in, total dollars out, um, we do divide it between those dollars that are one time versus ongoing. So within this, you can see that our one time resources or increases in revenue exceed our one time expenses. So that balance is 8.9 million if you take the 22.1 and subtract the 13.2. On the ongoing side, so these are recurring expenses against recurring revenue sources, you'll see that um, there is a deficit there of 11.2. So when you combine those, that means that we are using 2.3 million of fund balance in our general fund for this upcoming year, and that directly correlates to the financial schedules that you can see within your additional attachments. So this uh, is intentional, a strategic drawdown of that fund balance um, as presented on the earlier slide to bring the unassigned fund balance back down to um, a level more um, similar to the 21-22 audited actuals. So getting into the multi-year forecast, just wanna um, lay out a few assumptions first and then I'll show you the figures. So overall, um, we can assume within the forecast that current law remains, and so no changes to property tax law, no additional um, local revenue sources, um, no changes to our quantity of schools, either neighborhood or charter. On the expense side, we assume the continuation of our current compensation schedules that we use to pay our employees, and then we assume that there will be inflationary pressures within. Additionally, everything applies also to charter schools. So if charter school enrollment grows, charter school pass-through of expenditures grows as well. And again, these assumptions do not represent a recommendation by staff. They're simply for financial modeling purposes. So here are the figures. Um, so this forecast does assume modest compensation increases 
but it does not close the compensation gap with neighboring school districts. And so what we can see here, the bars represent the total revenue and expenditures. So when the blue revenue bar is lower than the orange expenditure and transfer bar, that means that we are using fund balance and we are in a deficit budget situation in those years. And so then when it flips, we are in a surplus situation when the revenue exceeds the expenditures. The gray line represents our assigned and our unassigned reserves. So the only category it excludes is the Tabor and board reserves. Because those are set as a percentage, so those will naturally grow. And so what you can see here is you can see that um, while our revenue and expenditures are growing at a, are projected to grow, excuse me, at a steady rate over the next four years through 2027, that we are uh, strategically drawing down a modest amount of the reserves in the same period of time. So we'll be drawing um, them down um, in 23-24 and 24-25 and then holding them flat and steady to have the balanced budget um, in 2025. And from a percentage standpoint, um, this year represents 13% of the budget um, and it drops down to in the far right year um, 11 percent so we're just talking about a two percent decrease in the reserves so we do have funds outside of the general fund it's important to know and so just highlights on some of them our next category of funds are called special revenue funds the first most significant change here is a change with our nutrition services funds because with the implementation of the healthy meals for all, we will no longer need to manage two separate funds and everything will be under the National School Lunch Program. So you will see that our Fund 28 in the financials is entirely blank and that is intentional as we will be um, inactivating the fund for the year. Our government designated purpose grant funds, they have had extremely high balances for the last three years because this is where all of our federal COVID assistance came through. All of the stimulus funds, ESSER, CRF, CARES, you may remember some of those acronyms. So with the expiration of those funds and the, the spend down of those funds um, this year, um, you will see this fund return to one of its pre-pandemic um, level of funding um, of the um, typical um, federal funds that we receive. And then the last two, this is purely an accounting change. Um, there's no change to programming, but we are eliminating the pupil activity fund and moving the activity that's currently existing within that fund into our athletics and activities fund, but does not impact programming as purely accounting purposes. So then the other um, funds that are seeing uh, more significant changes year over year, our capital projects fund will see a large drawdown of its fund balance um, in this next year. So it will draw down about 5 million of its unassigned fund balance. And then additionally, we anticipate that we'll have zero dollars remaining in what we call our unrestricted cash in lieu of land reserves because we are spending um, a portion of that on the legacy campus renovation for the portion that is addition to what the 2018 bond is covering. And then speaking of the 2018 bond, our bond building fund will be fully spent in this upcoming fiscal year. And so when we're here a year from now, um, assuming no changes in our revenue um, in November, there would be um, no building fund budget presented. All other funds do not have any material changes year over year, but they are available for your review within the proposed budget um, and ultimately your vote um, at a later board meeting. So while we do have more um, known items within the revenue this year than we have in some recent years. There are still unknowns within the proposed budget. So the biggest one which is unique to this year is universal preschool. Um, we still don't have all the information on the number of students who will be attending preschool um, sponsored by Douglas County School District this upcoming year. And so an upside unknown is that the universal preschool matching fills most of the DCSD spots, slots that we are able to offer with our staffing. Um, on the downside would be that we are not able to fully utilize what we have in space available. And then there are the typical upside and downside risks with enrollment. 
So when we come back to you with a revised budget in January 2024, we will know our enrollment as of that point in time and can um, discuss whether it came in um, under or over our projection. And then finally, um, the budgeted positions with the labor shortage that we've experienced for the last year or so. Um, if budgeted positions are filled, resulting in less use of contractors, that is favorable to us um, due to the cost of contractors. And on the downside, if positions are not filled at a greater extent than they were unfilled this year, there will need to be a greater budgeted use of contractors. So um, with kind of the next steps getting us through the end of the fiscal year, um, the items that are included in your additional attachments um, are the full financial schedules, all the charter school information, including their multi-year forecasts, um, the summary of all of our district-run schools. So you can see our schools, how it breaks down in terms of their staffing ratios, a summary of all of our departments. So you can see year over year increases by department, and then all of the details on the three-year forecast for the general fund. Um, we do have the legal deadline for public notice. You did approve this on consent agenda tonight, so that is taken care of. And then we will be back um, before you on June 20th um, to present the adopted budget um, for your review and um, ultimate approval. So with that, that wraps up our proposed budget. And so now we welcome any questions that you may have. Director's comments, discussion around the proposed budget. Director Weiniger. Thanks, Colleen, for your presentation. Do you mind going to slide number five? The bar graph, yeah, that one. Um, so um, if you notice in the gray bar, that's the unassigned portion, and we actually increased our unassigned, as Colleen said, and Simply put, we increased our checking account, and I really appreciate that we're trying to draw that down and actually use it toward where we really need to put it toward, which is toward our staff, and um, just make sure that we keep investing in them. And um, I know that last year we were predicting that to go down, and it went up, so I I'm, I'm just want to emphasize that um, I appreciate that we're trying to draw it down and get it to a reasonable level where we're not having too much of a balance that we could be investing in our people. So thank you. Other directors? If you don't mind going, I think it's slide 11 where we have our, oh, sorry, keep going. there we go, thank you, 12. Um, so you talked about uh, fixed mills versus other mills and we have a fixed dollar amount mill which means that is we get more people that come into the county and things, um, we have a fixed dollar amount and the mills will adjust to match that fixed dollar. Based on what you talked about this year with property tax values and things, you talked about our percentage going from roughly 41%, so the blue bar under DCSD increasing from 41% to 49%, but the overall effect of the blue plus the green does not change at all, correct? in terms of the state will pay a smaller percent as the local percent goes yes, up. Yes, that is correct. And then relative to the gray area, if there is no action by taxpayers, if there is no ballot measure on or approved or things like that, and our mills stay the same, and every other district mills stay the same, but they are not fixed dollar amounts, that they are indexed in the case of Cherry Creek, say, to the School Finance Act. What is the overall effect of the gap in funding between Douglas County and our competitors in the Denver metro area? Uh, yes, the gap would grow. Um, so if you take Boulder and Cherry Creek in particular, they put theirs as a percentage of total program. Right. And so as total program grows, 8%, they don't have to go to their voters for anything. Their MLO will grow 8% as well. And so ours is a fixed dollar um, while theirs is not. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to confirm that for the public out there. Other directors, Director Ray. Every time you give a presentation, I'm so grateful <laughs> for you and Ms. Leisner because I find myself just overwhelmed with all the ins and the outs and the ifs and the, and the ends. And so thank you to both of you for uh, dealing with a moving target of school finance. I'm, I'm forever, ever grateful. 
Um, just a couple questions I want to make sure I'm understanding correctly. Slide 10, um, with the bullet that says, uh, under these assumptions, we can only draw on an unassigned fund balance until 2526. Is the reason because if we continue to spin down fund balance, that we will compromise those um, percentages, like the Tabor percentage that we're required to hold in, in reserves? Or why is it that we can't continue to spend down fund balance after 25, 26? No, uh, the, the reason is more that um, we, we, we have to see what the fund balance assignments are as we get closer to 25, 26. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Ms. Dome. Yeah, I, I would say it, it's not so much that we can only, it's that we don't need to continue to draw. We can continue to, under the assumptions built within here, continue maintaining our compensation structure with modest increases, not closing the gap in competition with neighboring districts. Okay. And inflationary pressures to other things and have a balanced budget that we can achieve it. We would not, you know, absent changes to revenue, need to make drastic cuts. So strategically, yes. since we've spun yes. it down, we can sustain then at that point. At 25, 26, we can still sustain because of the fund balance that we decreased over the last couple of years. Yes. Um, and Director Ray, I, I think actually um, the, my words on that slide are, are um, probably what is causing confusion. Under our current budget assumptions, we will only draw down on unassigned fund balance until the beginning of 25-26, because yeah. in 25-26, we'll have a balanced budget. That, that helps, thank you. And then, and I know it wasn't a slide, but in the executive summary, of how many pages of a document do you put together? Uh, this one was only like 85. Only 85, okay. <laughs> um, there, was a, there was a page in the executive summer, uh, in the executive summer that talked about the 2018 mill levy override and how it looks, how it appears in the 23-24 proposed budget. And I just wanna make sure that, um, again, we're on the same page that when we see those uh, statements like $17 million towards addressing pay gaps, um, we've already done that. Absolutely. That $17 million just means we can maintain the work that we did back in 2018. It doesn't mean we have an additional $17 million to be used for more uh, work around pay grips. Is that correct? That is correct. It's a recurring expense when it goes to base pay. Great. And then I had one more question um, on slide, I believe it is 16. So I'm trying to understand concretely a comparison of how much of an increase we are spending or investing towards school managed student programming versus district student programming. So you, you mentioned that that makes up 71% of our budget, but what does that represent as far as what is the year over year increase to that part of the pie? So the year-over-year -year increase, um, not including just the, the shift in who holds the budget for the salaries, is $9 million. Okay. And just to add to that, um, district-managed student programming still is um, services for students that are actually in our schools. It's just a question right, of right. if the budget is managed by the principal versus the budget being managed um, by the district. So for example, um, behavioral specialists are itinerant and they go to our, they spend all of their time in our schools. They go to our schools and work with our um, school staff to provide services for actual students, but they're part of district managed student programming. So district managed student programming is programming in our schools where the staff that are performing that programming are managed um, by a, a, a district-wide budget versus being managed by individual schools because principals could never, we couldn't sort out a 0.1 behavior specialist at every school, you know, just isn't practical. Yeah. 
Well, I think what I'm trying to discern is, so we have central office budgets that increase, and I think one of your slides talked about the increase for central office budgets or central office control budgets that aren't necessarily what Superintendent Kane described are, are those personnel that are in our schools. That's different than, I guess, central office budgets that also support our schools. I think what I'm trying to, to get my he head around and, and I'm missing that report that we used to do is that, you know, that forward in terms of we looked at the department increases. And I'm hearing you say that's in this 85 page document. So I can kind yes, of figure that out. Yes, it's towards the end. Okay, so I will spend some more time looking at that. But if our schools are increasing this percentage in terms of what they can use to pay for building level uh, learning services for students, compare that to what our central office budgets are increasing. Does that make sense? I'm just trying to do a, do a apple, not apple to apple, but a side-by-side -side comparison to get an understanding of that. So um, if in looking at this graphic that you have right here, these are the um, department increases and the areas that they are going to. So for example, Director Ray, um, the, uh, Gray is for post-secondary readiness and student programming. So for example, that is the um, costs to uh, take care of our legacy campus and our Vail campus, which is building specific, but managed centrally. So those are direct student um, programming investments that just happen to be managed centrally. Whereas learning services, the orange, that, that is a central department program um, to get our, our uh, employees educator licenses so that they can teach in our schools, but that's a central program. They're not, not um, managed in, not deployed in schools while managed centrally. Um, and then of course, special education student services is a central department, but it is a central department where most of the people that are in that central department are servicing our students in schools. Um, so to, I think to really answer your question might be that light blue, which is system-wide supports. Um, so that that reflects, um, as Director Doan said, that re part, part of that reflects an increase in costs because of course the district pays for um, district-wide software licenses, again, that are used in our schools, but paid for by the district centrally. So there are a lot of increase in those kinds of costs, um, as well as our information technology support, benefit support, human resources support. So that's more of, I think, what is traditionally thought of as central office. I hope that helps. It does, thank you. Other directors, comments, questions on budget? One more. Yeah, I'll go to Director Meek and I'll come back to Director Ray. Sure, thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I may have missed it, but I'm wondering, I, I know we always ask the DAC committee, the District Advisory Accountability Committee, to help collect feedback from the school accountability committees, and then they advise on spending priorities. Can you just speak to where that is? Sure. We, um, and let um, Mr. Reynolds chime in after I um, mention a few brief comments. We did um, send them a survey with retention strategies, and at their June 15th meeting, we will be bringing back um, a reflection about how their response to that uh, survey um, is prioritized within the budget. A wonderful question. I, I almost want to say ditto, but uh, um, I can certainly add a few things to it. Um, they did respond in terms of what are some strategies for retention. We knew that that was a an issue, um, and so this year they weighed in on uh, what are the retention strategies that they'd like to see us use. Um, and there's a slide, and I can't remember which slide number it is, but it actually shows um, the, the fruits of that labor which we're gonna present to the DAC when we go back in June. Director Ray. Slide 20. So there's, we made the, I think the first, I've got all that bullet that talks about, uh, no, third bullet under revenue, I'm sorry, second bullet under revenue, says no new charters open in 23 to 24 through 26 to 27. Is, I thought Lehman was opening. Um, no, I, I kind of consider that as an expansion. I know it is another site meant no um, school, we're not a, we're not assuming that the Board of Education is going to authorize any through the CART process 
in addition to what's already been approved that's already factored into our enrollment projections. Okay. okay. So we're already taking into account what has already been approved. Yes. Making the assumption that if we don't approve, we will be at this state. Correct. Okay. And then last question on slide 23 um, about land, our land cell. Are we, I, I don't know where we are with Long Range Planning Committee, are we looking at, again, doing some disposing of excess land because it certainly has in many different occasions, whether it's stipends for staff, whether it's for this legacy campus, it certainly helped us. So I'm just curious what the status is with our land inventory. Mr. Cosgrove, wanna join? <laughs> Well, Mr. Cosgrove is coming up. I can speak to the, um, I can speak to one of our sites. So, so a piece of land we did explore, um, potentially selling only to replace it with a nicer facility is um, the land that our bridge facility in Parker is on. So we explored the possibility of selling that property in order to buy a more suitable property. Um, for our students, but based on a market evaluation, we have determined that it is more cost effective for the district to basically scrape and rebuild on that site so that we can build an appropriate facility for our bridge and ECE students um, in Parker that is not just mobiles parked on a site. Um, and Mr. Koskove can speak more to surplus land. Director, thanks for the question. Uh, it is an annual effort for the Long Range Planning Committee to continue to look at surplus school sites. And to date, the effort has been uh, for those sites that we own title to. However, the broader discussion is those that the land authorities own title to. But that's a much larger discussion. And part of that is every November 1st, the uh, staff needs to publish by state law the surplus school sites for charter schools information. But that is an ongoing task. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And, and my last question, kind of piggybacking on Director Ray's, is uh, of course we don't want to get in the business of uh, one-time sales to fund ongoing continuing costs. But it is something that, that we should look at on a case-by-case -case for one-time costs, one-time sales, if appropriate. So um, I, I assume we will continue that mantra to not make one-time sales to fund ongoing continuing costs. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other comments from directors? Okay, thank you, Ms. Stone. Thank you. And we will move in to item number 20, uh, excuse me, 23, the Alexandria School of Innovation Charter Applications. This is a 10 minute presentation, a 10 minute Q&A, and this will be limited to the Alexandria School of Innovation. Following this item, we will have a second uh, separate item on the John Dewey Institute Charter Applications. Go ahead, Mr. Mosher. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Blair, just uh, and for your use as well, as we go through, the, the opening slides are the same for both. And then when we get to this, the recommendation slides, we'll pause at um, Alexandria School of Innovation, have that discussion, and then we'll move forward with the John Dewey. But the intro of all those things are the same. So thank you for the opportunity. So with the... Um, with the charter school application process in Douglas County Schools, again, we align with the Colorado Charter School Act, which establishes that the local board of education shall receive and review applications from all charter schools on an annual basis. If we do not review the applications that are submitted, that is um, in effect that we are denying the application and then that will be appealed to the state board of education. So we are obligated to review, go through a consistent review process. We welcome high quality charter applications on an annual basis. Letters of intent are due on March 1st. We did receive those um, in alignment with our policy manual there. And then also uh, full applications submitted through our charter tool software. And that is between March 1 and March 15 of the year. We did receive those applications and you were updated accordingly um, throughout the year as we went. Charter applications in March of 20, uh, 2023, we did receive eight applications from charter schools. Again, as we've discussed, it's really two umbrellas. So Alexandria School of Innovation, 
in four areas with John Dewey Institute, which is a smaller school inserted into each of those locations. So really four locations with two schools in each. Um, these are not replications of our count, of of an existing school, so that is, uh, it was a requirement to submit a full application for each of these because these are new full applications to the district. In accordance with the Charter Schools Act, the local Board of Education shall rule by resolution on the applications within 90 days after receiving those applications. Um, and again, that is why we are here taking action on that tonight. Staff is gonna make a recommendation. Um, I'll explain the CARP process, but again, it is fully the Board of Education's decision on approval or denial. With the Charter School application process, the Charter Schools Act outlines exactly what we must include in an application. These components are all then inserted into our Charter Tool software where the applicant can upload information in, the, in those areas, responding to questions and, and probing guidance um, opportunities that we place in that tool, all in alignment with, again, our procedures manual and our board files. But those are the areas that are all put into place. Um, in, in addition, there are some appendix areas that are uploaded opportunities. Um, the hope is that applicants will answer questions in the allotted space and will upload documents all into the areas indicated in charter tools. It makes it a clean process. Um, you've been submitted all of the applications in their entirety to take a look at those as well. Charter application review team, we are, uh, I'm extremely proud of the team that we have assembled. Uh, this is a process that's been in place long before I'm in the position, but the, the amount of expertise on that slide, um, it's just overwhelming. And it gives me great pride to be able to sit in a room and hear the feedback from those leaders of those departments and uh, so many people that are at director levels and have such insight into that specificity of that area. Also, we have uh, very welcome community feedback from our DAC representatives, from our long range planning committee, from our charter parent um, who sits on and gives a perspective from that, uh, that lens as being a person who is, has a charter school student. So I feel very confident with the, the level of expertise that's here. And again, this is kind of above and beyond um, what you see in some areas around the, uh, the authorizer circle. We have, a, we have a really strong team that I'm proud of. Special uh, commitment, please, to uh, Kristen Schmidt and Choice Programming. Really just really keeps this thing running uh, for us and keeps everybody moving in the right directions. And then my assistant, uh, Julie Nab, who's not here, but uh, really, really help us get this to a place where we are. This funnel shows the process. Again, the uh, on the top, the charter application review team cart that we call it is assembled. And as we go down this list, we get down to a final recommendation that is made to cabinet. Cabinet then reviews, provides feedback, then we submit a staff recommendation. You have received those staff recommendations. Uh, they're in the board files. So we are now to the point of point five where you, the Board of Education, will approve or deny based on uh, the resolution and the alternative resolution that we've provided for you to, to review tonight. Important dates, just as a um, process, again, March 1st, so all of these things have been going since March 1. We, we have a timeline that we post, that we uh, move through the applicant interviews, the capacity interviews, we call those, on April, was on April 18th. Um, additional questions were then sent on April 20th to the applicant, they responded back on April 27th. May 3rd was the work session for staff to complete the recommendation. Public hearing one and two were conducted in alignment with the Charter Schools Act. And all DAC members were sent all applications to review on April 11th. So April 11th, everyone on the DAC was sent that communication through Mr. Reynolds. Uh, they all had about nine days to review, and then I met with DAC to hear feedback and their concerns or thoughts um, on April 20th before we went to our staff meeting. So all of that consideration was taken in, uh, into effect. So with the first uh, staff recommendation, we'll focus on Alexandria School of Innovation. The applicants that were given um, the recommendation uh, last Friday in alignment with our calendar. They were given the opportunity to withdraw an application and we would have just told you the applications have been withdrawn and we would not have moved forward. 
Um, the alternative to that is we give our recommendation, and again, it's up to you. You make the decision as a Board of Education um, how you would like to um, approve or deny based on uh, that information. So the Alexandria School of Innovation with the staff recommendation, the recommendation is to deny the applications for ASI, Alexandria School, in all four pr proposed locations. Some, some overarching um, themes that we saw here, and again, the applications had slight differences for ASI in those areas because they do have different design elements, um, uh, focus areas uh, for the students, but, for, but 99% of it was the same, okay? So um, a lot of that information carries through. Proposed budget are dependent on notices of claim that have been reported as submitted, but have not been approved. So the, uh, the funding for the school is coming from a notice of, cli of claim that has been submitted, but there's not there. DCSD long range planning, as you just heard Mr. Crosgrove allude to, November 1st is when we release surplus land lists every year. None of the land identified in the applications has been identified as surplus land and therefore it is not available to charter schools um, at this time. There were extremely low, only three letters of intent that have been submitted or collected. Those were unverified. We don't know which location or, or what level of commitment those people had given. The governance structure uh, we deemed not to be at an arm's length with, uh, this is section S of the Charter School Act requirements for if you're using a, a CMO or an EMO, the, the, um, the charter management organization that we've talked about in the past. So that charter management organization, there's no evidence of a, a board of directors or a viable charter management organization that we could determine. The financial viability is dependent on a claim made to Colorado self, uh, School District Self-Insurance Pool, SIDSIP. So again, there was a budget. The budget did balance with the assumption that there would be a large influx of money that has not been verified. So um, there was no way to verify that that money would be there. School application only included one person. Um, so there were no others represented either in person or virtually for the capacity interview or for public hearings, um, public presentations. Um, we could not determine that there was more involvement than that one person. So that is the recommendation uh, is to deny and I welcome your questions and discussion. I'll open it up to board director questions, comments, discussion. And please limit this to ASI. We'll take uh, JDI up in the next uh, next discussion. Mr. Mosher, what do we usually see for enrollment? Uh, you mentioned that there were three LOIs. What is a typical enrollment for a school that's roughly that size uh, in terms of provable letter and letters of intent? Uh, I don't know if we would have, we would want to see a substantial amount. I don't know if I can quantify with an exact number, but we would want to see evidence that community and uh, parents have have shown interest through actual letters of intent and in saying, I would love to come here. Here's my name. Here's where I currently am. I want to attend that school. We would anticipate that a large number of those would be collected. Actually, as a provision, we do require, um, if you do approve in some cases, then we require uh, a large percentage above and beyond what the actual enrollment is because we know that some of those will submit and then they fall off, right? They don't actually follow through. So it would be a large number that we would typically see um, and communicate community support, parent numbers of intent saying we want to be there. Thank you. Any other directors, comments or questions? Okay, we have a recommendation on this item uh, from staff and the recommendation is right there on the slide, uh, or let me read it from the, the agenda item, is there, that the Board of Education approve the district staff's recommended resolution denying charter applications from Alexandria School of Innovation. Do we have any motions regarding the Alexandria, Alexandria School of Innovation charter proposal or application? Director Williams. Motion to approve. We have a motion to approve which to one the, of the, sorry, the district staff's district recommended staff's resolution yeah, to the, denying to the, yes. per the recommendation. Okay, we have a motion from Director Williams. Do we have a second? Second. 
a second by Myers. Discussion regarding the resolution. And Mr. Blair, if you could please bring the resolution, the one of the two, which is the resolution denying charter applications, if you could bring that up on the screen. Thank you. Yes, it's the staff recommended. So this is the resolution we're talking about. I believe both resolutions, the, the recommendation and the alternate resolution have the same whereas statements. So if you can go down to the therefore be it resolved section. And just continue down to the next page. So my, my concern in this area, uh, as cited by Mr. Mosher, is, is first and foremost the, the fiscal viability. Uh, we're funding for four and then an additional four uh, schools relies upon a claim which has not been validated. Um, does not seem uh, like a low risk strategy to me. And then the second one, if you can go down, uh, Mr. Blair, to B, is is exactly the question I asked, which is around the de demonstrated community support. We just heard a fiscal budget presentation that assumed, uh, made some assumptions around additional charter school additions. And to add four, you know, and then four within four, without a demonstrated uh, proven community demand around, uh, first of all, can we fund these? And then second of all, uh, this, you know, Kevin Costner, Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. Uh, that's not a strategy that we should go in for in terms of risk. We need to see the demand, in my mind, as one director before we would authorize uh, building of schools. I know in the replication applications that I've been a part of and voted on previously, there was a very strong convincing demand and support for a replication in that case. I know that these would be new schools, but I think it would be very risky for um, the district as the exclusive chartering authority in this area to authorize schools for which there is no, or, or I would just say the demand is completely unknown and certainly hasn't been demonstrated in my mind. But I, I do, that's my concern is really around uh, sections A and B as cited in this, rec in this resolution. Other directors, Director Weininger. Um, yeah, I think this school sounds like a really, um, it'd be an amazing school and um, it sounds like a school I'd wanna go to. Um, however, I do agree. I think we're pulling the cart before the horse where we're relying on funding that's not there yet. Um, and we're relying on support from the community um, before this application. So, um, yep, yeah, that's my concerns with this. Other directors, comments or questions? I believe we have a a motion by Director Williams. We have a second by Director Myers around this resolution. If there's no other discussion or questions from board members, I will go ahead and call the roll regarding the motion on the floor. The motion is that the Board of Education approve the district staff's recommended resolution denying charter applications, the one we just had on the screen, from the Alexandria School of Innovation. Um, An I vote would approve the resolution denying the charters, just to be clear, because it's, it's a bit of a double negative. A no vote would mean that you do not vote in favor of the resolution denying. So I hope that's clear for all directors. With that, Director Meek? Aye. Director Myers? Aye. Director Peterson? Aye. Director Ray? Aye. Director Williams? Aye. Director Weininger? Uh, I just want to rephrase what I said earlier, just for clarity, that they're relying on support after approval was my concern, rather than getting the support before. Um, and I am an I. Thank you, Director Weininger. The resolution, or excuse me, the motion is passed by a vote of six to zero. We'll now take up item number 24, 
which is the John Dewey Institute Charter Applications. Mr. Mosher. Thank you. So all of that prefaced information uh, in alignment with the Charter Schools Act, in, our, in alignment with our policy manuals in LBD and LBD R1. Also, again, big kudos to the entire uh, team that just did a fantastic job objectively reviewing based on our rubric, based on best practice, and really dug in to an application that was exceedingly long and, and challenging at times to, to um, find information. But we did every sing, single thing we could to find the merit that was there. Um, and I did appreciate that comment. It, they did sound like, and they do sound like, great schools. These have uh, tremendous opportunity. So John Dewey Institute, again, the recommendation from staff is to deny these applications for JDI in all four proposed locations. Um, one thing I do want to make a statement of before is it was clearly stated in the capacity interview and also in the applications, John Dewey Institute cannot sustain without Alexandria School of Innovation. So with the denial of ASI, that's, this isn't a contingency, but that was stated, um, <coughs> excuse me, that that was a part of it. Same issue with the Long Range Planning Committee has not identified any of the areas proposed in the applications as surplus land. Therefore, that land is not available for charter schools. There was only two letters of intent that were again unverified for JDI. We don't know which location of the four um, or who those were from. The proposed governance structure, um, again, issues. There's no evidence of a school board or a viable charter management organization. The governing board does not have a clear line of authority over the CMO. It was proposed and talked about that the, uh, mem the members of the school board and a particular member of the school board would then transition to CEO of the charter management organization. Therefore, there, there would be no ability to have a clear line of governance there. Um, and it was seen as a conflict of interest in the proposed process. Douglas County Schools has approximately 900 students currently identified as students with autism, indicating that almost every student in Douglas County Schools with autism would need to choice into the four proposed locations in order for their, find their budget to work. So we would have to have every student make that choice with autism to move into those four proposed locations. And we did not see that as, um, as, as a high level of confidence. <coughs> Excuse me. The financial viability is dependent again on a claim made to Colorado uh, School uh, Self-Insurance Pool, SIDSIP, and the application, again, only indicated with one person. There were no others represented. We did not have a, a, a board present in the capacity interviews, even though we offered the opportunity to remote in through uh, Google Meets or, or anything like that. It was uh, really a one-person show um, in everything that we saw. So the recommendation for JDI is to also deny in all four locations. And Mr. Blair, can you bring up the um, resolution that can corresponds with the staff recommendation for this item as well? Thank you, Mr. Blair. I'll open it up to board director questions, comments, concerns regarding John Dewey Institute charter application. I'll be happy to, to go first. I, I share the same fiscal viability concerns that I did with ASI. They seem to hang on the same source of funding. Um, if you go down to item D, Mr. Blair, and I think that additional programming within the district, um, within the county for our students that have um, autism spectrum disorder is something that is sorely needed. I do not question the need here at all. But I do question the viability. It's, it's one of those double-edged swords, specifically with charters, updates in Colorado revised statutes to ensure students are not discriminated against that have ASD and other potential disabilities. Um, you're forbidden from asking at enrollment, <laughs> um, you know, do you have this disability? You know, what does your IEP look like? Are you on a 504? All those things are forbidden. So it, it becomes difficult to gauge the need. But I really appreciate the insight from the CART that it would take our entire population currently enrolled over 89 district uh, schools or district authorized charters 
to fully 100% choice into these schools to even remotely come um, close to meeting that need. And, and as a father to a, a daughter who has uh, been diagnosed with ASD, I really understand this need, but I'd like to highlight uh, under paragraph D where it says in the second sentence, JDI has not explained how it will recruit, hire, train, and retain this staff, especially given the di difficulty in hiring special education teachers in the district and in Colorado. That is something that we are facing in this district. Our turnover, our turnover in our EA4s, our turnover in our staff, our ability to attract, retain, and frankly reward those members of our staff that do this very difficult work, very demanding work, has proven to be incredibly difficult. And to open four schools, again, based on a claim that I don't see any substance financially, and then to give, frankly, this, what I believe is one director could be a false hope to those families without a plan to resource that, staff that properly, is something that I have some very con significant concerns with as one director. But I do appreciate the analysis. Uh, other directors, other questions, comments? Seeing none, I will take a motion. And again, the staff recommendation, very similar to the last one, is that the Board of Education approve the district staff's recommended resolution denying charter applications from the John Dewey Institute. Do I have a motion? Sorry, can I just make a comment first? Yeah, Director Williams, go ahead. So I, I just wanted to, to state that I kind of can't really look past the fact that there's not money to build the schools, and that is why I um, am in favor of what the district has put forth. Therefore, I am going to motion to approve the resolution denying the charter applications. We have a motion by Director Williams to approve the district staff's recommended re resolution denying charter applications from John Dewey Institute. Do we have a second? Second. Director Weiniger is a second. I will now take the roll. Director Meek? Aye. Director Myers? Aye. Director Peterson? Aye. Director Ray? Aye. Director Williams? Aye. Director Weiniger? Aye. Passed by a vote of six to zero. Thank you, Mr. Mosher, for your due diligence. Thank you to, excuse me, thank you to all the members of the CART and the staff that put so many hours into looking at and examining uh, these charter applications. With that, we will move to item number 24, and after that, we will take a short recess. Item number 24 is the 2023 MLO and bond focus group results and next steps. This will be a 30-minute presentation followed by a 10-minute Q&A. So President Peterson, as um, promised in our last meeting, um, Mr. Truex has returned to talk about the work that they've done around focus groups um, for a potential bond mill levy override, and that work has um, will result in recommendations around um, ballot language as well as messaging. In terms of um, next steps, following this discussion, staff will be um, if the board so desires, staff will be bringing a full and detailed recommendation to the Board of Education on the June 20th meeting to include um, recommended salary schedules um, and the specific item by item um, potential bond plan along with um, the potential uh, security component of the mill levy override and potential ballot language. So all of that will be brought in front of the Board of Education on June 20th. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Truax. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, Superintendent Kane. Thank you, Mr. Truax. <clears throat> President Peterson, members of council, good evening. Good to see you all. Uh, I'm going to run through this uh, rather expeditiously um, and and want to be able to get to questions. What I will say and what you'll see, um, you know, so our methodology conducted these on, on April 18th. Uh, we were at the Lone Tree in Marriott, made it easier for uh, participants to join. The only focus group facility um, in and around the metro area is a block from my office, 17th and Lincoln. That is not conducive for those that live in Douglas County to go all the way downtown uh, for meetings. So we were able to, to do this in, um, in a a hotel conference room type setting uh, managed by Evan Wilson, who you met uh, previously and, and one of my colleagues. 
Uh, we had our first group that we did uh, with parents, and our second group of those who do not have uh, students uh, attending Douglas County Schools. And did that intentionally, knowing what we saw in our initial round of research, trying to break down and how we're able to message um, and what information do residents of Douglas County need. Is everyone, is, you know, every eligible voter is able to vote on this should you decide to put it on the ballot. How do they need to receive information and what information are they looking for? And as I always say when we do focus group research, the okay, but why? And things that we can't get in a traditional uh, phone survey. Uh, composition of the groups, we had uh, 21 total participants, uh, parents and non-parents, 10 and 11, breakdown, uh, men, women, cross-section on age, uh, salaries, party affiliation, so a, a really good cross-section. Is it a 100% accurate of, all right, this is within a plus or minus of our uh, demographic within the district? No, but it gives us a really good sample uh, representation. And we're never gonna, that never happens in focus groups. Uh, so this is a really, really good sample um, as I see it. Top issues, um, it's funding. Um, 100%, there's, there's nothing that we don't already know here. And these mirror exactly and very, uh, very closely to what we saw in the actual uh, phone survey and in the additional research and analysis that has been done. Um, it's about teacher retention, it's about infrastructure, it's about safety. Um, it's about losing teachers and, and having them go to under the districts. That's, that's what we're talking about. Um, and it's not an explanation of, you know, why do we, you know, you know for every 100,000 in home values, it comes into that, math, that mathematical equation. This comes down to the personal feelings. We need to have this for our students. We need to have this for our future. We need to have this uh, for the investment. So we asked an initial, an, an initial ballot um, of, of our participants. You can see it there in the middle. It's a secret ballot. It's written down and we do the analysis on it. 10 out of 10, we've got all the parents. Outstanding. They are your target demographic from those that you serve day in and day out of those that have students in Douglas County School District. But those are the non-parents, and again, those are me. I own my home, but I don't have students, I don't have children that participate in the district. So you've got a split. Six yes, all right, or at least six out of 10. Uh, six out of 11, two no, and three unidentified. So we've got some movables there, um, and, and I would say all of those are movables. Really good, we can ask the, okay, but why do you think that? And, how are, and we'll be able to talk through this. Um, on our revised, uh, on our 5A measure, um, as it relates, the good, safety, uh, you know, $1 per 100 value, 100,000 of assessed value, re, um, retain and attract quality teachers, um, and the benefits to be more competitive with neighboring school districts. Again, everything that we've been talking about over the last several weeks since you and I have all been working together. Uh, the bad, all right, we've got a tax increase, general fund purposes, cost to homeowners. Nothing, though, that we're not able to overcome. Um, and again, nothing that we're not, we hadn't seen before. Um, on the, the revised 5B, on, on the 6.7 mills, again, safety, reducing overcrowding, and capital improvements, um, on performing critical capital improvements. The bad, uh, debt increase, annual tax increase, three new neighborhood schools, and other capital improvements. How we're able to talk through this and message it, and you're probably looking going, well, Mark, you've got capital improvements on both sides. And this is how, when we talk about it and we look at it, what does that mean and how do we, again, tie 5A and 5B together, as I've been mentioning, to be able to talk about that from an investment perspective. Some of our key subgroups, 18% support on um, non-parents. That's a number that obviously I wanna work on as we're messaging, working through this process, and as the campaign ticks up moving forward. And then those on the income level split 50-50, those at over 100,000 plus, um, and, and things we need to look at. Again, all statistical demographics that we look at as, as the research team and the campaign team. Um, overall, our positive messages um, well outweigh those of any opposition messages, and we test both of those, and you'll see those results here shortly. Uh, but again, I want to focus on these first three here on teacher pay, community investment, and teacher retention. Uh, one in three, so the 7.9 and the 7.43, directly go hand in hand on teacher pay, directly relating into teacher, uh, teacher retention. And you can see what we're looking at here with uh, being able to risk schools, not you know where our starting salaries are, things of that nature, and that we're collecting less per pupil than your neighboring districts. And I was just listening to your budget presentations, and and you're looking at that analysis um, as well. 
The, the middle one there at 7.67 with community investment. Again, you've heard me say this time and again, this is an investment in the community and how we're able to see this on the long term. Knowing uh, when I was here several weeks ago, learning I didn't know it takes three years to build a school, not only with the long term that you have with permitting and things of that nature and design, not just moving dirt and putting sticks in the air. So how you're able to look at this from that long term investment within the community and resources and assets that will be there, not just on the capital side, but also all the teachers, uh, the community leaders, and the, and the staff that will attract businesses to thrive in that community. Well, it's at 7.12. Again, this kind of becomes a secondary message, and you've heard me talking about it. If we're explaining, we're losing, and getting down into some of the nitty gritty here um, on, you know, for every, you know, an extra dollar every week per 100,000 in home value, it still resonates, and it's one that we can use but we'll use it and, and look at it when we need to. And I know Superintendent Kane and the, your communications team and I have had long conversations on this, on when to use it and how to use it. I'm not against it. We're not hiding anything uh, from the residents and the voters of Douglas County, but how we're able to do that to be able to explain and the information that they're looking for to be an informed voter. So a couple of the key, you know, I was shocked by uh, the starting teacher pay, and that was a male in the second group of someone who was um, in the, in the non-parent group. And you can see here, and I'd encourage you to read the reactions from some of the participants um, as they're very, uh, you know, they, they help give us that clear picture. Looking in the middle, teacher pay is too low even compared to other districts. Um, I just gave a 10 because it tells you exactly what Douglas County teachers are making. There is no uh, roundabout to do it. I don't think a lot of people know that. Getting out in front, and there's a, there's a, uh, a good factor and a good set of information on, on where this is. And you can see our median scores there, our mean scores, excuse me, um, 9.8 support uh, on this message uh, amongst independents, which is our largest voting demographic in the district. Community investive and collective investment. The word invest and investment has been a large topic of discussion between my staff um, and your team on how do we use it. But I, again, I stand by it. This is a long-term strategy and a long-term play on the communications. And you can see the collective investment and a thriving community there at the top from a, a female in the second female participant in the second group. Uh, look at the reactions in the middle there when you have better uh, teachers in schools, more educated people come to the community, male in group two, tangible, focuses on big picture and community, and the humanization statement and making people who are opposed uh, understand the impact. Um, and that was obviously apparent in that, in that first group there. So there's a lot from an investment that people can look at, and it's not just all right, there's dollars and cents and I put money in and, and we raise interest. This is an investment in the community and what this is gonna mean long-term, which continues to be one of our strongest messages. Our teacher retention, the comparison is great. I mean, this is where when you, this is a shock and awe factor. This is the, oh my goodness, how did we get here? And how do we, we overcome this? And this is the way and these tools and, and these bond and mill levies will give us the tools and the resources to allow us to do though. Specifics on differences um, in school districts is convincing. Um, a male in group two, that's where we need to be able to look at it. That male in group two is, are those that are, are non, uh, you know, do not have students in, in the school districts. Quality teachers are imperative for our students to get the education they deserve. Again, someone who does not have a student in the district. How we're able to utilize these messages and, and move those that we've seen in the research that are against us from the beginning, how we're able to move and go, all right, no, I should support this and here's why. Because it, you know, rising tides raids all ships in our communities. What will it cost me and the details count? More convincing with the actual dollars. Um, again, this is one where I wanna make sure we use it targeted and smart being able to explain it and how and what words we use to choose here. Even though I don't have children in the schools, more uh, education taught by qualified teachers is worth the investment. Again, someone who does not have a teacher or a student in the, in the district. Payment ratio ability is helpful. Annual figures are more relatable than weekly. So looking at it, we all can know, okay, I make X amount per year. Those are things that we can, can compute in our brains. Um, and, and relate to our own personal, you know, we know what $5, $100, $200 means to our, to our personal budgets on a month by month basis, putting it in those types of terms so that we're able to see. 
Um, the negative messages overall, uh, district has enough money, cutting the administration, um, now's not the time for new taxes, uh, make the developers pay, all, all arguments that have been made um, and that we have seen, uh, obviously they do, do not resonate as well and do not have that same uh, draw that our measures do, uh, or excuse me, our messages do, pardon me, uh, throughout. Uh, so again, hitting on, on some of these, uh, district has enough money. Again, group two participants at 8.55, um, and, and Republicans registration, neither of those uh, surprised me uh, when we were having these discussions. We need to cut, cut the administration, and again, there's always the arguments for over, you know, how we can keep overhead cuts and overhead reductions as low as possible. Um, now is not the time for new taxes. Taxpayers are already paying too much. This is where uh, what will be Proposition HH uh, that came out of the state legislature and how those discussions factor in and how we're able to move past this. This is where the investment in the community argument comes in for me. Um, and from a strategy perspective, all right, we have HH. Yes, we've all received our property tax notifications on those changes that will be made. Uh, we were looking and everyone's evaluating where HH will be um, and what will be on the ballot this fall. All right, but now's the time on what we need to do in Douglas County because of that community investment. So there's some ways to counter this type of, uh, this type of message should it be used on a no, no side of the equation. And making the developers pay, this is not a strong argument at all. Um, though there, we know there's a lot of development in Douglas County, there always has been, it's not a strong argument. So the, the, the big portion of this and what we came out of these, and it was very fascinating, you know, we don't have, those that don't have kids in schools need a reason to support. Um, and, and we know that. We have to give them that reason to support. Uh, the ask needs to be simplified. And we're working through that with our messaging, working through that with, with the legal teams on different ballot strategy, ballot title approaches as to what would actually appear on the ballot. The voters need a good reason to support the additional uh, funding. And those good reasons are the one that communicate real facts and humanize this, getting your teachers, your principals out there. And we've had great response, uh, thanks to the work of, of Superintendent Kane and your staff on, on identifying almost hundreds of principals and, and staff and, and uh, teachers that are willing to, to talk about this and share their story and things that they're looking for and why they need these resources. But it's an investment in the community about building the future and helping to increase our overall property values. And having those specific comparisons as well, um, the line graph that you have all seen where Douglas County remains flat and your competitors and your, your peer districts around the, around the metropolitan area continue to climb year over year uh, is a compelling argument. It's one from a line graph that, that we're able to utilize and understand. So the top messages as to why um, in both groups is about teacher pay. This is about teachers. This is about uh, making sure that they have, uh, they're compensated uh, fairly and, and well for their work. Um, they are our, your front line and you know, you know this much, much better than I do, but, but teacher pay being the most critical. And 5B needs to be humanized, again, from a capital perspective, how we're able to do this. So tying these together with 5A and 5B to be able to humanize this on the capital improvements and the physical infrastructure and how that physical infrastructure is going to lead to um, better support and engagement and retention of, of teachers to be able to humanize that. So I ran through that very, very quickly. Um, Happy to answer questions, uh, but again, a lot of great research and work that has been done. I will say um, our team has been working uh, diligently with, with Ms. Rader and your communication staff on getting everything buttoned up, ready to go, uh, to, to get out and message, and, and I know we're ready for the next steps uh, based on the discussions tonight, so happy to answer questions. President Peterson. Yeah, questions, uh, comments from directors? Director Williams. First, thank you so much for all the work you guys um, have done. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, what now that people actually have the tangible in hand property taxes and they didn't have that when we did the original, I'm sorry, the assessments. Um, uh, when you actually did all the surveys, how do we plan to combat the the now sentiment that that will be negative towards towards us now that people can actually see what their taxes are that's a great question we have to humanize it and this is where having and an, 
your teachers, uh, your faculty, your uh, principals, uh, those that are on the front line are going to be so critical. Uh, being able to talk about that and and having that out there. The second is talking about this, but this from an investment perspective. Um, we've gone had a lot of discussions, but seeing that um, in the high sevens out of the focus groups, we also saw it test very, very well across all demographics in uh, the phone survey research. Talking about this as an investment and, okay, how are we able to overcome this? Yes, this then is worth the overall investment and that cost. There is always an upfront cost to an investment, but being able to talk through that, this isn't just an increase X, Y, Z that you're seeing because your property taxes have gone up. This is tangible going directly to a specific cause and a specific need to fill that void. Great. One more. Sorry. Is that all right? Um, and then obviously because taxes went up, a lot of, um, of the misinformation is that the school district now gets more money because the, the property taxes have gone up. So how will we message that? to ensure that people know it doesn't really change what's coming to the district. Yeah, and that's a lot of the conversation that we've had with Superintendent Kane and explanations that she and her team will be able to do and you all as a district will be able to do to explain how that breakdown works um, and, and really what does that mean and then why that's needed. And that gets into the fourth item that we had on the bottom there that was 7.16 on being able to explain. Uh, when folks ask, and I'll, I can go back to that here real quick. When folks answer, uh, ask that question, uh, some point one two, excuse me, on what will it cost me? It's those types of, that type of information, um, and there's a direct correlation, and it's not just the dollar per week for 100,000, but it's also, all right, but it's going up, why do I need to pay more? Well, here's why, because that's not where those dollars go. It just, you know, everyone, you know, you pay your taxes and it goes into the black bucket, whether it's under the gold dome, um, in Denver at the county level, it's very difficult to draw those lines. We're working on easy ways to be able to connect the dots to draw those lines. Superintendent Kane. Yes, yeah, so in working with um, Mr. Turex and his organization, we are strategizing on sending a, um, an actual letter to our taxpayers. So um, a letter that's, that's from the school district or even specifically from the superintendent um, that explain, that really does an informational letter that says, you know, here's here's what happens with the additional property taxes that you will be paying to the district. Here's the impact on the district, and further, here's why um, staff is recommending a um, ballot measure go on. Just a real um, clear and concise explanation with graphics in the form of a letter to our taxpayers. Um, I think. One of the things that we heard in the second focus group a lot was, were things like, how would I know any of this? The school district never communicates with me. I don't get anything from the school district. I should have a postcard. I should have a, and um, so that, that has been um, part of our discussion is just getting to that reach. So that's one thing we've been strategizing over along with timing. Other directors? Director Weiniger. I really like that letter idea. Um, my question is, how were the people in these focus groups chosen again? Sorry if you mentioned that. Yeah, no, just um, our uh, more information group manages all of that. Uh, they do work and do what we call the recruit. So they will go through and make sure that they fit within the different demographics. So I don't have a group of all men or you know all over the age of 55. We have a good balance across. Um, and the specific criteria that we had for each, each of the groups being, do you have a students in the district, yes or no? So we broke them down from there, then working to get as close as we can and, and have as many as we can from the different cross sections. Always have a couple of spares just in case someone doesn't show up, things happen. So did they sign up for this or did you um, seek them out? We sought, we sought them out, yeah, there was oh, a recruit okay. for it. Oh, cool. Right. Yes, ma'am. Just as you would for a telephone survey. Uh, one of the questions I have is, uh, first of all, I think we've got the old number in there for starting pay right up there at 7.9. Mm -hmm. So uh, obviously, as we go forward in the other engagement, we have to update our numbers with of course. things, of course. But uh, 
Do, do you believe the groups understand the differences in ask from a bond being capital, infrastructure, tangible, buildings, things like that, and the programmatics? And, and the one nuance is last year on a bond, we asked for uh, compensation of benefits limited to, you know, basically educators and staff. End period, no wiggle room. The nuance this year is we're also looking at potential security, but there's a difference between security on the capital side, the bond side, uh, hardening, um, comms, alarms, systems, you know, things you can touch, and programmatic side on the MLO side where we're looking at spending additional uh monies on security personnel, whether that is uh, increased partnership with our SROs, our school resource officers from our law enforcement partners, or whether that is plussing up additional campus security specialists so we have a increased security presence of personnel mm -hmm. uh, as a deterrent and a response item as well. Do, do you think that the people can separate those issues? Because I know specifically um, the concept of, you know, does that mean you're arming the teachers? Do, what, what does that mean, sure. right? And, and are, do you believe the public or the voters going to be able to navigate specifically what we're asking, but still keeping it simple and not getting into a, a big wordy explanation of what that means? Yeah, I really, I really do. And I think as we, we look at it, keeping the, the title simple and being able to explain it, these first three items, talking about what we need to do and how we're going to go about doing it. They'll have information that's in their blue book that we will be working on. Obviously, the letter and the materials that the school district will be sending out. Um, and the school district is able to answer questions and, and explain, here's what is on the ballot. Uh, you know, can't tell you to vote one way or the other, but here is why we put this forward, what the discussions were, how we came to this, and what it is, what the resources are going to be used for. So for those voters that are looking to get to that level of granularity, absolutely. Yeah, one, one last comment is one thing I thought was done very well by the staff last year is we tried to keep it simple. I don't know if we succeeded, but we also tied our hands intentionally. Um, Sometimes it may be able, easy uh, to keep it simple, but then we get into the vagaries, you know, for goodness for teachers. Sure. Okay, what does that mean? Uh, I think we were very clear, maybe not even as clear as we could have been about saying we are limiting. We are not going to go off and say we are going to take care of our teachers and staff and then go off on some boondoggle that these monies will go specifically and only to teacher, staff, salary benefits, and now whatever that security piece looks like. But I, I think we want to, as a board, keep a very tight box around that mm -hmm. because it has to deal with trust that we're not going to do a bait and switch on you with these funds if they're approved by the taxpayer. And that's where on one in three, and, and President Peterson, you mentioned, you know, the 43, 6 to 80 being the old number. doesn't matter if it's it, whatever that number is, there is still a shock factor at that number currently. Whether it's this or whatever the current, you know, the, the updated adjusted number is, there's still a shock factor to that. Um, the second with, with teacher retention and being able to explain that going, you know, DCSD collects $2,000 less per student than other schools in other neighboring districts. I know what $2,000 means in my budget. Uh, people know that that's a number that they can relate to. Uh, we're, you know, as we're in the middle of the, the debt ceiling discussions in Washington, D.C., those numbers are so abstract uh, compared to the numbers that we deal with in this room or what you all deal with on a monthly basis and a regular basis. So having those connections then help combat and address those questions as, okay, it's going exactly to these specific areas to address those concerns that have been identified. Superintendent Kane. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, one of the interesting things to me about the second focus group, which again was the group of um, individuals that do not have kids in our schools, um, they actually responded negatively on the bond side to a specific list. In other words, these uh, schools would be built in these specific places um, and these specific things. You, what they what they said with their words as they were explaining their thinking is they were like, as soon as you started specifying the location where things are happening, I immediately said, oh, well, I don't live there, so I don't care. Um, and, and what a suggestion that came from several of the folks in that room was, you, you really need to stick to 
We need safe and adequate facilities for our teachers to be able to teach our kids safe, adequate, um, well-constructed and prevent overcrowding, kind of something like really, really generic, which was a little bit exactly the opposite of the mill levy override um, response that we saw, but I thought that was very interesting. Thank you, Superintendent Kane. Other director's comments, questions? Director Meek. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. This was actually a very big topic at our district accountability committee meeting that we just had with um, individuals very concerned around how are we going to tackle the new challenge with the assessment rates going up and also with the potential ballot initiatives that will be out there. Um, I totally agree the human stories and I think combined with the factual information is is the right way to go. Have we considered doing maybe like an online online calculator where people could actually come to the district website, see exactly what it would mean to them. It would have additional, you know, human stories on the website as well. But I also think explaining what would happen if HH passes and what would happen with various different scenarios, because I think you have to do both. You have to do the human story and what does it actually mean to me? Thank you for that suggestion. I think a calculator to calculate based on when you enter your value is a great idea. Thank you. Um, and then secondly, do you remember my question for you last time you were here to present? It's a test. I'll remind you. And it's you. past my bedtime. I'll remind you. Um, on slide number four, um, where it talks about our key challenges that we have as a district. And I had asked, um, you know, one of the areas that we as a board, I think it's very helpful to understand the largest um, top issue, which isn't really reflected as the largest here, was politics mm -hmm. in the school. So were you able to understand what that meant for folks? Because I think it would be really helpful for us as a board to understand, because it may influence our actions as well as a board. I mean, I think, not at a granular level, I guess is the best way that I can describe it. Not at a granular level uh, to be able to, to to pinpoint to a very specific action that this this was caused here versus uh, just over, overarching rhetoric that is out in the community. I guess it'd be the best way for me to describe it. Yeah, I mean that's just very disappointing to me that it really was the top issue and we don't have actionable feedback to us and you know. I think as a board, it would really help us to understand, you know, where people are in this arena. And we had a board director resign tonight during the board meeting. And so, you know, there are groups out there making comments that teachers are bringing pornographic materials into the classroom. We're violating parents' liberties and we're at war. We have feminized men and we are eliminating women and we are eliminating women so we can get to the kids. It is written in policies. I mean, those are some pretty extreme statements that have been made by a group that actually, you know, our superintendent received an award from. I mean, is that what people are referencing? Is it the lawsuits? You know, is it the rhetoric around the equity policy? I really think having accurate information from where the community is can help us be better at our, at our job up here. Okay, thank you, Director Meek. Any other comments or questions for our consultant while we have them up here? And Superintendent Kane, we were expecting, just to be clear, um, th this is a question. The recommendation will include uh, on the 20th sample uh, exact ballot language that will be proposed to the board. I know it's not the final that the board will have to ultimately 
adopt, adjust. We did a lot of wordsmithing on ballot language last year as a board, whether that was good or bad. But the proposal will come with lang proposed language for both measures on the 20th, correct? That is correct. We will make the recommendation on the 20th with all the specifics that you need. That does not mean that you um, are required to vote on it on the 20th, but you will have all the information you need and and your options would be you could vote on it or you could say to staff, can you work on these pieces of the ballot language for us to come back either at the first meeting in August or the second meeting in August at the board's discretion? Director Williams. One more question. Yes, because people didn't have the assessments, I'm not necessarily saying we should do this, but would you do you find that there might be benefit to do another poll to see what people are now saying because there is something tangible? Absolutely, um, and that's that's been a discussion that that Superintendent Kane, that uh, Ms. Reeder, myself, my team have had. Uh, one from the assessments in hand, and two from HH. Uh, both of those are very, we knew the assessments were coming. Um, when we did the poll, uh, did the general, did the public know where they were, you know, where it was going to land? No, but we knew they were coming. Um, HH was the one that we were not expecting. Uh, we knew there would be something coming out of the legislature, just didn't know what. Now having that in hand gives us something that we can, can look at. Um, but I don't think that changes, does not change the findings um, that we've seen. I don't think it would drastically change my recommendations to this board that I've given you over the last several meetings uh, moving forward on one needing to do it. This is the year to do it. Same as what you saw two weeks ago from MBEC um, and knowing that we need to focus on teachers and, and, and infrastructure and investment. Any final questions from directors? Okay, thank you, Mr. Truex. Thank and you, we sir. will uh, take a, we'll just call it a 10 minute recess and we will pick it back up at time 35 and we will go with the amended agenda. We will pick it up with item number 34, then 27 in order.
Okay, we'll come back into order. We are now uh, on item number 32, th excuse me, 34, which was moved and swapped with item number 26. So we are on proposed revisions to policy ADB, educational equity, um, and we will open it up for discussions. And thank you, Mr. Blair, for having the item up on the screen. Uh, this is an item that was brought up uh, two meetings ago. And then we had a work session uh, for ADB prior to tonight. So I will open it up to any director's comments, um, questions, discussion. Director Weiniger. I'll start it off. I um, wrote something just on my thoughts around all of it and I'll just read it to you guys. Um, so our community has been giving us feedback on this policy since its implementation in March, 2021. For me and others in this community, the educational equity policy feels unnecessary. I personally do not believe in focusing on and grouping people by their immutable characteristics. I think that leads to further focusing on things you cannot change as a person and dividing people into identity groups naturally naturally leads to division in other ways. I would rather focus on things that we share as humans and also on what makes up a person's character and their choices in life. Coming into this board director position, I wanted to repeal and replace this policy as I felt it does more harm than good and I question its original motives. However, I do hear how there are many in our community that have a strong wish for this policy because they like to see a policy that, that does more than, a, than just simply address discrimination and bullying. They want a policy that goes beyond that and addresses our school cult culture. I can get on board with focusing on bringing clarity to this policy. That's why I was willing to discuss edits and changes to this policy, and I think the revisions in place keep the good and bring clarity and certainty to the concept that we as a district do not intend to elevate certain ideals and beliefs over others. Also, I love the superintendent and her staff's regulations and implementation ideas in regards to this policy. I think they do a fantastic job bringing together what most everyone wants, which is having a safe and welcoming school environment for our kids. I know we have a school district made up of caring and approachable adults who want what's best for the kids in our district and who value each and every child that attend our schools. And I look forward to getting the revisions to this policy passed and officially moving forward with the implementation of it. Thank you, Director Weiniger. Any other director's questions, comments? Director Ray. Yeah, thank you. So I wanna take a step back a little bit and just talk about process. Because I think when we jump into content and revisions that we, we miss, probably to me what's the most critical and that is how do, we, how do we proceed in terms of reviewing, editing, and revising policy? So past practice has always been we, we begin by validating the need we look at policy, and, and that was a term we used to use in this district quite a bit, but when we review policy, there, there's really several different ways that we validate the need. It might be a statutory change, it might be a, a topic that significantly impacts the system, and it's not adequately covered in our current policies. It, it's, it's language that no longer reflects the district practices, obsolete language, or revisions um, that we make to other policies that impact other policies. And so those are, the, those are the, usually the ways that we, or the things we look at when we validate the need to change a policy. And then we go into looking at who do we consult? So when we review policy, who are the experts? Um, is it staff? Is it our CASB organization? Um, is it other school districts? Is it educational research? And then we go into looking at how um, revisions or the new policy will be presented uh, or drafted to have discussion, whether that's through a work session or whether or not um, that's the staff or the superintendent bringing those to us. When you look at this policy, I don't know that we ever validated the need. The, the need, as Director Weiniger captured, was new board directors coming in saying, I want to rescind and replace this policy. Um, then it was walked back to say, well, we just need to clean up some language to make it more acceptable. 
Then we had the resolution that had some very politically charged statements along with the directive to tell the superintendent to make changes or to bring back potential changes. Um, and then our equity advisory council floundered. They had no idea for a period of time. What did that mean for them? Superintendent gets terminated without cause. Our new superintendent then is told, you still have this charge to bring back potential changes. We spend $75,000 on surveying the public and a survey that did not come back with a compelling argument, again, that there was a validated need to change this policy. 80% um, of, the, of the survey participants, said, as a matter of fact, saw the positive implications of this policy. Superintendent announces, we see no need for change. We see a need to get it implemented. And I found it interesting uh, that Director Weininger brought up you know, the gap in time between when the policy was approved in 21 and when it was finally implemented. And I would say, yeah, that, that was the whole issue is that it took us 14 months to actually get to an implementation because of all these disruptions along the way. Um, so in spite of all that, we still have a director that says the changes are needed, calls a work session. We can collectively talk about the, the revisions. Um, and then all of a sudden that revised draft is placed out for the public to respond to before I even saw what that final draft looked like. Um, once that draft becomes a collective working document of the board, it really has to come back to us before we should even be presenting it to the public for responses. Um, again, as opposed to us having discussion about the stakeholder feedback, again, the policies changed. Um, I just saw the new policy on our packet. I had no idea that we brought back many of the things that were uh, stricken out. Um, again, one director cannot make the decision to say, well, I'm going to bring back these revisions based on my own thinking. We're a collective board of seven people. Um, again, for me, the process is what has broken down in this policy review. It's not the content. I think Director Weininger obviously said it well. We all want what's best for children. We want all children's needs to be met. But when we have a process that has flaw after flaw after flaw and violation of how decision-making processes should be accomplished, we end up with a product that is being changed without validating the need and as you know, before we actually talked to the experts, <laughs> it was being recommended to change without even our expert input. And so for me, what's problematic of this is the process. It's the revisions, some are great, some I'll support, but we haven't gone through the proper process to get to this point. Um, so that's what is keeping me up at night right now, is that we're basically rewarding this precedent that says that a process can violate all the norms of good quality decision making, but by God, we're going to go ahead and push this through. Um, so that's where I'm at initially. And, and that's why I would like to make a motion that due to the significant flaws in this policy review process, that the consideration of ADB policy revisions be postponed until after the superintendent has had a full year to implement ADBR and has provided a monitoring report for the current policy ADB. That's my motion. 
We have a motion by Director Ray to uh, consider, or I guess to postpone, uh, consideration of changes to ADB until ADBR has been implemented for a full year, if I stated that correctly. More or less, yes. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second for Meek. We will take up discussion of that motion and then return to the agenda item. Any discussion on the motion on the floor? Director Williams. I, I feel like I have expressed my concern about not making changes to the policy because I feel like this is such a charged topic within our community that I, I don't want to leave it up to any superintendent to be able to come in and change the our policy without making um, making it public. So I feel like by making changes of the of the parent policy ADB, we are making a statement as a board to say here are the guardrails in which we want you to live. That way, if it wants to be if if another board wants to come in, that they too would have to do it publicly and not behind the scenes. Okay, that's a question. Uh, Go ahead. Director Ray. Just a question, Director Williams. What is your data for drawing the conclusion that this is politically charged? What's your data? I just said that this was a charged topic. If I said politically, I, it's, it's a very or charged even, topic. Sure, and I'll rephrase it. What is, what is your data to say this is charged? Because when I look at the Hanover research and I see 80% of our participants say that, no, we see positive implications of this policy. Are you basing that on the 20%? Are you basing that on public comment? Are you basing that on parents you network with? Help me understand. Sure. Yeah, I, I feel like the 80% simply is um, a number that shows that people find that there is use and a need for an equity policy. That doesn't necessarily mean that I believe that they all believe that it should be the equity policy as it was written. It was that they find a need for it for an equity policy. I also think that the survey showed very clearly that the policy was unclear and that we had work to do within that. And so that is why um, I can't go with your suggested one year wait. Yeah, if, if I may comment, we would have to at least make a revision to ADB to delegate an ADBR to the superintendent, I believe, to put, have the superintendent put an ADBR in place to have it in place for a year. Because um, right now we don't have an ADBR. So, go ahead, Director. No, I, I, I disagree. Um, superintendent can develop regulatory policies whenever she desires. That doesn't require the board to give her authority. We've already delegated her the responsibilities of the operation. We do not, I mean, she, she can develop a BBR or a CDR, and she does not need to get our approval to, or our authorization to delegate that. So I, I would adamantly disagree, um, Director Peterson, that, and that's, and that's part of this process. I mean, even to hear Director Williams say, you know, um, I think it's clear that the policy, or people were saying the policy is unclear. Where's your data? I don't, I, I hear, I believe, I believe, I believe, but I don't see quantitative data um, being expressed. And that's to me, again, a big flaw of this process is we do a lot of this discussion on based what we think, what we believe, what we feel. Show me the data, show me the numbers. Hanover did actually put that as one of their data points was that it needed clarity of the 20% that responded? No, overall there was four different things and one of them was the need for the equity policy. The second item was that it needed clarity. Yeah, yeah and if I can respond to the data, again, relying on the Hanover survey, um, one of the questions asked, and, and I could pull it up, was uh, what are the outcomes that we expect to see? And again, off the top of my head, they were around academic growth, achievement, critical thinking. Again, it was linked to the equity policy. What do you expect this equity policy or an equity policy to achieve? And uh, these things are absent in the current version of ADB. So uh, again, when I looked at that, when you look at the things that I drew in and, and they were my, my comments and my insertions, 
that I put into this was explicitly taking those items from the survey, the data that we received and mapping them into saying, what is this supposed to achieve? Academic growth and achievement, uh, student critical thinking and problem solving, uh, mental wellness. Now, the Colorado Essential Skills, frankly, that was borrowed from the superintendents because there was good comments around that. Uh, inserting it, and I, th I think it was something that uh, Director Williams uh, inserted during the working meeting. Um, but that was my attempt to take items, data, as you say, Director Ray, that we received in our survey and in our feedback and from the focus groups and attempt to not so much, um, and, and I think you'll see, not much has actually been removed from the original policy, but it was add to it for to remove that ang ambiguity as cited in the focus group, to remove um, or to address that request for clarification that was cited in the so circus, excuse me, the focus groups, but the specific data that people ranked wanted, that they wanted to see was in fact incorporated in here because those metrics were absent. And last comment, and I'll open it up to other directors on this subject, is we talk monitoring reports. And one of the things that I, I believe Director Meek said, and if I miss a tribute, please let me know. Early on when we were doing one of the first monitoring reports, uh, it was talk about, well, well, how are we measuring equity? How are we measuring um, this thing, this, this concept? Uh, ep equity can be somewhat abstract, but by explicitly linking it to our mission and vision around access, around resourcing, and around outcomes, we've given our way, or at least a proposed way if this board agrees, to actually put some good, solid, smart, specific, measurable, attainable, relative, time-bound, smart KPIs into our monitoring reports in the future so we can measure where we are in equity. Are we holding, are we receding? And um, I'll, I'll just leave it at that and I'll address other comments as they come up. Uh, other director comments, and, and I'd like to keep it around, we do have a motion on the table um, for consideration that ADB be postponed for a year of ADBR. So if we can address and talk around that before we have other motions. Director Meek. Sure, thank you. Um, I mean, I do think the process was rushed and, it, and inadequate. And we did receive formal feedback from not only our district accountability committee, but from school accountability committees and you know, basically here's the language that was used. Although coming to a committee consensus on suggested changes was not something we had ample space for, given the time constraints on these changes, we were able to identify our most urgent feedback we felt compelled to share. The theme that continued to surface through our discussion was process. The process by which the proposed revisions have ended up on the dais is of great concern. Not only the speed of which this was done, but the lack of stakeholder feedback from the community as well. There were nine policies with revisions proposed. Some of those policies had drastic changes with portions removed and others with material added. There has not been a chance for board committees to add input and being so close to the end of the year, most SACs do not have a meeting on the books. The lack of feedback created in such a rush process gives us pause in support of any changes. We would like to respectfully ask that the process slow down to allow the community to evaluate the changes and their impact and get constructive feedback on how these policies can best represent our district and our students. And I think those comments are reflective of what we heard at the District Accountability Committee, the members who, you know, dedicate their time and energy to helping to serve the board. And I just want us to take a moment to consider how our board and superintendent committees and others um, are feeling when, when they make these requests. And so a former superintendent in Douglas County named Rick O'Connell, I don't know if any of you, I know David will probably know the name, um, he had a saying of go slow to go fast. And those were really wise words, especially in education. And I would say, especially given all the questions and misinformation on this policy. So I honestly believe there is a path forward for us where we can move the community along in understanding. Um, I agree 
with Director Williams, this is a charged issue. I don't think passing this policy tonight will change that. <laughs> it will continue to be a charged issue. There's a lot of confusion around the policy as well. Um, passing the policy changes now will not solve that issue, um, but taking our time to answer each and every question would do much more to advancing our community and bringing our community together if we actually just put out answers to the questions that were submitted. So I ask you to think back to when Legacy Campus, the prior board voted to approve that, and then we had the new board members join, and we took additional time to solicit feedback from the community and the staff spent a ton of time creating answers for every single question that came in. And taking that time allowed all of us to help answer questions that the community had. So I, I do think the path forward is simply to help be transparent, to help provide answers to every question that's that's come in and not to rush something that is so critical to our success as an organization. So educational equity is about, you know, opportunities for students. It has nothing to do with engineering outcomes. It has nothing to do with ensuring equal outcomes. This is misinformation. Taking time to actually understand what it means will really help everyone come together and understand what we're doing. Pushing something through, pushing a vote, isn't going to solve anything. It's not. We're gonna to continue to have the charged, um, continue to have just false information out there. I would love to have open and honest conversations with all of you around what language in the original policy was lifting up some students and pushing down others. I read that policy, I don't see that in the original policy. So I'd love to know what changes have been made to solve that because it would help me understand because I don't see that in the policy. I, I don't see that we're trying to help some kids over other kids. I don't see that at all. The policy talks about each and every student. It's about ensuring everyone has the resources and we care deeply about each and every student. So I would like to take the time to understand where some of this is coming from and and changing the policy in a way that we really reflect that we really are about helping each and every kid. Every educator, they're in schools because they care about each and every kid. They want to help each and every kid. And so I just think as a community, if we truly care about not looking political, if we truly care about bringing our community together, we would give the same due diligence to answering the questions that have come in on this policy as we did with opening the Legacy Campus. Thank you, Director Meek. And in the spirit of positive intent, I don't see anything here in this current proposed revision which says that we don't care about each and every student. In fact, you'll see again that most of the original intent, because I did assume positive intent on the uh, part of the prior board, on the part of the experts. I do believe when you look at individual concepts here, whether it's inclusion, anybody wanna raise their hand for being against inclusion? Anybody against belonging? Anybody against equal access to our programmatics? I don't think you're gonna find a single board member, staff member, audience member that's against those broad concepts that I believe, again, it's, it's a belief, but as one director I believe was the intent of this original policy. That's why it is additive in the proposed is additive in the nature to address the clarifications, to address the vagaries, and, and frankly, in speaking only as one director, uh, to address potential misimplementation. DEI policies, while they may be well-intended, in my opinion, 
sometimes can get incredibly misimplemented. If you look at the effect of some of these policies across industry, whether we talk about national brands and shareholder values, whether we talk about the banking industry and what has been done, quote, in the name of equity, um, with subprime mortgage uh, loans, with the current proposal to increase rates on those who have been responsible and decrease the rates on those who have lower credit scores, again, in the name of equity. When we look at my former profession, we look at the United States military and what has been done to retention, recruiting, and warfighting readiness under the name of equity, a service, an ethos that was built on service before self and has inverted that, um, there is a potential for misimplementation in the name. And if we just look in educational circles, we have seen nationwide, not here in Douglas County, you know, I think we've got it pretty right in Douglas County, but we want to codify what right means for Douglas County. But elsewhere in the nation, we've seen canceling of grades. We just had our SAG tell us, you know, they don't want canceling of grades. They want more discrimination with honors courses and AP courses. We don't want to see equal outcomes, but yet we've had misapplication of some of these concepts. So again, assuming positive intent, if we can provide some clarity in what do we mean by access? What do we mean by resourcing? What are the specific outcomes that we can measure and put into monitoring reports and others that we in Douglas County believe these concepts are? That's all I was attempting to do because we frankly have seen um, some things go wrong. And, and we don't want to get it wrong in Douglas County. Um, I will address quickly to uh, Director Ray's allusion that some things went back in. Um, I'll give you the source of where some things went back in. One was with legal review. Got some excellent review by our legal team that expressed some concerns. So some things were put back in. And one of the most compelling pieces of information and perspective that I used to frankly re-add something in actually came uh, through Director Rummel, who reminded us that culturally relevant is so important to so many students in our district. We just had a wonderful celebration at the Legacy Campus of, I forget how many families, I think it was 700 people roughly, um, out there celebrating not just language diversity, but cultural diversity. And, and what I saw, I what didn't make this one, but I made the last one, um, people that were just really excited to be members of the Douglas uh, County School District community, regardless of their origins. And that was what united our folks. And we need to provide those protections as well. And, and frankly, when there was a recommendation to say this could be misinterpreted, you know, I thought that it needed to be put back in, and I do appreciate that perspective of uh, trying to honor the positive intent. Um, any other director comments? Again, we do have a motion on the table. I would, I would just, I would director just um, reflect, Director Peterson, on the number of times you used I. Yeah. I decided to put this in. I decided this was valid enough to add, I decided, I decided. And that's the issue with this process. You are one member. You are no more powerful in your authority to make decisions than, all, than the six of us or the five of us now. And so I, I think that's where the process is breaking down. Had you come back to this meeting for a first reading and said, here's some input I received from Dr. Rummel. Here's some information I received from being vetted by um, Ms. Uh, Council Clemish. And then we would have jointly together agreed to add those things back in. I wouldn't have issue with that. But you are one director. You're not the sole decision maker. And I think that's where this process has broken down time and time again, is that you've not been inclusive of the collective board. And, and I'll take that criticism. When I'm saying I, I'm owning things that I did. So it's very clear. I'm not trying to push that on the other side of the board. Um, but I'll, I'll take that criticism, Director Ray. But I am trying to own my position on what was done and just explain why it was done. Any other director comments on the motion? Director Meek, uh, yeah, and, and then Director Myers. Related to what Director A was just speaking to. So, I mean, I actually filed a formal complaint 
around how this policy process was working originally. And Vice President Williams, you know, ad met and addressed it. But I felt like you were proceeding to make changes to the policy um, without having board direction. And I think Director A is kind of explaining how it's continuing. You as the board president do not have the authority to unilaterally just make proposed changes and put it on an agenda. None of us can do that. that you're exceeding your power and abusing your power as board president to do that. It is up to the entire board to decide on policy revisions and changes. And I think, you know, our policies go all, oh, it expands on the board will cultivate a sense of group responsibility. It talks about the board will enforce upon itself whatever discipline is needed to govern with excellence. Discipline will apply to matters, you know, blah, 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 including policy making principles. I mean, we are meant to be a board that works together and we do our work in public. And it slows things down. I get it. It's harder. It's harder and it takes longer. But I think that's probably intended because these policies are what we're telling our, our staff and our employees and our community and our parents. It's meant to take time. It's meant to go slow. It's not meant for one board member to unilaterally make decisions and put it on board agendas for votes. Which is exactly why we had a initial first reading. We had an entire working session on this, and which is why we are taking this up as a board. Hopefully it would have been of seven, but we're taking it up as a board of six tonight. And these are simply proposals. And if you would like to see amendments to the language, if you would like to see additions or changes, that is exactly what this process is now. I'll go to Director Myers first, uh, and then back to Director Williams. Validation for the changes in the ADB policy came when there was an outcry from the community. This community as a whole was not represented in its entirety. Many felt left out of the process, the previous earlier process of this. Many were unaware that this was happening. So I, we would be doing a disservice to our community tonight if we pushed this out again. Because we've been told time and time again in some meetings with a, a member of CASB, we need to move on. And we can get through this tonight. And I, I mean, I believe you heard tonight from the community, from several people, they completely wanted it gone. I'm willing to work and change some wording to make it comfortable. And we also heard from even emails and other feedback that we had that they're feeling better about the terminology change. So why can't we say when we're going to work together, we're going to work together instead of stalling, stopping, stalling, stopping? And then when we decide to move forward and do something, all of a sudden we're going too fast. So let's, let's just vote on Director Ray's and then I'll have an amendment I'll put forward. I'll go to Director Williams next. Any other comments or discussion on the motion on the table, which again is to consider uh, postponement of ADB until one year after implementation of ADB-R? If there is no other discussion, uh, the motion was to basically uh, delay uh, changes to ADB until ADBRs in effect for one year. I will call the roll, Director Meek. So <clears throat> I'll vote in support of that. I just want to say again, there are repercussions for pushing through this policy <clears throat> without involving board and superintendent committees who've specifically asked to be included and not fulfilling 
addressing all of the questions that have come in and allowing people to continue to have misinformation on what this policy is about. Um, the process has been rushed and inadequate. And finally, um, well, I'll just leave it at that. I support this motion. Uh, Meek is I. Myers. No. Peterson, no. Ray. I want to clarify that my motion is not just to delay. It was to postpone, but it was also due to significant flaws in the process. And I just want to be clear that we're setting a precedent that this is an appropriate way to review our policies and to make decisions for revisions. We're setting a precedent. And so it's haphazard at best. It violates a lot of quality decision-making processes, and it violates our own governance style, our own governance requirements. So of course my vote is a yes that we delay this due to the flawed process. And I, as stated, Director Williams? No. Director Weiniger? No. Motion is defeated four to two. We now still have the primary uh, item here. Uh, I will say, Director Ray, uh, I do believe that you brought an item on a two-thirds vote for policy for a first reading, and you motioned to vote on acceptance and authored all those changes yourself. So I believe that precedent was already set, and it was basically how this board's been operating. And we gave even further multiple readings plus a work session before anything was motioned actually prior to a vote. So I would just like to point out that precedent. So thank you. And I will just respond by saying that that was also board operational policies. It wasn't a policy that impacts how the system teaches our children. And that's the difference. We are the experts of our operational policies, and we should be able to bring those and stand on that expertise. This policy, I, I don't believe you are an expert in DEI. I believe we have a director who is an expert. I believe we have many leaders who are, ex and they were not consulted. That was my issue, and that's why I feel like this is different. Okay, thank you, Director Ray. Uh, question, comments, motions around the original uh, agenda item, proposed revisions to policy ADB. I do have. <laughs> Director Ray. So, so I do want to um, also respond, Dr. Peterson. You, you made a statement that you felt like that the intention of the original policy was this and, and went further to explain what you thought the intent. If I may, let me take an opportunity to share with you what the intent was. Um, I'm going to read to you an excerpt that was sent to every household in our district that is still lives on our website today. And here's the excerpt I would read to you. We share the anger, frustration, and sadness about the ongoing racial injustices happening in our great country. For the sake of each and every one of our students, the oppression of people of color simply must stop. Each and every member of our society deserves to live free from racial profiling, fear, and injustice. Our young people are looking to us for leadership and answers during these traumatic times that will leave a social and emotional impact on every aspect of, the child, of their childhood and healthy development. It is for this reason we send this message of unity, commitment, and reassurance that our actions will go beyond words and well-intended plans. The prevalence of instruction that promotes equity, social justice, and inclusionary practices will become a significant focus. Our schools and classrooms must be places where our students experience acceptance and a sense of belonging regardless of race, color, national origin, ancestry, creed, religion, sex, sex or sexual orientation, gender expression, identity, or disability. We all must work together to support our students regardless of their current journey during this moment in history. That was written on June 3rd, 2020. 
Um, and you can still search our website using the, key, the keywords condemning racism. We then approved the educational equity policy a few months later, March of 2021. I read that to you for a couple of reasons. One, because I co-wrote that statement with then uh, Superintendent Tucker at a horrific time in our history when the head of racial injustice was, was just bared its ugly head like, like no other. That was the catalyst that said we have to do something. And although our wonderful staff had been working for years on looking at our system around equity and, and how do we make sure that all students are valued and feel like they belong, this was the catalyst that really provoked us to say we have to do something. So, and, and I would also tell you that was a letter that Director Meek and Director Hansen also signed off on as well when we sent that out to our community. Um, I share that with you because I think it's important to understand. It wasn't generated because of a political agenda or it wasn't generated because we just happened to feel like equity was something that we wanted to put out there. It was, it was grounded in a deep need in our system to take action against racism. And how unfortunate that we are still far, far away from the desired state of where we will be. So, so I, I want that to be understood um, because I think there's a lot of um, interpretations out there about that. I would much prefer this conversation to be about how are we teaching our children to be inclusive, to feel like they all belong. Um, and I will pause for a moment, but I wanna share with you all the Colorado academic standards that talk about diversity, inclusion, racism, um, to really point out that it's just not us trying to impose an agenda this is what we should be teaching our children. And I'd much rather have a conversation about that than splitting hairs over why this word makes more sense or this provides more clarity to you, but it sure doesn't make more clarity for me. Um, but I also wanted just to start off with the reason this policy was put in place that the board found the reason was because of that. I do appreciate the uh, the reference and it being on there. I would uh, actually think I agree with you, up to you to decide, uh, that the absence of negatives is no longer good enough. Whether you're talking in industrial industries about the absence of, of injuries, that doesn't mean you have the positive capacity to pursue your mission. When we talk about the absence of hate, the absence of, of racism, the absence of all these negatives of bullying in our district, that shouldn't be the standard. Hey, we're Douglas County, we're not racist, we're not bullies, we don't hate. Douglas County should be known for its positive capacity, for its acceptance, for its inclusion, for its belonging, for its access to programs, for its outcomes for our students, whether that's graduation rate, critical thinking, academic growth, achievement, you can go down the line. We have to stop measuring ourselves by the absence of negatives, and we need to set that higher aspirational standard. In my mind, is one director to pursue those things that we want to have. Some of these are very hard. You cannot mandate through policy, professional development, uh, belonging uh, in terms of making each student accept every other student unconditionally. But we can start to move in that direction and we can, and one of the things back to why, why now, why go, go so fast? Um, because I think we need to be decisive as a board to allow the superintendent and her staff to get an ADBR in place, to have some clarity around ADB, and to frankly do some professional development this summer around the ex expectations 
for these positive capacities that we want Douglas County to be. Because we can make all, and I said at the previous meeting, we make all the policy we want. But if it's not being implemented in the classroom, if our staff, our teachers, our counselors, our mental health professionals, uh, educators, everyone is not empowered, and frankly, we need the help of our students, I think most of all, it's not all on staff. It's on students to own their behavior. And it, we need the collaboration of our parents as well. That's why it has that little allusion to the equity triangle in here. This is not, I'm pro-parent, I'm anti-teacher. I'm pro-teacher, I'm anti-parent. This is the partnership between our educators in the system and the parents for support of the student to have those positive outcomes. So I think that's one area that we actually agree on. Um, negatives, of course not. Um, but we can do better than just not having racism, bullying, intolerance, hatred, all those things that of course no one in this district wants. So um, Director Meek. So, President Peterson, the superintendent already has the regulation written. It's ready to go. What we're doing is delaying it if it has to be revised further based on changing the policy language tonight. So, so honestly, it's, it's done. And it will move faster by actually moving forward with what is ready to go. You mentioned the measurements on belonging, and there are tools to measure a sense of belonging and all of those other areas. It's not meant to, to be focused on the negative, but it's critically important that we don't act like, and we don't put out there toxic positivity where everything is good. Everything is great. I mean, while promoting positivity and optimism, it can be beneficial. Toxic positivity takes it to an extreme by dismissing or trivializing negative emotions. It can create a culture or environment where individuals feel pressured to hide their true feelings, put on a facade of happiness, even when they're going through difficult times or facing valid cha challenges. We need to make sure we're doing everything possible to serve and help our students and our staff. And so there are measurements out there. It's not our job to even try to put measurements in a policy. That's the superintendent's job and the regulations are well underway and ready to go. Director Williams. So just to, um, respond to something that Director Meek just said. I don't actually personally believe that there would be any changes to ADBR by any of the, the new um, potential revisions. But I just wanted to go back and kind of hit some of the things that have been said tonight about validating the need. Um, I, th I think that there was a, a very good validation of the need to, to change the policy. Um, one, by the outcry from, from the public, they were very clearly upset. Um, and that was a, a good portion of the community. Um, and then when we actually did the, the survey with Hanover, again, it did say that there needed to be some clarity. While 80% said that they wanted the policy, um, there was still a, a big percentage that said that they felt there needed to be some clarity around some of it. And I, 100% respect all of the work that went into making this policy. But I think it is the job of the board to make sure that we are setting a very clear intent. And so while I appreciate you saying that the intent of the policy was not to lower standards, and I believe that, it still was, call it misinformation, disinformation, or whatever, it's what the public felt was in there, or at least a portion of the public. So why not add that in? How does that hurt this policy by putting it in there? Um, so I believe this is what you call collaboration. You take, you take a policy in which was written, you say, okay, let's hear feedback. Let's change some, change some words. Let's put some things in. Let's make things more clear. That, that's what you call collaboration. Just saying we should just leave it the way it was is saying that you, you don't, you're not respecting what everybody wants and what all people are feeling. And I respect that we're never gonna be able to please everyone. That's, that's not, a, not a thing. But we can say, all right, 
I hear what what you want and I hear what you want and let's try to let's try to come up with a with a happy medium and I feel like we or I, I I feel like that we heard tonight that there are a lot of people that want it to stay the same and we also hear that there are people who want us to completely throw it away and then there are people that are happy with the revisions and I just think that this is where you say, okay, how, how do we do the best by bringing all people's opinions into this? So that is why I actually, can I, I would like to motion to go ahead and accept the changes. Second. We have a, we have a motion by Director, excuse me, Williams to, when you say accept the changes, do you mean to um, Accept changes to ADB as submitted in the attachment. Yes. Okay. And a second by Director Myers. Discussion on the motion. Can Director we, Ray. Can we talk about the revisions? Yeah, certainly. <laughs> all right. Um, first of all, I want to just um, say I am really glad that unbiased, culturally relevant responsive have been added back in. That was the heartbeat of this policy. And so I, I was greatly relieved. I have no idea what empowered learning environment means. And so, you know, when you talk about adding clarity, I, I don't know what that means. And I've been an educator for a hundred years and I, I don't know what an empowered learning environment references. So I'll just, I'll, I'll start there. Um, I also want just, I have some thoughts about some parallel language that's not making sense to me. Um, for instance, we talk about the purpose of the educational equity policy is to, and then we list all those things, and then we talk about these outcomes um, after we listed all the things for the purpose. So I'm not sure if, are we talking, are those, are the, is the purpose and the outcome synonymous, or do we need to, say that the purpose of this policy is to achieve these outcomes and then the statements below that are, are the outcomes. Um, do you wanna just take these yeah, up one at a time? That? Just, yeah. yeah, let's yeah. Be, before we get a laundry list. Um, uh, I, I agree, again, for the reason I stated earlier about uh, specifically the term culturally relevant in there, I, I think it was uh, a value add. Um, empowered, uh, in my mind, specifically uh, flows to number three. If you can scroll down, Mr. Blair, to get number three on there, where we're talking about uh, empowering educators and staff to create a learning environment, yada, 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 uh, and number three. So that's, that's the reference to the empowered learning environment, which means uh, that we trust our staff, that we acknowledge that they are the experts uh, on education and they are frankly the experts on achieving those things, growth, achievement, um, the, Col the uh, Colorado Essential Skills, mental health, uh, and developing that critical thinking or students. So uh, the word empower is in there explicitly to say, um, we know who is doing this and it is our staff. Um, I think that was, Answering. Oh, and then the second one uh, comment you made is pursuit of these outcomes. Uh, yes, I did believe that that would be a reference to items numbered one, two, and three above. So again, I would just suggest then that the purpose of educational policy is to achieve these outcomes. To achieve to achieve the following outcomes. To choose the following okay. outcomes. And I also. And thank you for the explanation of, of where the word empowered. I don't see it up there. I don't see it being, um, it doesn't make sense to put that with unbiased, culturally relevant and responsive. And you've already said it in number three, as you stated, that we empower the educators to create a learning environment to do this. So yeah. it, it, yeah, I'm, I'm it not just, hung up on that. If you'd like to it, just strike that, unless yeah. other directors have feelings. One I just way think it dilutes against. the whole notion of unbiased, culturally relevant and responsive to add another kind of term that to me, well, anyway, I've said my, I, if, if we could get rid of that, I would be. I would be good. I, as one director, have no problem unless other directors. So just to be specific, end of the first paragraph, um, 
unbiased, culturally relevant, responsive, and sustaining learning environments basically retain the original. Thank you. Adding to the sentence below that, the purpose of this educational equity policy is to achieve the following outcomes, colon. Uh, is, is, and I'm just gonna number these so I can come back and refer to them. Um, the next uh, revision, if I may. Unless other directors. So the next, have, uh, uh, so just the, one second. Sorry. Unless other directors have comments on. Okay, go We're, ahead, Director. Ray. Under number three, um, we have the term bolster student mental wellness by increasing self regulating behaviors, help seeking resiliency, healthy coping skills, and sense of belonging. We're drawing some assumptions that if those things happen, that a student's mental wellness will increase. And I will tell you, I've been uh, having counseled a lot of children. That's not true. You, you can, you can, uh, you, it, it, unfortunately, it's the child that sometimes has the resiliency from the appearance that needs a lot of mental health support. Um, so I, I would just advocate that that with bolstering student mental, um, wellness, it might do us well just to say in order to and get rid of all the bolster student mental wellness by and just start out with the term increasing because I do think that's an appropriate. Yeah. That, the, um, the intent was to say increase, not yeah. that we could perfectly. So if you are fine with the word increase, or yes, okay, and get, and, and really strike that bolster student yeah. mental wellness because I think that's so increase. Not uh, incre just I'm trying to make sure I have your yes. suggestion. Increase student mental wellness um, by increasing. Is, is that the change? I, uh, I think I'm misunderstanding. Um, but you just want increased self-regulating behaviors, help seeking. Okay, I understood. And, and by the way, that was taken from our Sources of Strength program, which is where this exact language comes from. Understand. You're wondering yeah. what's the source. So I have increased under the third bullet under number three, increase self-regulating behaviors, help seeking, et cetera. Okay. Next revision. Uh, uh, be, before we do, just any director's comments on that recommended change? Okay, go ahead, Director Ray. Uh, paragraph that begins with Board of Education. Uh, the Board of Education believe educational equity is achieved. Um, sorry, let me get there myself. Um, uh, Mr. Blair, if you could go down. Uh, we are on the second page. If you, uh, I'm sorry, there you go. Thank you, right there. Board of Education Equity is achieved along with other initiatives through the promotion of collaboration among students, supporter educators, staffs, and engaged parents and guardians. Again, I, I think when we try to qualify uh, what kind of students, what kind of educators, what kind of parents, um, to me that's, we're, we're basing that on false assumptions. Um, we should be able to achieve educational equity even if we don't have engaged parents. Right. Yeah, and and the there was a word that was actually removed uh, based on your recommendation yeah. in the working meeting. But I am happy to just say among students, adjectives. educators, and staff, and parents, guardians, because uh, you. your point is taken that we, you can't force, you can't qualify uh, that membership. Any other director comments? And then the next section I think is is probably most problematic. And that was after I've had discussion with the experts, um, is the whole notion of student agency. Um, in that paragraph that says, in this model, I'm not sure what this model is referencing, but in this model, the student determines it takes ownership of their efforts, pursues selected pathways, and is supported by educator staff, et cetera, et cetera. This acknowledges student agency. And I think we certainly saw the feedback that we received from Dr. Page, Colorado Principal of the Year, um, who also took issue with that because of the concern that we cannot assume that students are all able to take that kind of agency um, that I think from Dr. Page's uh, statement, he writes, um, for example, if a girl is eliminated from computer science roster because the teacher does not think a girl belongs in the class, student agency will not help. So the opposition to the statement is it kind of, it kind of implies that all you got to do is work hard and you will succeed. Take ownership, you will succeed. And, and I just think that whole paragraph's problematic because when we look at equity, 
we have students that are in different journeys and they may not be able to pull themselves up with their bootstraps. Um, and I just think that whole sentence doesn't really belong in an equity policy. Um, I mean, it's a nice desired state, but not all our students have that ability or come from homes where they have that kind of support. So I really take issue with that whole paragraph and I think the experts do as well. Yeah, and, and this echoes back at, when we look at the original drafting and I'm talking the first reading of the policy that was passed in 2021, there were two particular sections that were struck in, that were removed from that before the second reading and those two were references to uh, systemic racism and the other one was the reference to the quote myth of meritocracy um, and uh, I believe that's what I'm hearing echoed here in my opinion where you just work hard and, and if you're not where you want to be you're just not working hard enough that's not what the in my opinion that's not what the intent of agency is agency is in fact the combination of uh, ownership of effort on part of students agency being a student definition of the gap of where they believe they are and where they want to be. So aspirational as directed and guided, defined by the student. And I think this is the second really critical part in my understanding of agency. And, and I borrow my understanding of agency from, from Ian Rowe. Um, and I think I've mentioned that a couple times that it is also coupled with the support of the student. The student Sometimes they can get there on their own. Sometimes we have incredibly gifted people and entrepreneurs. I mean, America's story is ripe with those people that just, you know, for whatever reason, due to talent, ability, and, and uh, get to it and has made incredible stories. However, that is not for everyone. And the other critical aspect of agency, not only defining where you want to go, committing to that and putting work in, uh, is the support of the system. We just saw this. I saw this in graduations. I think <clears throat> Director Hansen referenced it before she exited. Um, what did we see at graduations? What did I see over the last couple of weeks? What are we continuing to see? Students that get up on stage and say, but for Mr. Jones, Mrs. Smith, but for my parents, but for my grandparents, but for, I'll use a different word, the system, the Douglas County school system, the staff, uh, and not just the educators, the role models, sometimes it's our SROs, but for the people that supported me on this journey, I would not have made it, or I would not have made it this far. And uh, I, I didn't unpack that. Um, I probably could have, it would have added another page, <laughs> but in my intent of including this is and what I want to be defined by the student, their effort and ownership, but that critical aspect that I believe we come in, we, the larger Douglas County School District, is those systemic supports to enable that journey that that student wants to go on. Uh, so that, that was my attempt through agency. Uh, Director Williams. Yeah, just something else on that. Um, when we evaluate teachers, one of the things that we look at is how they collaborate with students on various aspects of their education. And if you think about that, that actually leads to student agency in itself because teachers are empowering students and um, collaborating with them. So I, I do believe that that does lead to agency. One other, if I may, Director Ray, I, I actually tried to quote you or paraphrase you because I believe you said something very close to that end statement at one point in a meeting and it actually struck me as, wow, that's pretty darn concise. And coming from either you or I, that's a hell of a statement, <laughs> right? Um, so that last clause there, while circumstances do not impact and shape a person, they are not the sole determining factor in their life. Not everyone is starting at the same starting line. I think we all may agree to that. I believe Dr. Page offered an alternative to that, um, which I thought was even better, no offense to you, uh, than, than your recommendation, which was an individual circumstances should not predetermine their outcomes. I think that was even more concise than specific. And I, in fact, would like to replace that last cause after the dash with Dr. Page's language, if that would be acceptable. I would be, yeah. I mean, that, I think that's my whole concern is I think we need to listen to the experts. If the expert has issue with the way this is written, then I think we should change it. And I appreciate you giving me credit where credit's not due because I don't recall <laughs> uh, making that statement, but I do appreciate your willingness to uh, incorporate an expert's 
um, recommendation for how that might be changed. So point of information, can you explain that change? Yeah, your, yes, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll read what it would be. It, it would actually, what, what I'm uh, offering is that we just strike everything after the dash at the end of that paragraph. Uh, sorry, Mr. Blair, if you can just go back up. Um, uh, ha, ha, thank you. He, right there, thank you. Uh, in the paragraph that starts within this model of striking the last bit after the dash. So deleting while circumstances do impact and shape a person, they are not the sole determining factor in their life and replacing it with an individual circumstances should not predetermine their outcomes. That's the proposal. Any other comments on, on that before we move forward to other elements? Okay. Any other comments by other directors on other parts of the policy? <clears throat> Direct, Director, <coughs> excuse me, Director Meek. Sure. Um, and first, I, I want to make sure I have a chance to respond to Director Williams around collaboration, because I do believe in collaboration. And that's really what I was proposing by listening to our DAC and SAC and other individuals that want to work together on this and writing up answers to help provide clarity. Um, so in essence, I was not refusing to make changes to this policy period. I was saying that we need to go slow to go fast. So I really wanted to have clarity on that. Um, the other area that was mentioned that there wouldn't need to be made, there wouldn't need to have changes made to ADBR. I do think by expanding the diversity definition to include other definitions of diversity, we are diluting a focus on the, the, very, er, the very area of need in the policy. Um, the disaggregated data that I highlighted earlier this evening was really proof that we need to focus on the identity diversity. Um, we need to do everything possible to address a sense of belonging and you know, ensure that we're really focusing on the area that we know we have a need. So by including the other types of diversity, we're signaling to our superintendent and our staff that we expect training for our staff in those areas because I don't think I understand what it is. And I, when you start talking about instrumental diversity and personality diversity and these different areas, so it would require training, it would require monitoring, and you know, it would require resources. And so I think that part does influence a regulation that needs to be written. And all of these other areas of diversity that are being added to the policy are not actual issues or concerns that have been expressed in our, in our district. So the pervasive issues that this equity policy was written to address are being minimal, minimized. Um, feedback that we've received from educational experts, you know, they even state that it seems the diversity definition belongs in a business context, not an educational context. I think we heard a public commenter tonight talking about that as well. So the multiple definitions could cause confusion and really take us off what the original intent was. And so I believe adding the new language under diversity is simply weakening the policy when in fact we should be leaning into ensuring each and every student is valued and welcomed in our schools. So I suggest not revising and adopting the changes under the diversity definition. Yeah, and Mr. Blair, could you just scroll down so we have, uh, thank you, uh, thanks, right there. Uh, other director comments around that suggestion? Uh, director Williams. 
Yeah, I think that the, the first sentence of the policy says the Douglas County School Board of Education commits to establish an inclusive culture to ensure all students, staff, and community members. So I struggle to find um, a reason why not to add more diversity if we're including all students. I don't know how you diver dilute a policy by just including more people. And, and I'll speak to the, the delusion aspect. Uh, it's not meant to dishonor or dilute. It's meant to add in addition to. Um, and to the comment, and I did hear it tonight, around instrumental diversity, um, something that I believe when we look at our three pathways, post-secondary, uh, military service, and direct entry into the workforce, that is specifically, that is a workforce valued item. And, and in this case, our, our customers are not only our students and our families, which we serve through education, they're the, the business partners that we deliver through our CTE programs. And when you look at the ability to work in a diverse team to solve complicated issues, complex issues, um, that collaboration that is needed and the ability to come together from not just um, different identities, whether that's race, gender, sex, religion, everything that's cited under identity diversity, but to frankly come together with instrumental diversity and learn how to collaborate in those settings are really something that is absolutely valued by our business partners. So that's why it is specifically in there to reinforce that third of our three pathways around our, our CTE offerings and our promise not just to our students, but our promise to our community and our, our connection with the businesses in Douglas County and the school district. That was my intent anyway. Director Ray. Yeah. Appreciate the intent. I mean, but <laughs> where do you stop? Do you, you know, where you, let's talk about social diversity, physical diversity, athletic diversity. I mean, we could go on and on and on and on, but we're losing sight of the reason for this policy. The, the reason for this policy is that we are in a system that continues to marginalize those who have been historically marginalized. And that's the problem. Um, and when we add all these other definitions of diversity, sure, it makes it feel good, feel comfortable, but the purpose of this policy was to say that when we look at what you've identified as identity diversity, that's the, that's the, that's the issue of why we need to talk about diversity, equity, inclusion. It's not because we're concerned about personality, which I'm pleased that you deleted. Uh, you had thought diversity, which I'm pleased you deleted as well. But I still feel like the learning preference diversity, um, I mean, that does not make sense in the combination of looking at our culture of belonging. And that's what this policy is all about. How do we make sure that everyone is in a culture of dignity? And so when we start diluting that, um, we lose focus of why this policy, and I read that to you from the beginning. Um, I can almost live with cognitive diversity in there, because I, I do think that there is um, some value to acknowledge that there's different ways of how we process information and knowledge, et cetera. Learning preference diversity, though, that's actually, research is actually showing that that's kind of a passe kind of way of looking at how we teach students, uh, that there's really not a lot of quality research that says that when we teach to a visual or a student that has a visual preference that all of a sudden they're going to do better uh, uh, than when we teach to them through an auditory. So that, that's kind of a um, obsolete reference in my opinion and, and again instrumental diversity I have, I have no idea where that fits in this but um, if I were to find a compromise between director Meek stating you know get rid of the additional diversities I would say hang on to the identity and cognitive diversity get rid of the others um, just so that we remain focused on the purpose of this policy. Uh, I can give up the learning preference diversity. Um, I, something that was suggested, I didn't have it in an original draft, and if you think it's going to cause um, 
concerns with measuring and quantifying, I'd be happy to give that up. Um, the micro in me says instrumental diversity is incredibly important for our, our business partners for the reason uh, that I stated. Uh, the other thing that I would say, and I don't look at it as watering down diversity, but if we have just a singular focus on diversity means identity, and, and many of those are immutable characteristics, I think we go against what Dr. King's vision was when we look at content of character over color of skin. When we start putting people into bins, whether intentionally or not, when we start saying, you are X, therefore this defines you, your group identity defines you, we really lose that rich, complicated, complex thing that is an individual human. And one of the themes that I heard through many of the commenters, not, not all of them from public comment, there were a significant number of comments, and not just tonight from public comment, but in the feedback that we got from surveys and things, where people were concerned around this use of groups because we don't have groups listed in, um, in our mission and vision. We talk about allowing an individual to achieve his or her potential. We talk about individuals. Even tonight, we talked about disaggregation of data. And, and my comment was, I really like it because it identifies individuals that need additional supports or things. And if we only have identity without some other aspects of diversity, which help to define individuals um, and make them the unique people that they are, we risk potentially um, categorizing people and, and assigning them strengths, weaknesses, uh, potentials based on what identity group they are, quote, assigned to. And I would never want to assign someone an identity group. I would honor their expressions of multiple identity groups as they define themselves. And again, it's just a caution, but but I understand your, your point, uh, mm -hmm. Director Ray, around certainly learning preference diversity. Um, so I will certainly accept that unless other directors really wanna fight for keeping learning preference diversity, but I as one director would fight for keeping the other remaining definitions, identity, cognitive, and instrumental um, in there. Uh, and discussion on that by, by group members, because obviously we have some differences of opinion here. Just one. Right, go ahead, Director. Just a follow up to some of the things you said, Director Peterson. I, I want to dispel the myth because I've heard it just now, but I've heard it from others that this policy encourages that we put students in groups. There's nothing in this policy that alludes to that. You always go to the notion of individual, but just like an individual does not want to be generalized for their immutable characteristics that we hear over and over, they also don't want to be discriminated against because they affiliate with a certain group. I and, I, and I think that we keep on making group like a bad word um, when many of our students who affiliate with a group, that's where they find their strength. That's where they find their belonging. So I think we need to be careful that we don't make this policy something that it isn't. It's not that we're saying, teacher, put kids in groups according to this. Um, and, and then my last statement would be, again, we need to listen to the experts. Every one of our experts, at least that I have spoken to, does not feel like that diversity should be, should have multiple um, disclaimers like instrumental thought personality. They, they believe that we need to have the power of the intent of this policy, which is to look at students who are historically marginalized and commit to them that they will be successful because we will provide all the resources they need. So again, we need to listen to the experts. Yeah, other directors. Did you have a, Director Williams? I, I think a good compromise would be to take out the learning preference, preference diversity. Director Weininger. Yeah, I agree. I actually do like calling out the different diversities because I don't believe um, identity diversity is solely what diversity is about. And I think putting May in there shows that's not, this isn't the complete list. So 
um, yeah, I like the list you have. And removing learning preferences, I think, makes sense. Okay, thank you. Director Myers. I agree. Identity, cognitive, and instrumental. Okay, I don't think there were any real changes from the original policy under equity, identity, inclusion, or representation um, definitions. So I'd like to focus the, the board on the last two elements here, and I know we're going uh, long on this item, but uh, Mr. Blair, if you can go down to the part where it says the board um, shall not condone, and we get into, because this is something that was, uh, had a lot of input during our work session. So, oh, oh, sorry, Mr. Blair, just the, the list of A, B, C, D, and right above that, thank you. Um, so bullying and harassment was added and it was moved to the very top, uh, letter A. I think we've had a lot of conversation the last couple of meetings around that. So uh, any directors that are full for bullying and harassment, um, please let me know. Uh, but I think that's, that's clear and une unequivocal. And then, we, uh, and then we have the second thing, which is B, we do not tolerate biased, inequitable, racist, or exclusive practices. And again, I think that's very clear on behalf of the board and the district that this is not something that will be supported. The, the last thing is I'll call, uh, I believe Director Williams added the last two, promotion of specific aspects of identity as superior or inferior to other aspects, and then G, which would be the lowering uh, standards and expectations for any students, including those in state and federally identified subgroups. So those were added in the working group uh, meeting, and I'll take any comments on those, but I thought we had those fairly well worked out as a group in the working group meeting. Director Ray. Yeah, I mean, I, I, th I mean, I, like you have stated, how can we argue against these? Um, and I think it's, I think the more we don't condone, the, the better, but I also think that as you, I think, talked about earlier, is that when we focus so much on the things that we're against, we lose that notion of what is the shared vision of who or what we want to be. Um, and, and I don't think there's clear guidance for what people should be doing or what justice and healing looks like. So, um, so, so I, I, I think we could add, add a whole nother list. Um, I know that Director Williams pro provided a great rationale why she went to bullying at the top of the list. I would split the difference and say, let's just alphabetize um, the first word of each of those statements, because I think it, uh, for us to try to prioritize which thing that we don't condone is more important than the other, just to me, um, is probably splitting hairs that we don't need and, to do. And I think that's acceptable, because otherwise we're ranking, in a, and this is an, an inc well, it's not all inclusive, but we don't want to set priorities. So unless there's an objection, we could prioritize by the first letter, uh, just A through G, and that wouldn't be a problem. The last one, and I, and I hope this is not controversial, uh, if we can go down, Mr. Blair, um, I'm sorry, there are two others. If you can go just up a little bit, I'm sorry. So there's a fair, and again, we discussed this at the working meeting, and what the large change there in the paragraph that begins with, in order to promote educational equity, um, it would be a change from the current policy where the board directs the establishment of an equity advisory council. This broadens it to direct the superintendent to establish whatever superintendent councils. And I, I wanted the word superintendent in there because I think there was some significant confusion that the Equity Advisory Council was somehow a board committee because it was created by the board in a policy, although it was a superintendent council from the beginning. Uh, but this uh, is a change that directs uh, the superintendent to establish and maintain any councils, positions, et cetera, you can read it up there. And based on what the superintendent has written for ADB-R, it would in fact maintain the Equity Advisory Committee under ADB-R at that point. So any discussion on that, again, knowing that we discussed this change in the working group. Uh, Director Ray. Yeah, I, I have had more time to kind of reflect on the original policy and what we intended. I don't know. 
Director Peterson that we ever said it was a superintendent committee. Uh, and, I, and I've told you that before, you know, told this board before that it really said district, it really said board and superintendent. And I know I questioned Superintendent Kane if there were ever a committee that was jointly uh, facilitated by both the board. But I, I think the intent of this council was similar to when we created MBOC. We originally created MBOC to be autonomous. Um, and, that was, and the reason for that is we did not want the board nor the superintendent to insert themselves into a citizen group of people uh, that were to hold us accountable to spend our mill levy and bond the way we're supposed to. So originally that committee was independent. It was autonomous. And I, and I really believe that is the same intent of the Equity Advisory Council. They're, they are self-sufficient. They use staff, obviously, to consult and, and to help facilitate some of their meetings, but they're basically a self-sufficient, autonomous group of people that don't answer to anybody except for the people that are studying and monitoring our implementation of this policy. And so what I would advocate is that we're, we don't um, call it a superintendent committee. We don't say she has the authority to, to maintain it or not. I think we need to maintain this group as a solely independent group that advises both the superintendent and the Board of Education um, and, and doesn't answer to anyone except for how that group has been developed. And in, as I'm sure Director Meek will tell you, it's an extremely diverse group of people. It, it's not, there. I mean, there. there's very polarized perspectives as it should be in terms of really digging deep and having those good conversations about how we make sure this is implemented. So I really believe they can function as an autonomous group. Um, I don't think they need um, the direction of us nor the superintendent. I think they need to be able to advise us um, and the superintendent. Other director comments? on that pair, uh, Director Williams. I just have a question. So then who would provide them direction? Because we do still provide MBOC direction at the beginning of the year. The policy provides them direction. So the policy and they're, they're commissioned to monitor implementation of the policy. It's already been provided to them. They can certainly choose to have different areas of focus or, or have areas that they want to emphasize from the policy, but the policy drives their work. So they basically start with the policy, they, they look at ADBR, and they simply ask the question, uh, how are we monitoring the implementation? Yeah, and, and for that reason, uh, as I was weighing this back and forth, um, I actually like this paragraph better because if it's if it really is about monitoring the impl implementation, making inputs and suggestions around implementation, picking a implementation related focus area, and implementation is going to mainly be defined by the superintendent and her staff through ADBR. I actually like this paragraph even better because that seems to be the connection to the EAC is through the superintendent and through implementation. That, that, that's just my take on it. But it's implementation of a two-dimensional policy. It's, I mean, it's not just ADBR. It's also monitoring um, ADB as well. So, and that's our policy. And so in that, in that case, they have to also consult with us. Um, so I'll, can I read what I would what I would put in that paragraph, and then Please. we'll call it good. Uh, the, the district and board of of education are cons, are committed to supporting an independent equity advisory council. The EAC is an autonomous committee that will coordinate with school district leadership and the board of education to support and advise the full and systemic implementation of the Douglas County School District educational equity policy in alignment with the Educational Equity Policy, ADB, and the EAC bylaws, the AAC will choose areas of focus for each academic year. The EAC will submit their advisement and recommendations to the Board of Education and Superintendent. 
Okay, I totally understand that, but I don't agree with it. So, but I, but I do understand exactly. That's very clear. Um, given this subject, given the implementation, I, I would again, as one director, uh, feel much better with this language here, where there is a direct report of that council in this area up to the superintendent, specifically because we're we're going to as a board monitor the superintendent. I don't mind at all. In fact, I would highly encourage if the EAC had a recommendation around implementation or anything that may affect our policy, ADB, as we continue to work on and improve this, uh, that they would make that recommendation up through the superintendent and staff to the board. That That's how I would like to see it. But uh, I come from a military chain of command culture. So um, Probably just a matter of preference. Any other director comments on that? Director uh, Williams and then Director Myers. I, I guess I would rather have have them have direction from one or the other. And because um, the superintendent has an ADBR, I think that letting them monitor the the implementation is a good a good thing to do. Director Myers. I'm also in agreement that we keep this last paragraph and I'm not in agreement with Director Ray's. <laughs> and, 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 and then the last item, and, and it is, a, uh, again, we had an earlier discussion, Director Ray, about the superintendent can, can create dash R policies, but I thought it would be good to explicitly for, for I keep forgetting what is, is it B, B, G, E, B, E, G, that, Thank, thank you. For our list of which policies belong to the board and which policies belong to the superintendent, I thought it would be clarifying to explicitly delegate ADB-R, which, by the way, uh, has been renamed the Implementation of Educational Equity for Clarity, uh, delegated to the superintendent. Uh, and I know that was a discussion uh, with Director Williams earlier about whether to do that or not. So um, do you have... Any comments on that, Director Williams, only because you brought that up previously? I, f I feel like every time I've brought it up, I've been outvoted, so I will submit and walk away with my tail between my legs. But um, <laughs> um, I would prefer ADBR uh, be um, a board file. And I pr prefer that it be delegated in with the superintendent, but that's just one director. And I'll just again reiterate a couple of things. BGE is an exhibit. It's yeah, not it's a policy that stands by itself. And so I think we sometimes use it like it's a policy. It's, it's simply collecting um, you know, the work that's been done to, de to delegate policies. Um, and so I, I think unless you're going to go through every one of our policies and put this statement in that we delegate an R policy to the superintendent, it really doesn't make sense so, uh, so to put it there. So just for clarification to make sure we have agreement among seven board members, if we do not put that statement in there, the one that starts with policy ADB-R, um, and we do not affirmatively take ownership of that policy as a board, I believe we would all be agreeing that the superintendent has the right to just make an ADB-R. Is that your understanding, Director Ray? And, and that at any time we can ask the superintendent to review the policies that she has put in put into place. I absolutely agree. And as long as we are all in agreement as six directors, we can strike that knowing that um, our superintendent will, uh, as she's expressed, go forward with an ADBR, which she will own. Uh, but taking your, your statement exactly at any point, we could make that request to the superintendent. So I will strike that. So we do have a initial motion on the table, but I would like to review the potential changes and I will try to summarize them quickly. Uh, Mr. Blair, if you can go back up to the top. So it would be uh, keeping the very first paragraph intact, except, uh, and I'll wait for Mr. Blair to get there all the way to the top of the document except uh, keeping the original language at the end, which is unbiased, culturally relevant, responsive, and sustaining learning environment, striking the words and empowered. Adding to the second uh, paragraph, the purpose of this educational equity policy is to achieve the following outcomes, colon, 
if you go down, Mr. Blair, the third bullet under number three will be changed to just say increase self-regulating behaviors, help seeking, et cetera. Moving to the uh, down, Mr. Blair, to we get the paragraph that starts with in this model. The end, everything after the hyphen will be struck and replaced with in individual circumstances should not predetermine their outcomes. When we go down to the definitions of diversity, the entire first bullet is struck um, regarding learning preference diversity. Um, and then when we get down, Mr. Blair, if you can continue to go down to the list of A through G, those will simply be reordered alphabetically based on the first letter of each bullet. And then finally, we will strike the last um, part, if you keep going down, Mr. Blair, right there, uh, the reference to policy ADBR, knowing that even without that explicitly in there, we expect the superintendent to go forward with her policy ADBR as briefed and proposed. So those are the um, amalgamated, to use the transportation union's word, uh, summary of changes. Uh, I will now entertain, I guess, a updated motion regarding the policy as amended as I just stated. Um, motion to approve the amended policy as President Peterson just stated. Okay, and we, we have the previous motion on the board, which was to approve the policy by Director Williams. So I'm actually asking Director Williams if she would like to amend her motion. Oh, I'm to sorry. Include, <laughs> to yes, yes sorry. I will um, amend my motion to include the new amendment. And we had the original second by Myers. And are you seconding the updated motion? Yes. Okay, so we have a motion to approve policy ADB at, with all the changes that I just um, uh, articulated motion by Williams, second by Myers, and I will take the role. Director, question uh, first. Yeah, yes, go ahead, Director Ray. Um, I just want to check in with Director Meek. Um, the definition of belonging wasn't completely the definition that you provided, so I wanted to check in with that. And I also wanted to, because Director Peterson, you plugged a book from Doctor from Scott Page. Scott Page. Yes. Let me let me plug this book. <laughs> this book is called "Belonging Through a Culture of Dignity: The Keys to Successful Equity Implementation." Right. Floyd Cobb, John Crown Apple. I read this from cover to cover um, after I met with our experts, and it's an incredible book. And I would really. Direct, or Superintendent Kane, I don't know if you've seen it, but even has some of those words that you don't like, like uh, the, the, what's the, um, dis, uh, the instruction, deficit instruction. They, t they have a whole section to explain what that means in here. So anyway, I wanted to plug a book because I think you guys, you probably helped Scott get a few more copies yeah. purchased, but probably, this is where did. belonging and dignity and this really, to me, is the vision of who we should be, the future we want to step into. But I, I want to just acknowledge that, but that was where Director Meek also got her definition from belonging, so I just want to double check that yeah. you were satisfied. Yeah. If, if I could answer that, and then I'll get Director Meek to respond. Uh, I originally included uh, the exact submission uh, verbatim that Director Meek uh, uh, offered for belonging that had an additional sentence here um, with what I gave to legal further review and it was a legal recommendation that we truncated to what appears in this draft. Uh, Director Meek, do you have any other comments? Okay. So uh, again, I will take the role on the motion. Director Meek. So even though the revisions to this policy will likely pass tonight, um, I do not believe it will satisfy our community nor clear up misinformation. So I'd like to encourage the superintendent to continue to use the feedback received on this policy to develop a Q&A for the website, um, something we can use as a resource to help bring clarity as questions come in from our community. Um, so I believe there are repercussions for pushing through this policy without involving board and superintendent committees who have expressly asked to be included. And in addition, the process has been rushed and, and adequate. So for those reasons, I'm voting no. Meek is a no. Director Myers. Aye. 
Peterson, I, Ray. Yeah, I was, I, I was so close to a yes, but um, I can't, I can't hold heartily support this because I'm unable to ignore the flaws and violations of the review process. And I feel like a yes on this policy condones the mistakes that were made along the way and sets a terrible precedence for the dysfunctional and political view of policies in the future. Um, and I was close because um, a lot of the revisions you honored, and I want to say thank you. Uh, I, can, I can sleep easier knowing that some of those changes were made. Um, I wish we could have come to agreement on how diversity is being diluted. Uh, I wish we could have come to agreement about how critical it is that we have a group of people who are autonomous to hold us accountable to monitor this, because this, to me, is the very crux of an issue that Douglas County has not done well with, um, in my opinion. And I've been in the county for, I've been a district employee for 30 some years, and we still have so much to do to get to the vision of what we want to be. And so um, for those reasons, I will have to vote no as well. And Director Ray is a no. Director Williams. Aye. Director Weininger. Aye. Motion is passed. Uh, four to two, and let's just take a quick, uh, I was gonna say, we have a bunch of people that are waiting to present individually on policies. President Peterson. Go ahead, Director Meek. It's well after midnight, yeah. and this was my concern I brought up earlier this evening. I think it's so disrespectful that we have employees who are expected to be up in a few hours. They start very early in the morning, and we're canceling our meeting for June 6th. I would, so I just would like to reconsider whether it makes sense to really continue through all of these policies this evening, which are scheduled to take over an hour to get through. I think staff is already here. Uh, yeah, it's it's going to be another hour before they go home. Understood. Right? Uh, I'll get the superintendent's input. Superintendent King. Um, my preference, our, our our preference would be to have them go ahead and be able to go because they have waited um, for many many hours. And the last thing I want to ask all of these folks who have come from different parts of our district is to come to another meeting um, when they're they're sitting here and. Um, I think they'll be able to answer your questions pretty quickly, and um, I will owe all of them forever because I um, just want to express my incredible gratitude for all of these folks for staying for so long. You guys are amazing. Thank you, Superintendent Kane. So with that, we will move to item number 27, the proposed revisions to policy JICB, prevention of bullying. If we can get it on the screen, Mr. Blair, and uh, this is policy changes that were all um, recommended by staff. Yeah. And, and Superintendent Kane, to be explicit, if you have staff members that are briefing on only a particular policy and they are not commenting or you don't need them for other policy, I would highly suggest you send them home. And if you have any other staff members that are here that are not related to the rest of the agenda items, absolutely feel free to send them home. So thank you. Of course. Thank you. Go ahead, everyone. Uh, so we have JICB, uh, Prevention of Bullying, uh, on there. I will open it up for uh, comments from the directors. Um, this one did have some significant revisions and is um, suggested by staff. So if staff has any comments? Before we begin, I so, sorry, microphone, thank you. Again, I'd just like to ask each one of our uh, participants who've actively spent considerable time in the last months in developing this policy to introduce themselves and their role with respect to uh, working on this committee um, so, 
I'm Mary Clemish, General Counsel for the District, and I'd ask each one of our committee members to introduce themselves and their contributions. I'm Wendy Jacobs. I'm the Deputy General Counsel. Allison Rausch, Director of Parent, Community, and Civic Engagement. Kelly Smith, Director of Health, Wellness, and Prevention. Aaron Henderson, Compliance Officer. Ellen Kirkhoff, Mental Health Team Lead for Psychologists and Social Workers. Stephanie Crawford Getz, Director of Mental Health. Sean Patterson, Principal of Thunder Ridge High School. Aaron McDonald, Executive Director of Schools for the Castle Rock Region. Okay, thank you. Can I turn this off? Yeah, I don't know. I got you. Thank you. Good evening, or should I say good morning? Um, I just wanted to provide some, some brief statement about the revisions that were made for second reading, which actually were pretty small. Like, we actually didn't make that many changes. Um, I think the biggest ones had to do with um, just clarifying a little bit of the definition of bullying, rating, relating to um, re repeated conduct and or the likelihood of being repeated, just to clarify the, that aspect of it. Um, and also, we, there were some comments just to clarify um, who could file a, a bullying complaint. And so we wanted to make, make clear that anybody can do it, whether it's a parent, a witness, a student, so that there wouldn't be any limitation on that. Um, and those were really the big ones. We, we did put in some language clarifying that bullying is not teasing fights between students of equal power or conflicts that, um, that, uh, that don't involve the characteristics of bullying. I, I think one of the things that I, I wanted to emphasize and that I think we all wanted to emphasize, I know that there were some um, comments being critical of the fact that we had provided some more nuance to the definition of bullying. And one of the reasons, there were a couple of reasons we did that. First was that the guidance that CDE issued, like the, the statute gave the direction to develop a policy that was consistent with CDE's guidance and, and their recommendations. And, I, and I, we believe that we've done that. Um, and included language in there that was specifically in CDE's guidance. And so in fleshing out some of the definition, it was not our intention, nor do I believe the, the result is any kind of rewrite or invention or bringing in of anything new. This is all entirely consistent with what was in CDE's guidance and what was in model policies that we looked at. And we just felt that it was important to just tighten up the language and also make clear that bullying is different from other kinds of misconduct. Because some of the ways that people were suggesting, that some of the comments suggested that we define it, essentially it would become the categorization that would swallow up everything else. And so we wanted to make very clear that that, that this is a distinct category of misconduct, but that doesn't mean that if something doesn't qualify as bullying, that it isn't actionable. You know, we have a very robust student code of conduct and policies that govern everything from harassment um, to all kinds of different misconduct, including whether it's assault or anything else, any one of those which might constitute bullying in certain instances, but is definitely misconduct and subject to disciplinary action on its own. And so we thought that it was important to make clear that bullying is distinct from those other types of misconduct and not just create a definition that sort of swallowed everything up, if that makes sense. Um, so I think if in looking at the, this, this version doesn't have sort of the red lines, but if you look at the red line version, and I think that was sent to all of you, the changes that we made were highlighted in yellow, and there really aren't that many of them. Um, and so I think a lot of it was just tightening up some language and responding to some of the comments. And we were very careful and deliberate in the way that we did that. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you might yeah, have. Th thank you, Mr. Blair, for pulling up the, uh, the red line with the, again, the red line, blue line is uh, exactly what was presented at the first reading. The Correct. second reading changes have the yellow highlighting on them from what was previously Correct. presented. And so yes. this, I think this will be the 
better working copy up here. With that, I'll open it up to um, directors, any comments and questions they have uh, specifically for the changes for the second reading or anything uh, in the changes to this policy that they have for staff. Uh, Director Williams. So I think it was brought up last time about the specific words, um, an imbalance of power. Mm -hmm. I guess my question is, is there harm in saying or instead of and? Because I really struggle with that as, as a mom who has had a child be bullied. Um, it was by another student that was pretty close to the same size, at the same school, same, you know, race. I mean, everything was the same. And it, it but it was intentional and it was repeated. So I, I, I guess I'm just wondering if there's an or there, because I, I, I do still think there can be um, bullying without an imbalance of quote unquote power. Yeah, I understand. And I we did feel that it was important to leave the and rather than the or to keep it consistent with the guidance. I would say that a determination of imbalance of power is very nuanced. And certainly if you have one student, and this is generalized, I, I don't know your child, I'm not making any kind of comment about that. But you can have students who may appear to be of sort of equal footing and one just doesn't have the wherewithal to defend themselves or, or you know, present a stronger front, and the other one does. And to me, that can be an imbalance. You can have sort of an imbalance of ability and an imbalance of your, your wherewithal to, to sort of fight back, essentially. Um, and I think that, as with many things in this policy, there were there were lots of comments and questions that we got. And I'm sorry, my voice gets like this when I'm tired. Um, there were many questions and comments that we received that asked for, well, you know, what does this look like? And the tr problem is that with something relating to bullying or other kinds of misconduct, it's going to be an individualized case by case analysis. And I think it's important to remember that. We didn't, we didn't come into the, the, the development of a bullying policy from scratch. I mean, this is something that we've had a bully, an anti-bullying policy for a long time. We have staff and administrators and teachers who are experienced in dealing with this. I mean, even without this policy being passed, I deal with a lot of the student issues and support um, teachers and staff and administrators in school. And whenever there are instances of bullying, they already know what to do. They know how to investigate bullying. They know how to provide training to classrooms to bring people's, I mean, to bring the, the kids' understanding and awareness, um, you know, where, where we feel like it should be to provide some training. Um, and so I think that that having that, that and in there doesn't diminish the ability of staff to be able to recognize when there are situations where one student just isn't in a position to defend themselves for whatever reason that, um, that another student does, even if they are the same size, you know, appear to be sort of equally situated in, in every other realm. And so that, that was why we recommended leaving in the and rather than putting it as an or. Mm -hmm. Director Meek. Yeah, so related to that imbalance of power, because we did receive a lot of questions mm -hmm. around that, and you talked about the nuance of it. So sure. then that kind of leads me to the other area of false accusations. And so a lot of questions around will <laughs> victims of bullying be fearful to come forward if it's deemed to be a false, you know, a false bullying incident. So I'd love to have you speak to that. Sure. Yeah. That and was and really Mr. Blair, can you just scroll down to the bottom of the first page where it references false accusations? In fact, it'll be a little bit farther down because this is the yeah, I think it's red line the version. So I do think there are a couple of things that I think it's important to say about that. One is that the false accusation piece is specifically in the CDE guidance. It is in every single model policy, including CDEs, and it is carved out like that. And so I do think it's important to address it. I, I would also say, again, as somebody who works frequently and I talk every day to folks in schools, false accusations are a thing. Like, it is a problem. and. 
it, particularly because so many of the reporting mechanisms that we have, like safe to tell or text to tip, allow people to make reports anonymously, it really can be weaponized, and I have seen it with many, many situations. You know, for, for every three or four um, parents we hear from who are concerned about their child being bullied, there is at least one that is also concerned about their child being bullied by false accusations. And so I think that it is something that is important to call out. I do think that the, the definition, because it's not just that, that you make an accusation that turns out not to be true. It has to be intentionally false. And so I do think that that eliminates some of the, perhaps the chilling aspect of it, because I think that if, if you are legitimately concerned about bullying and you make a report, then you shouldn't have anything to worry about when it comes to being accused of false accusations. And that's what I was wondering, if even that additional statement in there might be helpful to alleviate that concern. Because I, I feel like if a student is fearful you know, of bringing something forward because it might not rise to the level of bullying, but we want students to be able, like we don't want it to be weaponized of course. And, and intentionally, but we also want to make sure that students feel safe speaking up mm -hmm. in that regard. So I don't know if there's language that would make sense that you might recommend. Well, I do think, I mean, we have the language that it has to be made knowingly for purposes of causing harm. So I do think that all of the qualifying language that could really tease it out as being sort of in d deliberate and deliberately harmful and false, like deliberately making a false statement, I think that that's pretty clear in the definition. Um, you know, I, I can sort of put on my thesaurus hat and try to think of some other words, but I respectfully, I, I do think that that definition does capture what we want to capture. And I also think that it is important for people reading this policy to understand that it is a serious thing to do and that there will be consequences. And I can tell you firsthand that this is something that happens and it is not rare. Other directors, Director Ray. Agreed, and our student advisory group would also affirm whether it's use of safe to tell or, mm -hmm. or whatnot that there is a lot of what you have just described, Council Jacobs, going on. I'm wondering, because I, I do think this definition does lay it out very clearly what a false accusation is. I think when we go back up, if we scroll back up to the very beginning of the policy uh, where we make statements about bullying, I just wonder if we would insert the word knowingly false accusations, because I think the key word is, I know it. I sure. know I'm making a false accusation. So I think where it says um, bullying, retaliation, and knowingly false accusations, I would just add that descriptor. Yeah, I think again, that makes sense. Because that's the first thing people read in the policy. And I think that's why people take offense right away. It's like, well, wait a minute. Absolutely. No, I, I totally agree. And Thank I think you. that that's a, an excellent addition. <clears throat> uh, Superintendent Kane, then uh, Director Me. Just a point of clarification: um, knowingly false accusations or intentional false accusations. I'm not sure which one would provide the most clarity. Uh, we could use both. <laughs> I was just paralleling it yeah. with the language that's later in policy, but I think yeah, knowingly and intentionally false. I think that's a great qualifier, and I think it. I think it should alleviate some of the concerns that folks have expressed about it. Okay, so hearing uh, that uh, inserting bullying, retaliation, and knowingly and intentionally false ac accusations of bullying. Sure, Got I, it. I think that makes okay. perfect sense. Director Meek. Yeah, I think another area of questioning we heard was around a definition of teasing. Uh, no. Mr. Blair, if you can go down, uh, it's highlighted in yellow. There was a addition around Teasing, if you keep going down to, you'll get to it. Oh, it was highlighted back up. Oh, yeah. okay. There it is. Thank you. It, it, it doesn't define teasing, but it differentiates teasing from bullying. I believe that's. So are you, are you asking, should we define teasing more specifically? Yeah, I mean, that was some of the feedback we re 
feedback we receive. I can't talk this late at night either. <laughs> so, like my voice um, is all froggy. <laughs> and there's so many different versions and changes that happen that I'm just trying to make sure I'm up to speed on where we are with things. But bullying is not teasing. Fights between students of equal power or conflict. Yeah, so I, I don't think we are defining what teasing means anywhere in this policy. Yeah, and I and I don't disagree that it, it could e it could use some clarification. I mean that that's something that I, I hadn't thought about that aspect of it. And so I do think that we could do that because I can certainly, you know, I understand I could see like extreme teasing as a form of bullying. And um, so we, we I'd have to think about that. But do you want to I just want to add with respect to that statement, it's taken directly from CDE's guidance. So there is a section in that guidance which defines what bullying is not. And it specifically states, quote, bullying is not teasing, fights between students of equal power or conflict, unquote. So that is just taken from the guidance from CDE to help assist our community in understanding what the different, what bullying is not. And so if there is a need for further clarification, um, we can see, I think, our team as we work on developing strategies for implementation may have some suggestions for how we tease out some of these things. We've got a terrific group of professional practitioners on our committee who I'm sure can assist with making contributions in that regard. Yeah, I mean, and I think, you know, certainly just thinking out loud, there are differences, as we all know, between sort of gentle ribbing and stuff that isn't meant to be particularly cutting and harsh. And so maybe we can sort of flesh that a, l a little bit out a little bit further. I just ask a question about that. Director Ray. So Ms. Clemish, is it your understanding that the guidelines need to be reflected in our, this policy? I mean, what I heard you say is the reason was to make, to give clarity to the community was why CDA was making that, CDE was making that recommendation. Our community clearly <laughs> doesn't clarify <laughs> it for them. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering from, are we trying to make sure that this replicates CDE guidelines exactly, or can we say, you know what? And I, I would go back to Director Williams' uh, testimony of, uh, I would hate to say that a student of equal power can coerce and intimidate and that's not considered bullying. So, I mean, I just, I just think there's a lot of stuff that doesn't really clarify it for our community. So I'm just wondering what our requirements are. I would say that we used, particularly in the definition section, the definition of bullying um, that I was talking about a few minutes ago, that just the straight definition of you know any act of misconduct like to me that's yeah. everything Great. and so we did think it was important to pull in some of the gu the clarifying guidance in the CDE document that was based upon academic research and things like that um, I do understand that teasing can be that's a funny word because you could have teasing that's very gentle between people and you know everybody knows I don't mean it but you could also have teasing that's that can be harmful and so I do think that that is something that we could look at fleshing out that definition a little bit further or just seeing if you know I think, I think that whole statement is problematic and I think we're very clear I think you've got you have done a beautiful job in terms of the characteristics of really making clear this is bullying um, but I just think that whole sentence is really problematic in how it reads for the reasons that we've all been discussing. Okay. So I would, yeah, I would strike I that if we're allowed to do that. I, I mean, you're the board. <laughs> you can do what you want. <laughs> I, just, but, I mean, we've, we've newly introduced imbalance of power. Now yes. we've newly introduced equal power. It just seems like a lot for our community to understand. I understand. Yeah, and, I, and I, I agree with Director. I understand it comes directly from the uh, from the CDE, but in an attempt to clarify, it may actually be introducing more of a of a conflict because now we open up teasing. So what is teasing and in those things? But to the previous points under the definition of bullying, A, B, C, one and two. Love that. I think that's very clarifying. And then we actually take a step back. So. Um, I would actually move to strike just that one sentence. Bullying is not teasing fights between students of equal power or conflict. 
because we define what it is above. And I, and I think the intent here is that's about as tight as we're going to get. And at the end of the day, uh, we as the board and our superintendent need to, uh, there's that word again, empower our staff <laughs> to use their discretion to, to separate this nuance on a case-by-case -case basis. I understand. Question regarding what you just referenced. Yeah, you, Director Ray. I know, so if we scroll back up to what Director Peterson was referencing, which is the right definitions. So when I was viewing the board meeting, the first reading, Director Peterson made a recommendation that we use the word may include the following as opposed to must include all of the following. And I thought that was a good recommendation. I think that also gets to Director Williams' concern that if we get so rigid with our that all of these characteristics must be met, that it doesn't give us some latitude to say, you know what, if you're doing A, that probably is bullying. Um, so I think Director Peterson's recommendation was including cyberbullying that meets, or I'm sorry, that may include the following characteristics. Um, to use the word may include, to give us a little more, to get, as he said, empowering our staff to have a little bit more uh, flexibility to really consequence if one of those A, B, or Cs are severe enough that only one of them might constitute labeling bullying. Does that make so, sense? So specifically, we're talking right under definitions, the first paragraph where it says bullying, the last sentence that says that meets all the following characteristics would just be changed to may include the following characteristics. So it wouldn't have to check every box. And, and thank you for bringing that up, Director Ray. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this gets back to when we were looking to the CDE's guidance to kind of winnow down the behavior so that it was distinct from other types of misconduct like harassment or, you know, other, other ways that people can be awful to each other, um, we did want to make it distinct from those other types of misconduct. And again, like it, even if it doesn't necessarily meet all of these factors, it doesn't mean that nothing's going to happen. It's, it still violates the code of conduct. And so we did think it was important to narrow the definition of bullying so that we had a very, because all of these other requirements attend to it if it becomes bullying. There are all these additional procedural requirements and, and you know we have reporting forms and things like that. And so I think we wanted to not, again, we don't, we don't want a definition that sort of swallows everything up and make this procedure attendant to every type of misconduct that students could engage in against each other. Um, and so that, that was why we, we tried to make it limiting so that it, it didn't become sort of a catch-all. So you believe that all three things must be in place? I believe so. And, and you know, we, we did go over this with this whole team in quite a lot of detail. And, and I think that largely because we wanted, there, there's a reason that this policy is being mandated and that it exists. And if it were conduct that could meet any other category, then it wouldn't be necessary. Yeah, I, I think my takeaway from your comments tonight is, is the fact uh, that, that really resonates with me and I hope would resonate with parents. Um, just because you're not checking all those boxes doesn't mean, oh, now nothing's going to happen. It won't be taken no. seriously. It won't be taken credibly. It just might not fit very tightly into the specific bullying box, but something will will be addressed. The action will Absolutely. be addressed. There will be action taken. So, I, I again, uh, I, I will defer to reflecting the CDE <laughs> uh, language. I'm again. I'm not really hard on it uh, yeah. on, on that language change, but um, I think that's the message that through professional development, through training, you know, is is if this is put into place, that's what we have to convey, not just to our staff. Obviously, you're empowered. You have the discretion, but to the parents, they just want to know. Absolutely. Yeah. No, and I understand that. I and I. I do think, you know, certainly when you look at the way, like the reason a policy is enacted is because you, or the statute requires it, is because there's something specific that you want to address. And I think that if the definition is so broad that it captures everything that is already in our code of conduct, it becomes meaningless, essentially. Yeah, and, and the other directors have already hit all my comments, mine were around false accusations, the definition, and then the, the, the list. Uh, Director Meek. 
One more. Um, did you consider theft as a form of bullying? I know in the CDE guidance they talked about that a little bit. I think it could be, and, and I think that it's the kind of thing that if it met the other definitions, if it was conduct that, that fell into the, the main definition, then absolutely. Um, you know, again, it's, it's, I, I think it's important to start with this, and then we look at the conduct and whatever it looks like, it could be, it could be theft. I mean, I absolutely can, can think of, can conceive of scenarios where repeated theft could be a form of bullying. And I think that whatever the conduct, you would just look at it within this framework and make a determination on that basis. So sometimes it might be, sometimes it might not be. But, but if we use this as our you know, sort of North Star, then that will be what drives the, the determination and the analysis. Can you help me understand where it fits within this framework? Well, like you could, it could be physical act or gesture. So I think that theft is a physical act. Um, and for example, if you had, and I'm just riffing, but if you had a student who had a particular toy or a particular thing that they loved, and the way that somebody chose to bully them was by repeatedly taking that item. I think that that is a physical act or gesture that falls into the definition of bullying. I think that somebody just breaking into somebody else's locker to you know, steal their backpack or something, that situation probably isn't gonna meet the definition. But I think that having this definitional framework that you can then use to analyze any particular individual situation will help you make that determination because you can just look and see whether it meets the definition. <laughs> One more. Okay. Um, I, I've really tried to go through all the feedback that we received. Um, let's see. Uh, no reporting requirement for witnessing bullying. So I think previously, why was this modified? So there's been so many different versions, but I'm, so, I'm not sure, I'm not following. Do you mean that if somebody witnesses Yeah, Mr. Bullying? Blair, if yeah, we can so go down to the reporting section, uh, there, there's a strongly encouraged provision now that's in there. Uh, it's under, uh, it's be below the definitions. We're almost there. There okay. we go. So you asking why it's strongly encouraged or? I guess I'm not following what your question is. Yeah, I'm, again, we got lots of feedback and I tried to cut and paste different ones. So I think there used to be something focused on if someone witnessed bullying, it was to be reported. They were expected to report it, but now I'm not seeing it. Well, I see, yeah. If, yeah. if, if we just go down uh, a little bit below that, the first bullet, which is now um, the one that starts with any district staff who have witnessed, there is an absolute requirement still that remains in there if you are a staff member, but it does not necessarily apply to student peers. Did it used to apply to students? <laughs> I know? think having it apply, that I'm, I'd have to look, but I also think that having it required, because then what happens if you don't? Like, do you get in trouble for not? I think that's, I think it's harder for students, and I think that strongly encouraged is better to let kids know that, you know, we welcome your, your, your information, and we want you to report what you see. If you see something, say something. But I think that if we get into making it a shall, then you get a question of well, what happens if they don't. And I think that we don't want to get into questions of like, did you break the rules by not reporting when you should have, yeah, just, when you're talking about a fifth grader. Yeah, as a uh, service academy graduate and someone who taught at a service academy, that gets very sticky very quickly. Mm -hmm. And you wind up catching a lot of collateral damage, intentional or not. Yeah, and especially, I mean, you know, the, there's no age limitation, and so are you gonna make that expectation of a seven-year-old who might not, who might be terrified? I mean, it's just, it's hard to, I think it's hard to have a blanket rule like that for, for kids. This is uh, just a more directed to the board, um, but, and, I, and I'm kind of a, I really believe we have, we need to use our CASB 
organization. We pay thousands of dollars to be members and they provide us model policies. And, and this one really has a lot of the same elements as the CASB model policy, but it seems to me we should clean it up to align with CASB, which is, first of all, just calling it J-I-C-D-E is the code that CASB uses um, for their model policy, which aligns with all the other metro districts as well. So I'm just thinking it might be an opportunity for us to, to do that. It also, the title is Bully Prevention and Education as opposed to just Prevention of Bullying. And so their model policy actually reflects kind of the updated language um, that they understand from the change in legislation. So that would be one thing that I would wonder about. There, there are some things in the CASB policy that I think um, I would love to see us talk about, and that is the whole notion of what to do with the bully. You know, we talk throughout this policy about the consequences, what bullying is, but I don't see us having strong language that talks about that we need to help the bully change their behavior. Um, CASB says this, to initiate efforts to change the behavior of students engaged in bullying behaviors through re-education on acceptable behavior, discussions, counseling, and appropriate negative consequences. Um, I, it, and I think, I mean, you, I, you, under prevention and, inter, and intervention, there are very similar statements that are in the CASB policy, but that one in particular was left out that I think... Um, we are an education institution. So yes. it's not just let's punish and be done with them. We ought to be helping them re-educate what our pro-social behavior, what do pro-social behaviors look like? Yeah, so. I agree. And we did talk about that. I mean, there were there were a lot of pieces from the statute that CASB pulled directly from the statute. And, you know, not, not to disrespect CASB, but sometimes I think their policies use language that doesn't need to be in there and then leaves out language that does need to be there. And so I think, it, you know, if we wanted to just take their stuff and put Douglas County's yeah. label on it, we could right. have done that. Right. But we really did want to make sure that it aligned with the recommendations of our staff, you know, which includes like principals and social workers and psychologists. And, you know, we want, we had such a broad um, and rich knowledge base to draw from. And one of the things that we did talk about is that there's a lot of language both in the statute and that was in some of the model policies that we felt would be more appropriate to either a regulation and we, you know, there is a plan to develop that and also just as to, to make it part of training that a lot of it is, you know, it's just good teaching. And so it's going to be part of some of the the systems that we already have in places in our have in place in our schools in order to provide guidance and training and coaching to students who who deal with so there is a plan to develop a uh, regulatory policy around this i'm sorry i maybe missed that oh yes absolutely <laughs> but this yeah. this team has been working for Sweet. months and months to develop what was mostly the first reading. Again, the, the changes that were made in the last month are only the highlights, but um, their next step is to work on the implementation side of things, including regulation, reporting, all of those things. Um, and I, again, I can't thank this team enough because they have invested hours and hours. Thank you. Yeah. Just I mean, to follow up real quick sure. with Director Ray's comment before we lose it, uh, do you see a issue with renaming it J-I-C-D-E, Bullying and Pre uh, Prevention and Education, just so it aligns with the, the mapping and the bidding? Is, is that an issue? <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, I would note that we have many, many policies that don't line up with the letters that CASB gives them, and JICB JI was our existing bullying prevention policy, and so we just thought we would change it to reflect. I mean, I, yeah. to, you know, however you all want to number it, I don't care well, particularly. There's a, there's, there's a greater reason than just aligning. So CASB sends out updates. When, so when legislation changes mm -hmm. something, they send us updates and they'll say J-I-C-D-E. And so it makes it much a, a, a much more valuable resource for us as a board to be able to, to reference that. I agree. I don't think our policies have to be identical to CASB, model, CASB but I just think we need to set ourselves up for success. Sure. So we're not going, oh, so they that's our J-I-C, that's their, you know, it would just be 
to me helpful. Yeah, no, I understand. I mean, so. I will say, you know, we've, we've looked because there have been times when we were worried about our policies being out of compliance. And a lot of it was just that they were numbered or lettered places. differently. And so I, I did this huge crosswalk just to make sure. But, um, you know, that's however you all want to do it. I don't, this, I, to, I'm more concerned about the substance, so. Sure. And, and just um, one more recommendation, and I think, again, I was after listening to the board talk about this and Director Meek's concern under investigating and reporting, um, I know she spoke to just being very uh, concerned that we use the term procedures will be developed. Um, and, and knowing that there's a regulatory policy coming and, and indeed all these experts that are going to be focused on doing that, brings me a great deal of relief in knowing that yeah. that will probably be better defined. However, I would just suggest that we just use the word uh, procedures will be implemented with the goal of immediate intervention, just to be able to make a strong statement as opposed to causing people the angst of going, what do you mean, these aren't developed yet? Um, so I would just advocate procedures will be implemented with the goal of immediate intervention. Sure. So, so just to summarize, uh, file J-I-C-D-E, bullying, prevention, and education. In the very first uh, sentence, we add bullying, retaliation, and knowingly and intentional false accusations of bullying. Uh, and then we just have the strike of bullying is not teasing fights uh, between students of equal power or conflict. And then the last one that uh, Director Ray just suggested, which was procedures will be implemented with the goal. So those are that just to, with all that comments and questions, excuse me, um, that, that's where we are with the suggested changes. Okay. And just so you know, we, we're developing the regulation. We are also developing reporting forms and, you know, investigate, like it's, it's been right. very and, comprehensive. And, so. and knowing that Dash R <laughs> is coming is, I, I think, yeah. assuages most of the concerns. So with that, is there a motion concerning um, policy, uh, the policy with the changes as presented, including uh, the renaming of JICDE that I just stated? I would move that we recode policy JICB to JICDE with the uh, recommended revisions as discussed. I have a motion by Ray, uh, Director Ray. Second. Second by Myers. I will now take the roll. Director Meek. Aye. Myers. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Ray. Aye. Williams. Aye. Weiniger. Aye. Passed six to zero. Thank you, Council Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Jacobs. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I know there are some others where we have about four or five word changes, so hopefully we will move quickly through those. Uh, JLDA, Student Mental Health Wellness Services in a School Setting, and JLDAR. Doctors uh, Crawford, Getz, and Smith. I won't put first names on them. <laughs> that sounds good. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, we're here to answer questions for you and just talk about some changes that we've made upon feedback we've received. And we just want to, you know, reiterate that we are really proud of this work that we did on this policy. Um, our our goal was to clarify for our community what our services are in schools and how we are very, very much um, excited and our, our goal is to be collaborating and partnering with parents. So that was the intent of these revisions that we made and we're happy to go through those as well and answer any of your questions. I, I think I would add one of the biggest um, pieces of feedback that we got was around the psychotherapy, um, I'm not even speaking very clearly, the psychotherapy <laughs> and the educational counseling. And we talked a long time about the difference of that. And to put it into simplest terms, it's really when our counselors, what their job is when they're hired. So we have a lot of counselors that are also like the LPC, but they're not hired to go to long-term therapeutic care for our kids. They're hired to do educational school counseling. So if a 
um, a, a counselor, teacher, parent believes that there is a lagging skill when it comes to mental health supports, they sign a consent so that then they would do short-term intervention for that student. So that was the biggest questioning feedback that we got around this policy. And that's really what we were trying to determine to make it clearer about the purpose of educational counseling as opposed to outside long-term therapy. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. And, and, and we see the cleanup in the yellow based on those. I, I would say of all the uh, input that I reviewed that was positive towards any changes of any policy, the first sentence statement is so concise and so, so clarifying that I believe it assuaged some concerns, whether perceptional or reality-based, um, with parents that, and of course we have exceptions for trauma and things like that, um, but of people that commented on all the policies, uh, my perception it was JLDA, JLDR, that, that made people, uh, specifically parents, feel comfortable um, with what was going on, which is already, uh, as I said multiple times, the gold standard uh, here in Douglas County. So with that, I'll open it up to any questions, uh, specifically looking at the, the, again, the yellow highlighted changes uh, in the second reading for any directors. Can we scroll up? Uh, uh, Mr. Blair, can you scroll uh, further down in the document? Do you have a particular place, uh, Director Ray? No, just, no, just, yeah, okay. there's good. Uh, right there, thank you. While other directors are formulating, um, again, I, I just like to thank you for your, your clarification. I know a lot of work was done by yourself and your staff on this, and I frankly have no questions on JLDA uh, with the changes you made for the second reading. And I know we'll take up JLDA R here in a second, but uh, uh, Superintendent Kane. Um, and just for clarification, um, I had put this in as superintendent updates. We did provide JLDA-R for informational purposes, but it is not, um, given the consensus of the board from the last meeting, um, JLDA-R, the staff did not find any legal requirement for JLDA-R to be owned by the Board of Education. Um, and so JLDA-R, as a regulatory, um, policy does not technically need to be passed by the Board of Education, understanding that we'll go back and clean up that exhibit B, G, underscore E. Director Ray. I hear that the only thing that's problematic is it currently is a board policy. Board policy. Unlike your ADBR, which was never a policy that the board owned, JLDA-R is a policy that the board currently owns. And I understand certainly legal counsel's um, recommendation, but that alone doesn't determine whether or not we retain authority over a policy. There's other policies that we don't use the legal criteria to decide if we should own it or not. It, we, we delegate policies that we no longer want to have authority over. So. I would differ um, in terms of, of that it's still a board policy that we need to talk about. If we want to formally decide to term to delegate that policy, then we should do that. But I think given that we've already done a first and second reading, it probably would behoove us to finish that process out. Um, and I would concur with Director. I was just making that note that Dash R is actually a board, so. Uh, we Go ahead, Director. So in the fourth paragraph, when we use about informed consent, there's a phrase we've used in other parts of this policy. Unless the student is otherwise authorized under state or federal law to seek such services on their own, I think that's in, I think that's in JLDAR. And I'm wondering, do we need to also just, is that, I mean, is that true, I guess, or has that changed that that there's that clause that says, unless the student is able to make the decision on their own. I mean, is that something that, <laughs> I'm, it's late and I'm truly really trying to articulate, I, I apologize, um, but I'm wondering if that terminology needs to be in this policy as well, that disclaimer. Sure, and, and we have it in the R to really, um, you know, put into place what is 
how do we implement our services and, and really demonstrate, and you'll see in that new revision, that we're delineating what is school practice and educational practice yeah. versus what happens in the medical and clinical setting. And so we have that delineated that, you know, if they're 18 and older and can do that for themselves. So you and don't then, feel it needs to be delineated in this policy because it's delineated in the regulatory policy? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, there were, there's a st I know that you, both of you did a great job at asking for our counselors and our mental health people to provide feedback. We had a pretty strong statement from a employee who is a mental health worker. And I'm just wondering, I, I don't know if she gave her input, but then was still not satisfied. She says this, she said, the foundation of a school counselor's relationship with a student is trust. And often students come to us to vent about topics they are not safe to share with their parents. If I begin calling every parent of every student I meet with, I promise you less students will visit my office. Fewer will feel safe to talk with me and fewer will receive the benefits of what school counselors provide. I fear the consequences of this policy. So that was uh, someone who is on our staff. And, and I think Director Meek asked this question, does this decrease our students' access to mental health support? Because this person evidently thinks it does. Does that make sense? Yeah, you want to start? I'll start. Okay. <laughs> um, absolutely not. So one of the things, this is something that I have talked with the counselors about because this, this is something that has come up. Um, our high school counselors in particular have hundreds of students that come into the office and or into their counseling um, programs. We're not talking about academic counseling. We're not talking about um, those one-offs when kids come in and they're having a bad day and go, we're talking about when those students, it's decided needs, need um, work on, on lagging skills that have to do with their mental health. That is a collaborative process with the parents and with the student. But uh, our kids come into the counseling office all the time because they need support through an incident. And if it's a, a safety issue, we have policies and procedures that we need to handle that. But our students are accessing the counselors a lot during the day. And we're not talking about consent in those cases. We're talking about if it's a specific intervention for a lagging skill that we need, that they need to access their academics and their social, right. emotional wealth. Well, and I have sorry. <laughs> both. I have such confidence in both of you. And Dr. Smith, I know you and I talked with our students about how guidance counselors are not there just to tell you about college opportunities and really getting our secondary counselors to really see the holistic part of what they provide. And so I, I trust you totally. I just was concerned if our employees are interpreting this as prohibitive, even with us saying, you know, using the number of one or two times. Um, they can, you know, that that's kind of the example we used to say beyond that, then all of a sudden it becomes um, something different. And, and I'm just always concerned that when we interpret that we don't do something that has a ripple effect that reduces access for our students. We even talked about the one or two times, and that's if a student's coming in one or two times with the same mental health concern that we really need to do some more teaching on. So I don't know if I love the one or two times, but the, you know, when you, when you get into that gray area, you've got to draw the line somewhere, but right. yeah. And the other question I have is parent. We, we reference parent in here, um, and I wonder if we need to define parent more broadly than just oh, God, yeah. a biological parent. Mm -hmm. Um, even just a statement that just says, a, you know, in this policy, the word parent can mean biological parent, adopted parent, legal guardian, or other adult person recognized as a child's primary caregiver. I, I just think, you know, that that might be language we need, especially as, as sensitive as this topic is, to identify beyond just the, what we think of as the biological parent. So I would... That's Somewhere, great. insert that. <laughs> yeah, would, would it be sufficient just in the first the declaratory statement to put in collaboration with parents, um, you know, parentheses or guardian or guardian slash primary caregiver? Yeah, or to just to list out the ones I've listed, because I think even guardian is different than designated primary caregiver. It, it certainly you know, is. So, yeah, um, do you, would you have a suggestion uh, for the expansion of that definition? 
I mean, I agree with where Director Peterson's going. I think, I think we can put a parenthesis after the word parents and just list uh, parent means, or this includes biological parent, adoptive parent, legal guardian, um, primary caregiver. I wouldn't have it. I mean. We have other policies where we haven't defined parents, so I think it's important for us to have a level of consistency in our yeah. policies um, and also to afford the staff some latitude in putting a regulation together which makes sense and where there's some consideration given to how to define parent for purposes of implementation purposes. Yeah, that, and that's... Sure. I'd be good with that. So uh, what I'm hearing is uh, in collaboration with parents, comma, as defined by law, comma. And I think for us, as long as that's the, the, the people that can legally give that informed consent, that's what we want to capture. Uh, agreed. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that's a good addition. Any other comments, concerns uh, from directors? Director Meek. Sure, I'm going to go back to the one or two time comment um, for the example. Um, I know we had a lot of questions at our DAC meeting on this, on this policy in particular, and there was a concern that it was rolling back services for students at a time when mental health is so critical. So on that paragraph where it ends with an example of this is when a student needs a one or two time consultation with the school's mental health staff. Do we need to provide that example? Do we need to say one or two time? Because I think by saying one or two time, you are potentially rolling back support. I don't, I don't know if I have a good response to that right now. I. I I worry a little bit that if we don't have a definition of, if a student's coming in and asking for support around the same lagging skill, how many times are they gonna do that before we sign consent? So do you have a- Right, I mean, I, I guess for us in our clarification, it is, it is not taking away students' access to our mental health staff, it is definitely not impacting the types of services and the skills that we're teaching. Um, the one to two time from the counselors, it was giving some structure to, you can see students without parent consent a few times, but when it becomes a pattern where it's clear that you have a skill that's needing to be developed, then we need to collaborate together with student, parent, guardian, and the counselor to determine what that is and provide those consistent short-term services to meet a goal so that they can develop well, both educationally and socially, to access their education. And so it was more to say, you have some leeway to figure that out, and then you need to really put into place some very high-quality services for those students. And that's where, that's where I interpreted that, and that was the intention for writing that. Yeah, I think it being an EG statement, not an IE statement, it's just providing an example, so. Mm -hmm. So I believe the only actual <laughs> recommended change we have, uh, just, to, just to keep score right now, is the addition of the, uh, the clause as defined by law after parents in the very first sentence. So go ahead, Director Ray. So, um, Eighth paragraph, if I'm counting correctly, um, has a statement of efforts will be made to notify parents before meeting with students unless the severity of the trauma or the number of students impacted make this impractical. Um, I am wondering, isn't there also a clause where we say that if notifying the parent it would be detrimental to the student's health? I mean, isn't that something that 
our counselors and mental health providers have to subscribe to as well. So wouldn't that be in addition to um, that condition, which again, uh, if you scroll down, it's, it's the paragraph that starts out with in the case of crisis or trauma. Yeah, it's, it's the... Nope, I'm sorry. It's Keep going down, Mr. Blair. It's in the next page. Right yeah, there, that's yeah. the one that's coming up. And if you keep going down, I, I think, Director Ray, in my mind, it was covered by the following paragraph. This policy should not be interpreted to conflict with obligations, district mental health providers. And I would say everyone that's a mandatory reporter, if you're in a mandatory reporting situation where you believe the uh, student's health was endangered, that would trump all of this because we're all mandatory reporters. It, it, but uh, please comment if you think we need additional language. My suggestion was that if it's not just mandatorily reporting child abuse, but if a right. child comes to me and reports to me something that if their parents knew would be detrimental to the child's health, which I think is kind of a part of the immunity clause for our mental health workers, that they can still consult with that child without notifying the parent first. It's a safety concern, right. So that, I just, I just uh, wondered if that language needs to be inserted to give our counselors the permission to know that I may be talking with this child and I'm not out of compliance with this policy if the child truly feels like that I need to talk to someone and if you notify my parents, it may be detrimental to my health. Does that make sense? Well, it, it does. And um, we see that if it's detrimental or it's it could cause harm, then we are going to report that as a mandatory okay. reporter and put in those supports of how do we then support that student and make sure that they don't have harm come to them. And so that would be a part of our credentials that we must do okay. that and our ethics that we, our first and foremost ethics is to do no harm. Good. So you, so so you don't feel like that needs to be stated, that our professionals don't need to have that reassurance in our policy that they have the, the liberty to be able to meet with a child, even if it may not surface to the level of a child abuse report. It may be that the child just is terrified about going home for some reason. Um, yeah, but I you feel like it's covered? I think that we feel that perfect. covers that. All right. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. All right. Motion to approve the policy with the one amendment of as defined by law in the first paragraph. We have a mo we have a motion by Director Williams as stated. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Myers. I will take the roll. Meek. Aye. Myers. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Ray. Aye. Williams. Aye. Weiniger. Aye. Passed seven to zero. Thank you, doctors. Thank you. Proper gets and Kelly Smith. Thank you. you still plan to do JLDA R? Uh, or was yes, that we okay. do because we will have to vote on JLDA R as well. Thank okay. you. If we can bring up JLDA R, which I believe does not have any changes since the first revision, if I'm correct. We did make one. We did make an addition. Okay. And we just cleaned up some language for clarification based on feedback. Yep, I see it now. So the changes here were just cleaning up that we were consistent in JLDA with RR, with our educational counseling language. So we, we got that feedback and we thought that was great feedback. And then if you continue to go to the bottom, we did add a part about how we, um, we may refer students and families to outside services upon request and and what that looks like and how that's different than school services. Yeah, Mr. Blair, if you can just keep going down, it's right before the end uh, about referral to outside behavioral health agencies. Right there, thank you. And it keeps going a little bit onto the next page. Mm -hmm. There we go. And, and I think that's clarifying with the the CRS in the, in the law here in Colorado, knowing that we're not going to do that in here, but we may make a referral outside because that's not services that we provide as the school district. Yes, and the feedback that we had received was, you know, what is the difference with that statute 
versus what we follow educationally as far as educational law. So we wanted to really put that in so that parents understood that absolutely if, you're, if your child has the ability to seek medical or clinical care, that they can do that in our state if they're 12 and up per these criteria met. Director Ray. Section general information to parents and guardians. Um, I believe it's above where you are right now. Right there, yeah, please, thank you. Um, we're in parentheses, it says, unless the student is otherwise authorized under state or federal law to seek such services on their own, uh, to take out his or her, since we have students that are non-binary. Um, so I would just ask for the their, as opposed to his or her. I think that's great. I think we could agree on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion of JLDAR with the uh, change in the reference that Director Ray just noted? Do we have a motion regarding JLDAR with the change that Director Ray noted? Yeah, I move to accept JLDAR with the latest additions. And thank you for, for clarifying that. Uh, we have a motion by Director Meek. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Myers. I will now take the roll. Meek? Aye. My Myers? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weiniger? Aye. Six to zero. Now, thank you, Dr. Getz and Smith. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Director Peterson? Do we want to have the discussion that Superintendent Kane um, recommended that we look at delegating this to under her authority or is <laughs> at 1.30 in the morning? Um, or do we want to just bookmark that and have that as a later I, I, discussion? I think we'll bookmark it because, again, at the retreat, we tend to have this broad discussion on who has responsibility for which ones are priorities and things like that. Uh, moving into uh, some that have smaller changes, uh, policy IJ, uh, textbook and instructional materials selection and adoption. Good evening, Board of Directors. Good evening, Board of Directors. Eric Mason, Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. All right, and Matt Reynolds, Learning Services Officers. We're, we're here to answer any questions that you may have. And Mr. Blair, if you can just scroll down, we had uh, there we go. This is a uh, rather short one, and I, a lot of it was moving away from the legacy language of world-class education, uh, moving to the Colorado academic standards, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I have no questions uh, fr from the first reading. Other directors? Sorry. No, go ahead, Director A. <laughs> yeah, I'm not really not. <laughs> So um, we reference Colorado academic standards in this one, but then in the other policy that you will be discussing, you talk about Colorado essential skills. So I'm wondering why, why not just um, use Colorado academic standards consistently because Colorado essential skills, as my understanding, are now embedded in the academic standards. So I, I guess I'm acknowledging that we have put that in this policy and, and possibly bookmarking that discussion for the next policy to clean that one up accordingly, uh, if that's okay. Yes, and, and really, um, when people use terms like 21st century skills, sometimes they're used in general terms, but in terms of curriculum and standards, they're very, very specific because they used to be called 21st century right. skills in relation to standards. So we tried to match the language as best we could sure. in terms of what's aligned to standards and what's just a general term. Are you okay with using both or do you feel like if we just use CAS as our reference point that that will cover it? It depends on the context. Okay. Um, and we can talk about that when we get to that right. specific section. And the only other thing, again, the CASB issue. So IJ really is kind of the mother policy, according to CASB, for um, instructional 
resources and materials in textbook and instructional materials are incorporated under CASB's policy, the IJ policy, so it's really a policy that encompasses both those. And so again, I don't know, it's just again, um, it's that alignment piece for me that I think is gonna be problematic um, to have this be IJ. CASB doesn't actually call out textbook selections separate from the instructional resources materials. They, they include that as part of the process, part of the policy, because the textbook and um, instructional materials are also instructional resources of materials. So I don't know if it's a time for us to try to clean that up so that, again, we're in alignment um, as opposed to IJC, which I think is the older policy that we're about to discuss. So. I just put that out there as a, again, a need to clean and align. So I, that's that's to all of you. <laughs> it's not necessarily to Mr. Reynolds. Yeah, and, yeah again, and uh, Mason. Sorry. And, and again, I think I think we'll get to uh, a, a pretty large alignment with the audit uh, with the retreat this summer, and and hopefully we'll identify inconsistencies across the board where we have. Uh, some Casby, Casby naming inconsistencies, but uh, I think there's some content. I guess, I'm yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah. I know, I know it's a content thing of of is the is there a mismatch? Well, yeah, like yeah. IJC has instructional materials, and it's really primarily about parent access. Um, where um, so it, it it is a mix match, but even it's, it, the title is not necessarily reflective of um, of the policy, and that's. IJC, which is a later policy to be discussed. Um, I know we're tired, but I think I feel str more strongly about the IJA policy being cleaned up than, than these two, but I just think it's it's worth doing in the future. So yeah, okay. I will hold my comments until IJA. Yeah, and I, and I agree. So li just limiting it to IJ as presented with the changes, do we have any more comments or questions around IJ? Motion to approve IJ. Motion to approve IJ as submitted by Williams. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Ray. I'll take the roll. Meek? Aye. Myers? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weininger? Aye. Six to zero. Moving into IJA, which is the selection of controversial learning resources. Thank you, Mr. Blair. And right to your Colorado Essential Skills versus 21st Century Skills. And then we have a reference to both, first CES, then CAS. Questions, comments from directors? Do you feel like that's, do you, do you feel like that is the way it should be stated, or should we, are we confusing people by using both of those simultaneously? Um, so I'll, I'll give my answer and then Erica can weigh in as well. Um, looking at how we took this um, policy, we wanted to replace it with the language that's currently being utilized within our standards. So they've taken 21st century skills out and put Colorado essential skills in there. So as best we could, we were trying to match the intention of what the existing policy was asking for. So we did a replacement of the language being used. Now, in looking at what was the 21st century skills and now essential skills, they serve two different purposes in the original bill that was passed back in 08. And so we wanted to maintain what we thought was the intent. I'm not sure I really have strong feelings one way or the other because they're incorporated one inside right. the other. So, right. I, I think I think the only thing that I would add is I agree that the context is important here. So maybe we were to call out the Colorado Academic Standards with the embedded essential skills. Sure. Sounds like a great compromise. <laughs> so within that context is the intent of the board, the critical thinking, and 
Colorado academic skills within the Colorado academic standards, or what is I think your? I said with it, with embedded. Colorado essential central skills. skills embedded in the Colorado academic exactly. standards. Thank yes. you. Any other director comments, uh, questions, concerns? So, Director Peterson, I'm. Um, so, this is the one that I think. Um, needs to be aligned. IJA is actually an obsolete code comparatively to other districts as well as CASB, they use IMB. And the reason that makes sense is that we actually have an IMBB that talks about exemption from required instruction. So it kind of flows that we talk about controversial learning experiences and then we flow it with IMBB that talks about exemptions. So I would just advocate that we recode this to um, IMB. And Mr. Reynolds, do you have any comments, concerns with that? No, I, I think I agree with the alignment, especially at 1.30 in the morning. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have a uh, recoding of IMB, same title, and then we have that it, it, it insertion of Colorado Central Skills embedded within the Colorado Academic Standards, be taught, uh, et cetera. Director Weininger. Um, when we change these, so if they're cross-referenced in another um, policy, we don't have to like change that policy, just the cross reference. Uh, not, not tonight, we will go in the policy cleanup and look at cross-references, and yes, that'll be part of the, the policy review this summer. And you have to vote on a new policy for cross-references, like if you update it, does that make sense? Like say this one's cross-referenced in another policy, we have to look at that policy it's cross-referenced in and yeah. revise it and change it. Oh my gosh, okay. Well. There's, a, there's a find and search window that you use. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions, concerns with uh, this particular policy, controversial learning resources? So I move that we approve this, uh, approve I move that we recode policy IJA as IMB, selection of controversial learning resources with the edited insertions as discussed. Motion. Motion by Ray, do we have a second? Second. Second by Meek. Roll call, Meek. Aye. Myers. Aye. Peterson, aye. Ray. Aye. Williams. Um, I'm going to be an aye, but I just want to really caution us on how much we change policy lettering tonight because we do have to go back, like Director Weiniger said, and literally change and acknowledge all the other policies it touches. So I would just really encourage us to be careful on doing all that. And your vote is? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Aye. Uh, Weiniger? Um, I do not want any more coding changes, so I'm just going to be a no. <laughs> Okay, no, and that is five to one as voted. And then the last of the I series, Mr. Blair, if you can, IJC. Director, questions, comments? So my only comment is this is exactly why I think Director Meek was advocating for us to put this on our <laughs> canceled meeting just because we're, we're exhausted, staff is exhausted, and, and now we're just making haphazard decisions without um, thorough discussion and thought. So anyway, I'm, because of that, I'm just going to not say anything because I'm, I know we're all tired. Other directors, comments, concerns on IJC? I think it looks good. Motion to approve IJC. Second. I have a motion by Williams, a second by Myers. Um, literally the only changes are objections to concerns. Okay. I'll take the roll. Director Meek. Aye. Myers. Aye. 
Peterson, aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weininger? Aye. Six to zero. And then moving into the final stretch, uh, ADB, student wellness, the second reading. I'm sorry, uh, ADF. I say ADB. So the changes with this one, um, there weren't that many. We added the um, intentional integration of academic, not academic, social, emotional, and behavioral wellness. That behavioral piece um, is the, the biggest change here. And if you scroll down, you can see where we talked about the integrated multi-tiered system of support um, and being intentional about integrating those pieces together in our academics. So identical to the first reading, correct? Yes. Any questions, comments regarding ADF, the second reading? Director Ray. I had asked a question through Superintendent Kane if this policy, the way it's written, complies with the federal law on national school lunch program. I don't know if, if I don't know if staff's had a chance to, to d ponder that or look at that. Um, when I look at the law, I see a lot of things that are missing, but I'm not a legal analyst, but um, so my question is, does this comply with the federal law on the national lunch program? So I, I did Google search that today and didn't see where the disconnect would have been. Can you be more specific on what? Yeah, I mean, there's just a whole slew of um, requirements that if you're part of the, the national lunch program, that your policy should include specific goals and, um, you know, and, and the goals are pretty specific in terms of what is being reflected. Um, even talks about the, the um, time to review this policy and, and gives some constraints along those lines. Um, so here's what I would suggest. <laughs> if we could, can we at least postpone this policy until we've given legal counsel a chance to, to look at the federal national lunch program requirements? Because I just think this is the time for us to, to a lot, you know, again, comply with that program. So I, I might make a motion unless Ms. Klimish has comments. Well, of course, we're happy to do whatever the board requests of us, but um, I'm not certain that there were any revisions to the requirements under federal law made since 2019, and this was last approved by the board in 2019. And, and the policy also does require that the district will comply with all of the requirements in the federal school lunch program. So I don't think there's any suggestion in this policy that would um, indicate that the district is not presently complying with all federal requirements. And it's not requirements, but in, in the federal law, there's a state, this statement, at a minimum, local school wellness policy must contain, then it'll list all the following things that the local school policy must contain. And you're absolutely right, Ms. Clemish, we updated this in 2019. We did it though for a different reason. We, we did it because we wanted to make sure physical, social, emotional were included and not just a policy about the nutrition program. Um, and so we didn't take the time to go back and really look at federal law. So my motion would be that we would postpone the approval of this policy until June 20th um, and to give staff an opportunity to review that a little bit more with in reference to the lunch, the national lunch program law. We have a motion by Director Ray to postpone uh, discussion and vote on uh, policy ADF student wellness until the meeting on 20 July, 2023. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Meek. <clears throat> Sorry. I just wanted to yeah. add that ADF-R is very specific with respect to implementation requirements. So there is a regulatory policy. It's a superintendent file policy, which I'm assuming likely includes those requirements with respect to compliance with federal law. 
And I, just for me, it would be good for us to take the time to take a look at ADF-R side by side with ADF, just, just to make sure our I's are dotted and T's are crossed. Okay. We're happy to do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Director. We have a motion on the floor. Any further discussion on the motion to postpone? I'll take the roll. Director Meek? Aye. Myers? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weininger? No. Weininger is a no. Uh, postponement till July 2023 is passed. Um, excuse, 20 June 2023. Thank you. July would be bad. Uh, passed 5 to 1. And we have our last... Uh, next to last item because we have 26, 33 proposed revisions to policy KBB. Uh, second reading. Thank you for bringing it up, Mr. Blair. Um, if we can just go down to the SACPI standards. Again, these SACPI standards are simply updating the 2018 language to the 2021 language. I did notice we got a lot of comments uh, in from folks that wanted to uh, change wordsmith, add, edit the SACPI language. I didn't think that was appropriate. So that's just literally a cut and paste um, from the 2021 latest SACPI standards under welcoming all families into the school community, um, et cetera, all the way through that. The only additions and changes to the policy other than updating the SACPI standards start, if you can scroll down, Mr. Blair, under parental rights and expectations. And with that, I will open it up uh, to board members' discussion around any additions. Director Meek. Sure. Um, just a on the very first paragraph, I think there's a comma at the end, and it should be a period, just a grammatical change sure. since we're going in and making edits. Um, under the parental rights and expectations, um, I, I know I mentioned this last time, I don't think this belongs in this policy without having a student rights included. And so I have student right language that I would like to propose, however, I still don't think it really belongs in here. We should have a rights policy where we list all of our stakeholders. So I would just like to ask others, are you open to having a separate policy that actually goes into rights and expectations before we start wordsmithing this? Yeah, yeah I think we had this discussion last time, or I recall it, when uh, during the first reading in I'll just restate that this is the parental engagement, thus parent rights were included here, but I'll also restate that I am not opposed to having student rights in a different policy uh, or stakeholder rights somewhere else. Yeah, so this policy is about partnerships. I mean, that's, that's the policy. Partnerships would include all of the partners. <laughs> so if you're gonna list rights for one set of individuals, I think you need to add rights for others. But let me just ask a couple questions first. Um, second paragraph, DCSD supports open communication and disclosure of information concerning their children's health, identity, and education, um, so on. What does it mean by identity? I would say basically as identified uh, or as defined in uh, ADB, if a child's identifying as, and again, we, this goes down to disaggregation of data. We have some children that identify as one race, as a different race, some identify as multi-race. Um, that information should certainly um, be available to the parent upon their request or any way they're identifying uh, per that other definition of identity. Yeah, and I think we get so hung up talking about identities, thinking it means, you know, one small little thing. It's infinite, right? I mean, religion, political affiliation, thinking styles, um, appearance. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Are we asking the district teachers to disclose 
every aspect of a child's identity to the parent. Like, I'm trying to understand what we are asking here. What we're asking, in my opinion, is just that it's, it's around transparency, just saying the district will not, um, will just be open and transparent around any concerns because it says information concerning um, their child, uh, health identity education. So if there's any concerns the district should have or if there's any information they believe the parent should know that they would communicate that. I'm not, I'm not sure if that answers your, your question. Or yeah, I'm just trying to get to the bottom of what we're asking for in this policy. So, for example, if a student, um, I, I don't know, I'm trying to understand at what level teachers are supposed to report back to, to parents aspects of a student's identity unrelated to the education, right? Um, so I would get teachers would report back a student is having challenges in class for this reason or that reason, something to do with their education. But this is saying identity, so I'm just trying to understand what we're trying to say here. Yeah, if you're hung up on the word identity, I could just leave it as children's health and education if you think that's clear, because obviously that concerns physical health, safety, mental well-being, mental health, all those other things, again, which are you know, something that a parent would be concerned with. I think that makes more sense. Um, on the very first sentence where it says, um, parents, guardians have the right to raise their children as they see fit. Can you explain? Yeah, that's- Where does that language come from? And what say, does it mean? Yeah, I would say it is referred to often in cases involving the 14th Amendment and Equal Protection Clause. It's something that's certainly been discussed at the Supreme Court level, and it's just res recognizing the role of parents and guardians to raise their children, I mean, explicitly as it says there. And we support parents' constitutional rights. Okay, so what I would like to add are the student rights. So. All students in the district have a right, one, to learning environments in which they feel accepted and valued, regardless of race, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, disability, or any other aspect of their identity. Two, to instructional materials that include a broad range of people, places, and perspectives. Three, to teachers and administrators that encourage all students to reach their full potential regardless of identity or background. Four, to the freedom to learn true history, including the struggles and contributions of different communities and our country's successes and mistakes. This helps students avoid repeating mistakes and construct a brighter future for all of us. And five, to an education that is free from censorship so that they can receive an education that prepares them to be knowledgeable citizens, consistent good members of their community, and effective leaders. So I'd like to add the student rights section to this policy. Director Williams. Um, I, I actually don't support adding student rights to this specific policy for the same reasons you stated earlier, President Peterson. This is a parent and family engagement policy, and I uh, would be happy to entertain student rights in a different policy, but I don't think it belongs here. I thought that was your hand. Yeah. Are, are you asking for no, that? Yeah, oh, okay. I just, um, I just have some comments. Yeah, and in, in and, response, but yeah, and, and and I agree with Director Williams again. Um, this is around the parent engagement and the family engagement, not in necessarily the engagement of the student or student rights. Again, I believe that what you stated has an appropriate role and place in policy, uh, but I don't believe it's in this policy. So I would support uh, those additions or similar additions in some other. Um, one of our other policies that's more student-centric. And I actually believe the policy ADB that was passed uh, by a majority of the board earlier tonight actually went to a lot of those uh, items about representation, regardless of identity, et cetera. Other director's comments? Director Ray. So, so this is another example of um, 
The reason that we're going off the rails with this policy is because we are not grounding ourselves in, first of all, in the statute of why this policy was created, nor are we grounding ourselves back to CASB in terms of the model policy that they presented. Um, I, I'm really confused of all the policies we've talked tonight, why this policy was delegated to, to you, Director Peterson, to provide revisions and that no staff were, uh, that it was not delegated to staff like all the other policy revisions we have. And the reason I ask that is because to me, this policy is, is owned by our DAC um, because that's what statute says. Statute says the board shall work with the parent members of the DAC in creating, adopting, reviewing, and implementing this policy. Um, that's the law. Um, this, I was watching again the board meeting, and, and Director Peterson, you were on to something when you were asking the question, well, why is this KBB and CASB has a KB policy? Well, the reason is that when we developed this policy, Director Lung, um, Stacy Rader, um, I think Council Jacobs too, uh, Director Lung sat on the SACPI board. I mean, he was actually, you know, um, helping develop this, uh, this law. And we were ahead of the game in terms of creating our engagement policy. That's where this original policy came from. Um, you will see that our policy was 2018. If you look at CASB's model policy, it was 2021. So that's why there's two different versions is because we were ahead of the game. We came out, we worked with our DAC, we worked with the legal counsel to create our engagement, the, the, the original engagement policy. And so where we're going off the rails is, because, is that we're not grounding ourselves back to the intent of the law behind an engagement policy. And the intent was to make sure that we worked with our DAC to produce such a policy. So, and this is what engagement sounds like. Consult and encourage parents and families to share in school district planning, help parents and families understand the educational process, inform of school choices. Those are, those are statements about engagement, not constitutional rights. And that's where I think we've gone off the rails is that for some reason, I think you felt, Director Peterson, this was a place to insert that constitutional right. I don't think we're the authority of parenting. I don't think we should be telling parents that you can raise your child as you see fit. I don't think that's our responsibility. But you're right, there's constitutional rights that are given to parents, but that's the Constitution. We're, we are about board policy, about aligning to state statute. And so I would just tell you this policy really is, is out of whack um, compared to what it was, should be. And I would, I would motion that we, again, that we postpone any revisions to this policy until it has been properly reviewed by our DAC, our SACs, aligned with CASB's model, model policy, and ample time provided for community and staff feedback. Is that a motion? That is a motion. Second. We have a motion by Director Ray as stated. We have a second. Um, by me, discussion of the motion to postpone. I'll go ahead and say um, I did not intend, that's the discussion on KB versus KBB and everything was I looked at the model CASB policy and it seemed to be completely disjointed from this. So I said, okay, let's not rename KB in this case because they, they are not, the, the same subject matter, so. Uh, they are the same, I would say they're the same subject matter, but I think but it's, they're it's very, for, because it has SACPI right, standards right. in it, just like ours, but it just, your insertion of parents' rights and expectations, you're right, it's not Correct, close. Right, which, is, <laughs> which is why uh, retain KBB. Um, my intent here was to reestablish uh, parent voice and decisions, which I believe was lost, uh, largely during COVID, hybrid learning, things like that. And if you move to the listed number ones, it is just a reiteration of things that are covered in other place. And like we did in policy KE, when we revised policy parent um, concerns and complaints, we kind of gave a rubric, or I, I know you hit that word, we kind of gave a mapping or a linking, linkage 
to where the macro concept of parents have the right to opt in or opt out in certain areas and not just make the blanket statement, uh, but to go into where those things may apply in other policies. So rather than parents, again, using the KE uh, reference, um, there's all types of complaints, but then there are some complaints that go down ADA trails. There are some complaints that go down um, uh, different other trails. So the attempt was to say, yes, you as a parent have a right to opt in, opt out. Here are the specific maps of the things involving instructional materials. Um, to give a little bolster of, sure, you can opt out of standardized testing, but that doesn't help us. And then to go a little bit further and leave a uh, option here for the superintendent to determine any future opt-in, whatever that may be, um, for selected curriculum, if there ever is an opt-in uh, thing. The values and beliefs, again, is a, restoring, a restatement and a restoring, I believe, of the parent's role. And then the last one is just a summary of what we talked about with JLDA and JLDR, that we support transparency around mental health, we support parental consent, except in the cases called out there. So it was really just to um, assuage parents that they have a unique role in this partnership. Um, it is different than our educators, but it is complementary to what our educators are doing in support of the students. Again, that was the attempt here, and I thought it is absolutely necessary in this district based on things that happened mainly during COVID pandemic and a, and a potential deprivation of parents' rights in determining certainly health decisions for their students, uh, but also academics. So that, again, that was my intent here. Uh, Director Myers. Can I make a motion for the question? I mean, understanding what we're, I mean, there was a motion Right. So there is a motion to postpone, as stated by Director Ray, and is, is um, as uh, seconded by Director Meek. And my response to that was, um, I don't see a, you know, I don't see oh, a reason okay. to postpone. Can that, I that motion was the to part. vote then? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're having um, a discussion. Yeah. On okay. Director. Yeah. Director something. Meek. Something worth adding. So I'm going to read from the district accountability website page. The DAC meets monthly throughout the year and makes recommendations to the board regarding spending, direct, spending district money, charter school applications, improvement plans, and parent engagement plans. The committee's members also make recommendations for areas and issues of study as well as teacher and principal. They are tasked to be engaged in exactly this policy <laughs> legally as well. And they have been excluded and they have asked to be part of this process. So I just need to reiterate that as we are contemplating our vote on whether we want to postpone this policy or not. And assuming positive intent that we are working to put parent voice in here, how can you do that without including the committee that we task to give us recommendations from the parents. And Director Ray. Yeah, and, and I would just say, Dr. Peter, I don't disagree with your rationale for, and your passion for amplifying parent voice, and um, it just, it doesn't fit with a statutorily required policy that, if anything, Ms. Rausch should be the one that is owning this policy, because this is her bailiwick. In terms of engagement, she's the designated person that statutes requires us to identify that coordinates the resources. And like Director Meek said, it's required that we talk to DAC about this, not just unilaterally say, well, we're going to insert this because I need to put it somewhere because it didn't happen in the past. It doesn't belong here. Is um, is what I'm trying to convey, but I, I I completely appreciate your rationale for wanting something to be said about parent voice. Director Myers, Director Meek, or uh, Matt, M Mr. Reynolds, we have another meeting, DAC meeting in June. Before the meeting in uh, before the next board meeting, is that? Uh, would that give time then, do you believe, for DAC to have input? 
I mean, there are no more SAC meetings, though, correct? No. So they won't have an input. And I'll modify my motion to just stay DAC um, based on if that is possible. Because statute, the statute requires DAC. It doesn't require SACs. And I know we don't have it on our agenda, but is that something we can do for DAC? Uh, thank you for the question. Whatever you all ask for, um, we'll make it happen. Yeah, I, I would say since they have asked to be included and have a voice, that we can extend the meeting time and if we need to. And I think it would go a long way towards building a bridge with the DAC moving forward. So I'm gonna say I'm okay with that. <laughs> okay, and knowing that we also had the survey input as well, which we would merge with that of DAC, because uh, we did get a good bit of input on KBB, um, some for, some against, everything in the middle, so I would merge that with those. With that, we have a motion on the floor, as stated by Director Ray, and then amended to postpone, and if I may offer a friendly minute, uh, postpone to a later meeting date, uh, if or postpone to 20 July, pending DAC input. June. I'm sorry, June. June. I just want it to be July. Uh, if that's acceptable to Director Ray and then seconded by Director Meek. Yeah, just, uh, I'll just restate, postpone any revisions to this policy until it has been properly reviewed by DAC um, at a time specific to June 20th. Okay, as stated, and the second stands. Okay, we'll now take the roll. Director Meek. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Peterson, aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weiniger? Aye. Six to zero as stated, and we will move to our final event um, regarding policy, which is JLCDC, and it is only a first reading, no action taken. Sure, I'll be able to provide a little bit of information if you're okay if I sit here to do that this evening. Okay, very good. Um, so a policy JLCDC is titled Medically Necessary Treatment in School Settings. This is a requirement that comes out of House Bill 221260 uh, that was signed in June of 2022. Um, it is, so it is a requirement of Colorado law that we have a policy in place by July 1st of 2023. Um, and so, um, this is a first reading of the policy that addresses how a student um, who has an order or a recommendation from a qualified health care provider called a private health care um, provider specialist that the student receive medical, medically necessary treatment in the school setting as required by federal and state laws, including Section 504 in the Americans with Disabilities Act. The intention of the law is to improve access to medically necessary treatments for children to have meaningful access to the benefits of public education. So this is a first reading of that. You will see the definitions in terms of medical medically necessary treatment, private health care specialists, the notification of rights of parents in this regard, and then the process for determination in regards to who makes the decision around the medically necessary treatment, which is essentially the IEP team's decision and or 504 team's decision. Uh, the policy then also outlines um, uh, access to the school setting in accordance with other policies in terms of uh, ensuring that any medically medical professional does also have obligations around uh, background checks, visitor policies, et cetera. And then there is an appeal um, process that's outlined in the policy as well um, if there is a disagreement with the IEP team or 504 team's decision around the medically necessary treatment. So if um, you have questions or feedback between now and the June meeting, that would be really helpful. Um, the, the team that was involved in the development of this policy, it was based on CASB's model policy, and it was done in collaboration with our special education director consortium that meets on a regular basis, so they interact frequently on policy um, 
implementation and how districts are navigating that. Our directors of special education, as well as our director of health, wellness, and prevention, and other special education uh, team members were involved in the development of this policy in, um, with also our general um, legal counsel. And just real quick question, so for all the people that are still up there listening, uh, could you just give us a good example of uh, something that would qualify as a uh, medically necessary treatment, an example of, of what this would look like? So an example would be if a student receives ABA therapy mm -hmm. um, through a medical provider that the ABA therapist, if it's determined that that treatment is necessary for the student to access their education by the IEP team, they would be able to provide that treatment within the school setting. And for those that don't know what ABA is, it's for people with ASD, but... right. It's a treatment for yeah um, our students who are have autism, most often, but not exclusively for students with autism. Cor correct. So, good example. Any other questions by uh, directors? Uh, questions, comments, Director Meek. Yeah, mine's really just about process, and are we going to forward this out with a Google form where people can submit feedback? Just curious, I, I just want to make sure, given the time of year it is, what that process looks like. We would continue to follow the same process that the Board of Education has been following since uh, 2019, unless the Board of Education directs otherwise. So I would just comment that this is a beautiful example of process. Legislation changes, validates the need for a policy to be created. You have consulted with experts. It's been vetted by our legal counsel. It's been aligned to our CASB model policies. This is, this is how it's supposed to happen. Um, so I would just say it's beautiful. Um, and I would certainly accept this as our first reading and look forward to approving it at our next meeting because I know there's a deadline that it must be done by July 1st of 2023. So um, thank you for that. And uh, to echo Director Ray's comments, uh, the deadline is noted. So we will take this up for a second reading and a vote on, on June 20th. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. And moving into item number 35. The President's Report, Board of Education regular meeting is scheduled for 20 June. Agenda planning for 20 June is scheduled for Thursday, 8 June at 10.30 a.m. Uh, talked a lot about graduation attendance. I'd like to call out one particular student speaker, Isabel Melton, who delivered an incredible address about her experience and choice in DCSD at the EC, uh, EDCSD uh, graduation. Um, it, was, it was basically a paid public announcement for choice uh, within the district. So I hope our comms team has recorded that and can reproduce it with royalties. Uh, last thing I'll say is Director, uh, Superintendent Kane and I had uh, the privilege of going to the district mental health meeting and had an opportunity to thank our school psychologists and so social workers and just like law enforcement, they're on call 24 seven. They're always on the job. They don't get any downtime. And when things happen in our district, they have to come in and be the calm in the storm that our students and, and uh, employees are facing. So it was an incredible privilege to go in and get to briefly thank them for all the hard work that they did over the year. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Vice President Williams uh, for Vice President Items. I will be very quick. Thank you everyone for staying. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your dedication to the district, truly. Um, also happy summer to all of our staff and students. Um, hope you have a good one and congratulations to all the graduates this year. Uh, Director Meek and then down to Director Ray. Sure, um, graduations were amazing. Thank you all for all the extra work that you put in. I know it's a ton of work, but it's also worth it you know, seeing the students. So I just want to share, um, I shared with all of the board members um, following the DAC meeting. I mean, it, it was a pretty emotionally charged meeting on many levels. And I don't need to rehash it. I've brought it up um, repeatedly this evening. But there was another topic that I, I did share with all of you. 
with frustration around the CART process, the charter review team. And so I just want to flag that um, for all of us for a conversation in the future. Um, when we hear that our committee members are frustrated and feeling like they're the, just there to check a box, you know, we need to have conversations around that. So I don't know if that's maybe another topic for a future meeting or a retreat, but I think it's definitely worthy of us spending some time on that. And then um, lastly, the board vacancy process. Um, I've been thinking about that because we have summer coming up as well, and there is a 60-day deadline to appoint someone. And so I think thinking through what that process looks like so we can get going on it sooner rather than later. And ideally, if we could get someone named um, in time to be part of a retreat, that would be really ideal. But I think it's worthy of discussion. Yeah, thank you, Director Meek. Um, Assistant Secretary Brockman is still uh, getting director availability for retreat dates, things in the summer. So as soon as we get that in, we'll have some proposed dates. Uh, just a brief side discussion with uh, Council Klamesh. Um, we will have to declare officially a vacancy at the next meeting. Uh, we will do that. It'll be on the agenda for June 20th, and that'll trigger the process. I will also ask the superintendent to have council provide us with a uh, memo summary of the dates and times. As you mentioned, there's at the end of all of this, there's a 60-day window, but there are smaller windows before that in terms of uh, public awareness, accepting applications, et cetera. But uh, we will ask uh, Council Klamesh via the superintendent uh, to provide a summary of what that process needs to be in the timeline. And, and once we have that as a board via memo, uh, again, we will officially declare a vacancy at the next meeting as required and then go forward with whatever the timeline is. So thank you. Yeah, I just wonder if it's worth us thinking through it a little bit if we really are trying to fill a seat in a certain timeline that is, you know, by the end of June, ideally, because I think July people are, that's like the month we all probably have various commitments in. And so if that is the case, even if we publicly say our intent is <laughs> to try to figure out a timeline where we would have someone in place. I don't know if that's realistic or not. I'm looking at Director Ray because I think you've been through this before. Okay. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, statute kind of drives the timelines. I mean, we do have a policy that talks about this, but there's also very specific statute that also gives us. I don't know that we have the liberty to be able to say um, to take the liberty to um, adjust. Um, what I don't know is whether it's, we always get in the debate of 60 business days or 60 calendar days, um, and that can change the timeline as well. So, but I, I think because the statute is absent or does not specifically state, I think there is a place where we could probably um, help be more flexible if we said it was business days that we are basing our timeline on. If we're, if we're trying to stretch the process out so we're not hitting July when there's not people uh, available to actually do the interviews. So I, uh, that's the only latitude I really see that we might have. But I would also defer to um, uh, Council Clemish too, as she looks through that statute specific to give us advice about what it is we need to, to do. Um, so. Uh, Director Ray, do you just want to finish up with any sure. comments you have and then we'll Yeah, I mean, I, 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 this has been a hard meeting for me. Um, you know, we, we, we watched a servant to the public for three, almost four years, get up and walk out of this meeting. And, and we haven't said anything about the service that she commit, that she has given to this district. And so... And, I, and I'm just so wiped right now, I can't even begin to, to articulate that. But we had, we had an incredible board member in, in Director Hansen, and I'm deeply saddened that uh, she felt like she had no other option but to, uh, to resign. 
and the reasons she gave, I will tell you, I echo uh, many of the reasons that she gave. It's, it's hard to come to these meetings. Um, uh, and I've been in this district for almost 35 years. Um, and, and so I just think that if we continue to bury stuff without really dealing with the issues that she articulated well, we just continue to do this. Um, we, we, we just get into this automatic pilot where it's not genuine and where it's not authentic. And so I would just say that um, I, I mostly want to just express what an incredible board member Elizabeth Hansen has been to this board, to our district, and has truly made a difference to what happens with children. She's, I know no other person that has a bigger heart for staff than, than Director Hansen. And so I, I just feel like it's odd that we just carry on as business as usual and don't take the time to really understand why that occurred and that we don't take the time to celebrate her accomplishments as a board director. So that's really all I have to say tonight. So thanks. Thank you, Director Ray. Uh, director Weiniger, then Director Myers. I have no updates. I don't believe I do either. Thank you. So real quick, I, I do want to say um, thank you to Director Hansen. And I, I've never cried at a board meeting before, and I was in tears this evening. She has been an amazing colleague and has served this district during the most complicated and complex time in education history. Whether you agree with all the decisions that have been made or not, she showed up. She was here. Her heart has always been in the right place. And she has genuinely tried to influence and collaborate. And it makes me so sad that she felt she really had no other choice. And I leave tonight with a really heavy heart. Thank you, Director Meek. And, and with that, I was going to add uh, our thanks to Director Hansen. Uh, it's an unpaid position. It's often thankless. I've said that being a director means you can never please everyone. Uh, it's just the nature of the business. And uh, uh, listening to Director Hansen previously when she was the Assistant Secretary and just the, the stress that she had at that time uh, before this new board was seated. So I, I do echo the thoughts of uh, thanking Director Hansen for her service to the board. It is not easy for anyone to serve on this board. And I've said, I, I believe we had seven directors up here that all had uh, common intent to do well for our students, for our staff, for our community. We will often disagree on the how, but I do not uh, for one moment direct, uh, doubt Director Hansen's heart. And I do thank her sincerely for her service. With that uh, adjournment, do we have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion by Ray, second by Williams. Meek? Aye. Myers? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weiniger? Aye. Six to zero. This meeting's hereby concluded. Re